Preface of the Book of the Dead. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seville. The Book of the Dead by E. A. Wallace Budge. To Sir Edward Maud Thompson, KCB, DCL, LLD, Principal Librarian of the British Museum. Dear Sir Edward, with great pleasure I avail myself of the opportunity of inscribing your name at the head of this work on the Theban recession of the Book of the Dead, for you have taken no ordinary interest in its inception and progress and completion. I do it the more gladly because I know that everything which concerns the religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians and the wonderful doctrine of the resurrection of the spiritual body and of its everlasting existence which they evolved thousands of years before our era, has the greatest attraction for you. It is now many years ago since your friendship with our common friend, the late Professor W. Wright, began, and your helpful sympathy with his various Oriental works was never wanting. The like friendship and the like sympathy you have extended to myself, his pupil. For both I thank you, and I subscribe myself, gratefully yours, E. A. Wallace Budge, London, July 27th, 1897. Preface The present volume forms part of a work on the Theban recession of the Book of the Dead, which I have prepared for Messrs. Keegan Paul and Company, with a view of supplying an edition of the Egyptian text in hieroglyphic, a full vocabulary to the same with copious references, and a complete translation with introductory chapters upon the history object and contents of the book of the dead in a handy form and at a moderate price it is the most complete edition of the theban recession hitherto published but further discoveries in egypt may at any moment result in the recovery of papyri containing chapters at present unknown to us the texts of the heliopolitan recession of the book of the dead of the fifth and sixth dynasties which are inscribed upon the pyramids of Eunice, teta Pepi I, Marin Ra, and Pepi II, and which may be regarded as the most ancient form of the work now known to us, have been published, together with French translations of them by M. Maspero in the various volumes of Recueil de Travaux, and separately under the title of Les Inscriptions de la Pyramide de Saqqara, Paris, 1894. The texts of the recession in use during the eleventh and twelfth dynasties which are found inscribed upon the coffins of the period, have been published by Lapsius and Maspero, and an excellent idea of their contents may be gained from Birch's translation of the texts on the coffin of Amamu, published with a complete facsimile by the trustees of the British Museum under the title Egyptian Texts of the Earliest Period from the Coffin of Amamu, London, 1886. The texts of the Theban recession which was in use from the 18th to the 22nd dynasty, for example, from about B.C. 1600 to B.C. 900, and which is found inscribed on several papyri, both plain and illuminated, have been published by Birch, Mariette, Lehman, Deveria, and others, and an eclectic edition of the recession in use from the 18th to the 20th dynasty was published with variants and Ain Lintung by Monsieur Naville, in 1886. Translations of single papyri belonging to this period have been published by Deveria and Pierre, Guillet, Lefabre, Massé, Pliet, and others, and certain chapters of this recension have been translated and discussed by various Egyptologists. Texts, both hieratic and hieroglyphic, which were copied and illustrated for the priests and the priestesses of Amun during the 21st and 22nd dynasties, have been published by Birch, Lehman, Thepsius, Mariette, and Maspero, and a fine example of the heretic manuscript of the period following, entitled Rituel Funiel, was published by E. de Rouge in 1861. Of the texts which represent the Sayet recession of the Book of the Dead, several manuscripts have been printed and described. The most important of these, however, is the famous papyrus preserved at Turin, of which Lepsius published a good copy as far back as 1842, entitled 
da Totenbach der Egypter. The Book of the Dead, which was in use throughout the Greco-Roman and Roman periods, is well illustrated by the heretic texts published and transcribed by Birch in the Proceedings of the Society of Biblical Archaeology, Volume 7, page 49, and by Libyan in his Le Livre Egyptri Cou Mont Nofleuris, Leipzig, 1895. The first to publish a complete translation of any recession of the Book of the Dead was Birch, who in 1867 gave an English version of the Turin Papyrus in the fifth volume of Bunsen, Egypt's Place and Universal History, pages 123 through 333. Notwithstanding the fact that the recession here translated is a sayet, or latest of all, and that the text of the Turin manuscript is faulty in many places, Birch's rendering gave a new impulse to the study of the Egyptian religion, and it has formed the groundwork of the translations made by Egyptologists subsequently. The thing to wonder at is not the mistakes which he made, but that he was able, at that early date, to translate so much correctly. In 1882, Pierret published a French translation of the Turin Papyrus, entitled De Livre de Morts de Asiens Egyptian. And in 1894, Davis published an English version of Pierre's French translation at New York. Up to the present, however, no complete translation of the Theban recession has appeared. Translations of single papyri, for example, the papyrus of Nebseni, the papyrus of Ani, the papyrus of Setlemes, the papyrus of Nebked, etc., have been made by Deveria and Pierre, Guillet, Massé, myself, and others and a translation of the text published by Neville in his Totenbach, and by others, was begun by Renouf in the Proceedings of the Society of Biblical Archaeology, Volume 14. Since the appearance of Neville's great work in 1886, several extremely important papyri have been discovered, and it is now possible to add to the texts of the Theban Recession, which he published a considerable number of chapters, etc., from the papyrus of Ani, we obtained instructions to chapters 18 and 125, a hymn to Ra, a hymn to Osiris, texts referring to the judgment scene, all of which are new. Besides these, we gained from it a complete, though short, version of chapter 175, and the vignettes are colored with a care and beauty hitherto unknown in papyri of this class. Of greater interest textually, however, is the papyrus of Nu, which the trustees of the British Museum acquired in 1890. It is, I believe, the oldest of illuminated papyri known, and it certainly was written in the first half of the period of the rule of the kings of the 18th dynasty. It is nearly, if not quite, as old as the famous papyrus of Nepseni. Unlike many of the papyri of that date, it was written throughout by one man, probably Nu himself. As in all papyri, lines are omitted here and there, and in one short chapter is repeated. In it, however, are about twenty chapters of the Theban recession, which have not hitherto been found, and several which have, up to the present, been only known to exist in single manuscripts. From the above facts, it is clear that an edition of the text of the Theban recession, which should contain all such new chapters, etc., was needed. When a few years ago, Sir E. Mond Thompson suggested to me to make a translation of the Book of the Dead for popular use, I decided to do so, and to publish at the same time an edition of the Egyptian texts. For in these days, the reader insists, and rightly, upon the reproduction of the original documents as far as possible, so that he may be able to control the renderings set forth by the translator. Since no papyrus contains all the chapters of the Theban recession, and no two papyri agree either in respect of contents or arrangement of the chapters, and the critical value of every text in a papyrus is not always the same, it follows that a complete edition of all the known chapters of the Theban recession is impossible unless recourse be had to several papyri. I have, therefore, made use of several and as a result, translations of about 160 chapters, not including different versions, hymns, and rubrics, are given 
in the present volume. I have also added translations of sixteen chapters of the Sate Recession, both because they form good specimens of the religious compositions of the latter period and illustrate some curious beliefs, and because, having adapted the numbering of the chapters employed by Lepsius, they were needed to make the numbering of the chapters in this edition consecutive. My translation has been made as literal as possible, my aim being to let the reader judge for himself the contents of the Theban Book of the Dead, as it is intended for popular use. I have not encumbered the pages with voluminous notes, nor have I attempted to explain the allusions and obscurities which no man at present understands. For references to the works of other writers, the reader is referred to the bibliography at the end of my papyrus of Ani in the British Museum, London, 1895, and to the notes in the introduction to that work. The source of each chapter is set forth clearly above it, together with a description of the vignette to it as it is found in the best papyri of the 18th and 19th dynasties. Since the vignettes formed originally no part of the Book of the Dead, no attempt has been made to reproduce them here. A collection of all the vignettes found in the Theban papyri especially those which are found in the books of the dead, made for the priests of Almon after B.C. 1000, would be of great value, but, unless they were reproduced in their actual colors, much of their interest would be lost. The whole judgment scene and the Elysian fields and a portion of the vignette to the first chapter have, however, been beautifully reproduced in full colors by Mr. W. Griggs from the papyrus of Ani, and these form excellent examples of the artistic work executed upon papyri in the 18th dynasty. Those who require other examples are referred to the second edition of the colored facsimile of the papyrus of Ani, published by the trustees of the British Museum in 1894. In the introduction, a sketch of the history of the growth and development of the Book of the Dead has been given and to illustrate the paleography of the different recessions from about B.C. 3500 to about A.D. 200, 18 plates have been appended. The remaining brief accounts of some of the religious views of the Egyptians are necessary for the understanding of the aim and object of the Book of the Dead. They would have been fuller had space permitted, and I reserve a more detailed description of them for a further work on the Egyptian religion. With the view of showing how, in the Ptolemaic period, in later times, the Egyptians hoped to obtain for their dead all the benefits which were believed to be secured for them by the use of the numerous chapters of earlier periods, by means of a work which, though extremely short, preserved all the essential beliefs of an olden time. A translation has been added of the Book of Breathings from the text of the Papyrus of Karashur, British Museum number 9,995. By means of this, in the extracts from the pyramid texts given in my chapter on the Elysian fields, a comparison of the beliefs of the Egyptians in the earliest and latest times can be made. In a small volume accompanying the text of the Theban recession will be found a vocabulary containing over 35,000 references, which has been bound up separately in difference to the wishes of many. In the case of uncommon words, every example of its use which occurs in the book is noted. For commoner words, copious references are given in order that the reader may the more easily compare their meanings in several passages. Finally, it is my duty to express my grateful thanks to the trustees of the British Museum for permission to print certain chapters of the papyrus of Nebseni and of the papyrus of Ani from the publications issued by them. My thanks are also due to Mr. Holhausen of Vienna for the care which he has bestowed upon the printing of the three parts of this work, and to Mr. Griggs for the colored reproductions from the papyrus of Ani, which he has executed with his usual skill. E. A. Wallace Budge, London, August 19th, 1897. End of Preface Introduction of the Egyptian Book of the Dead by E. A. Wallace Budge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction The History of the Book of the Dead, Part 
one long ago in the earliest period of egyptian civilization the dwellers on the nile were in the habit of preserving the dead bodies of their relatives and friends by means of salt soda resin bitumen and other substances of like nature and although the art of mummifying and swathing the body in linen bandages did not attain to its highest pitch of perfection until several hundreds of years later the simple means which were employed in the earliest days were effectual in keeping bones sinews and skin in existence upon earth the egyptians embalmed their dead either because they wished to keep their material bodies with them upon earth or because they believed that the future welfare of the departed depended in some way upon the preservation of the bodies which they had left behind them upon earth whatever the motive it is quite certain that it must have been a very powerful one for the custom of embalming the dead lasted in egypt without a break for at least five thousand years it survived all the influence which the greeks and romans brought to bear upon the habits and customs of the egyptians and only disappeared from the country about two hundred years before its conquest by muhammad's general amir ibn al assi a d six hundred and fifty eight the writings of ancient egypt show that it was not only the custom but also the duty of a man to prepare during his lifetime a suitable tomb in which his body might rest after death and it is to the desire of preserving the body on the part of the egyptians which found practical expression in the hewing of tombs and the making of elaborate funeral furniture that we owe the greater part of our knowledge of their religious beliefs as time went on the embalming of the dead was performed in a more elaborate manner and at the same time the last resting-place of the mummified body was chosen more carefully and wrought with greater attention at a very early period the wealthy discarded the use of holes in rocks and caves as tombs for in these the bodies were accessible to the attacks of enemies and wild animals and serpents and the same objection was naturally made to shallow hollows made in the limestone and covered over with slabs of the same material and also to the vaulted crude brick graves which were commonly in use in the early dynasties the place of these was taken by pyramids built of stone and by many chambered tombs hewn in the living rock experience however soon showed the egyptian that the most carefully constructed tomb was incapable of preventing damp rot or dry rot and decay and that some other power besides his own must be invoked to prevent the destruction of the body which though needing longer time to accomplish was as effectually performed by these means as by the tooth of the wild animal or serpent or by the hand of the enemy at this stage the aid of the professional religious man or priest was called in and the task of finding means to prevent rot and decay was entrusted to him there is little doubt that when the body was laid to rest in the tomb the priest pronounced certain words or formulae or prayers over it and it is probable that the recital of these words was accompanied by the performance of certain ceremonies whatever these formulae were they formed the foundation of the book of the dead of later egyptian times it is idle to attempt to consider what such words were but we are within our right if we assume that they were addressed to the god or gods of the community on behalf of the dead and that they contained petitions for the welfare of the departed in the world beyond the grave such petitions would refer more to material than to spiritual happiness indeed it is more than doubtful if the egyptian at that time had developed any spiritual conceptions in our sense of the word for although his ideas were very definite as to the reality of a future existence i think that he had formulated few details about it and that he had no idea as to where or how it was to be enjoyed certain portions of texts which have been incorporated into religious works of a later period show that the life which the egyptian hoped to live after death was one similar to that which he led upon earth and it is clear that he thought the preservation of his natural or material body to be in some way absolutely necessary for the attainment of this life he hoped to have power to exercise all the natural functions of his body and to be able to journey about at pleasure 
unless the body and all its members were preserved such a life was impossible for him the earliest monuments in egypt of the historic period are tombs and the universal testimony of these is to the effect that the egyptian endeavoured to attain to this life by the embalmment of the body and by the power which the texts inscribed upon his tomb coffin etc could give him and this was always so for the earliest tombs proved that they were hewn out or built according to a recognized system which had become sanctified by antiquity and that they were intended to keep intact bodies which had been treated with balms and balsams unguents and drugs and other similar preservative compounds and the texts written upon them take the fact of the existence of a future life for granted and assume that its duration will be infinite the oldest tombs of this kind to which we can assign a date belong to the period of the second dynasty about b c four thousand two hundred but there are some in existence which are remarkable for the extremely archaic grouping of the inscriptions upon the walls and which may well belong to a very much earlier time in this connection the evidence supplied by the curious tombs which m m amelino and j de morgan have recently excavated at el amra a place situated about five miles from abydos on the west bank of the nile is of peculiar interest here were found a number of oval graves sunk in the stony soil to a depth varying from five to six feet wherein were the skeletons of human bodies lying upon their sides their hands were crossed before their faces and their knees were bent and were on a level with their chests with them were buried flints small bronze implements pottery ornamented and plain stone vases shell ornaments etc and though experts are divided in their opinion as to the exact antiquity of these objects there seems little doubt that the oldest of them belonged to the period of the dawn of egyptian civilization and that is sufficient for our purpose at present a number of the skeletons from the tombs of el amra were submitted for examination to dr fouquet of cairo who has found reason for declaring that they show traces of the bodies to which they belonged having been treated with compounds or substances used in embalming the dead this fact shows that the friends and relatives of the departed who caused their bodies to be so treated must have considered that it would be of some benefit to them in their life in the world beyond the grave and in so doing they were probably only conforming to a custom which was already old and well established in their day it must not be forgotten that the skeletons in the cemetery of el amra were found lying on their sides and this fact strongly supports the view that the tombs are not tombs of egyptians but of their immediate predecessors or of contemporaries of the early dynasties in no egyptian tomb hitherto opened has the mummy been deposited on its side moreover the egyptian mummy is always found lying upon its back its arms are always laid on the body and the hands rest on the tops of the thighs though the burials at el amra tell us nothing about the ceremonies religious or otherwise which were performed over the departed when they were committed to the earth they prove almost beyond a doubt that peoples older than the egyptians partially embalmed their dead at that remote period and this being so it is probable that the religious ideas and the belief in the future life which the egyptians possessed were shared by the nations round about them with whom they were perhaps connected by ties of blood passing from prehistoric times of which we know little and that little imperfectly we come to the tombs of the first four dynasties which show that a great development in the religious ideas and funeral ceremonies has taken place since the first of the graves at el amra was dug we see that certain symbolic ceremonies were regularly performed that a number of priestly officials with clearly defined duties in connection with funerals had come into being that a large number of festivals were celebrated at or near the tomb throughout the year that the offering of meat and drink of unguents and garments and of green herbs and flowers at stated times had grown into a system that a number of gods were duly honoured and worshipped 
that the priests of the gods belonged to and probably formed the ruling class of the districts in which they lived that certain gods had already obtained the position of national deities who were known and honoured throughout the country and that certain cities such as abydos anu on and memphis had become centres of teaching of the views and dogmas which their respective priests had adopted and modified or had themselves evolved it is quite certain that certain priestly officials lived and died for the texts on their tombs bear witness to this fact if the official lived then the office to which he was appointed existed and if religious books the reading of which during the funeral was necessary for the welfare of the departed had not existed men would not have been appointed to read them at this time we find that certain priests called priests of the ka were duly appointed and that they performed their ministrations in chapels of the ka which were attached to the tombs of kings and wealthy men this shows beyond a doubt that the doctrine of the existence of a double of a man had been evolved and the making of offerings to it at stated intervals at the tomb proves that it was believed to dwell therein and that material meat and drink were necessary for its well-being this is important also as indicating that the offerings were not consumed by the deceased himself however needful the ceremony of offering them might be for his general welfare similarly the sufferings death and resurrection of osiris were well known in the period of the early dynasties and it is probable that he became the type of the resurrection of man in egypt long before the religious texts which assume it and which call him the god and king and judge of the dead past from oral tradition to inscribed papyrus a study of the religious texts of all periods proves that the great fundamental religious ideas of the egyptians remained unchanged from the earliest to the latest historical times and it seems that they must have been received by the early egyptian priests in much the same form as that in which they handed them on the doctrine of immortality and everlasting life and the belief in the resurrection of a spiritual body are the brightest and most prominent features of the egyptian religion they survived all the theological theories and speculations of the various schools of religious thought in egypt and to them generations of men clung with a firmness and tenacity marvellous to consider and side by side with these beliefs there flourished the religious texts to which the name book of the dead has been given and they appealed mightily to all from highest to lowest for they were believed to give man power in the world beyond the grave and to enable him to attain to the abode of the blessed and to gain everlasting life no amount of research and no discovery have as yet yielded any information about the home and origin and early history of the book of the dead it seems pretty clear that as said above the first form of all of the book of the dead consisted of the words or petitions addressed to the god of the city or to a collection of supernatural powers on behalf of the deceased by relatives and friends and that such petitions referred to material rather than to spiritual things that they would increase in number and in length as time went on is only what is to be expected and the nature of their contents also would vary according to the rank and position of the deceased at first they were recited only and not written down and it is probable that they existed in this form for a very long period at length they were done in to writing but this i believe only took place when the professional religious men or priests began to be doubtful about the meaning of some of them and uncertain about the way in which they should be written the priests wrote them down to preserve them and thus endeavoured to keep without further corruption texts which already in their day had become exceedingly old and difficult of understanding the writing materials which they employed for this purpose are unknown it is hardly possible that they inscribed their texts upon stone for had they done so remains of such inscriptions would certainly have been found ere this in egypt at all events the commonest writing material was the papyrus and the hieroglyphic for book or writing being in the earliest times a roll of papyrus tied round the middle with a string of the same material it is probable that religious texts were first written upon papyrus rolls 
the syllabary or alphabet or both employed by these early scribes would probably be hieroglyphic or pictorial but no specimen of it has come down to us it is not likely that the signs used for writing the texts would be wholly alphabetic or wholly syllabic for in the earliest inscriptions known to us both kinds are used where and by whom the texts of the book of the dead were composed is also unknown there is no good reason for assuming that they are the offspring of the minds of libyans or dwellers of central africa they cannot be the literary product of savages or negroes there is no evidence to show that they are of semitic origin and the general testimony of their contents indicates an asiatic home for their birthplace certain of the ideas expressed in the earliest form of the book of the dead known to us are gross and brutal but they were retained rather by the conservative spirit of the egyptians than by any belief in them their reverence of our ancient writings and customs is too well known to need comment here that such texts should suffer modification as time went on is only to be expected but we may be sure that the original purpose of them remained unchanged and that all really essential ideas and beliefs of a fundamental character found expression always in the same way wherever its original home may have been or whatever was its origin or whoever were its authors it is quite certain that the book of the dead in a connected form is as old as egyptian civilization and that its sources belong to prehistoric times to which it is impossible to assign a date we first touch solid ground in the history of the book of the dead in the period of the early dynasties and if we accept one tradition which was current in egypt as early as b c two thousand five hundred we are right in believing that certain parts of it are in their present form as old as the time of the first dynasty the sixty fourth chapter which is admitted on all hands to be exceedingly old exists in two versions the rubric to one of these declares that the chapter is as old as the time of hesepti the fifth king of the first dynasty about b c four thousand two hundred and sixty six and says that it was found beneath the henu boat by the foreman of the builders and the rubric to the other states that it was found at hermopolis inscribed upon a block of ironstone by harutataf the son of khufu or cheops the second king of the fourth dynasty about b c three thousand seven hundred and thirty three when he was inspecting the temples throughout the country these opinions find expression upon coffins of the eleventh and twelfth dynasties and in papyri of the best period that is to say from about b c one thousand six hundred to b c one thousand and though one makes out the chapter to be some six hundred years older than the other both agree in assigning to it a date which is coeval with the early empire it is difficult to note what is exactly meant by the word found it may of course mean that a stone slab bearing the text of the chapter was discovered while certain repairs or alterations were being carried out in the temple of the god thoth at hermopolis or it may mean that the chapter was edited in some way by khufu's son harutataf the latter explanation is certainly the more probable for we know from other sources that Harup Tataf was a learned man and that he was the author of various literary works which enjoyed a considerable reputation on the other hand the ancient custom of ascribing the works of unknown authors to famous men may have already been in vogue of the book of the dead of the second third and fourth dynasties we know nothing and no copies of any part of the recension then in use have come down to us the texts on the tombs of the priests of that period show that funeral ceremonies were performed in accordance with the instruction contained in the rubrics to the various chapters of the book of the dead and the existence of collections of religious texts stands assured during the reign of menka ra the mycerinus of the greeks the fourth king of the fourth dynasty about b c three thousand six hundred and thirty three certain chapters that is thirty b and one hundred and forty eight are said to have been found by harutataf and there are traditions extant that religious ceremonies were performed with renewed vigour during the reign of this king on the coffin of men Kau ra are inscribed two lines of text which are also found on the walls inside the pyramids of tata and pepi 
the first kings of the sixth dynasty it would be absurd to suppose that these lines formed the only portion of the text known in the fourth dynasty and thus we are entitled to assume that the same recension of the book of the dead which was known and copied in the sixth dynasty was also known and copied in the fourth dynasty from the lines on the coffin of men ra we learn some interesting facts namely that the dead king was identified with the god that the divine origin of the god was ascribed also to the king that the life of the king in the world beyond the grave was to be that of a god that all his foes were to be vanquished and that he was to become a being possessed of life everlasting here then is a proof of the acceptance of the osiris story and of the doctrine of immortality or everlasting life at a very remote period in egypt during the period of the fifth and sixth dynasties a remarkable development took place in the funeral ceremonies performed for egyptian kings the kings of the fourth dynasty khufu cheops ka f ra kephren and men ka ra had built for their tombs the stone pyramids at giza which to this day excite the wonder and admiration of the civilized world but the walls of the chambers and corridors are uninscribed and they tell us nothing of the texts which were recited during the funeral and nothing of the ceremonies by which they were accompanied at the close of the fifth dynasty however eunice the king b c three thousand three hundred and thirty three built as his tomb a stone pyramid at a place now called saqqara which is situated on the west bank of the nile a few miles to the south of the modern city of cairo and he covered the greater parts of the walls of the chambers corridors etc with several hundred vertical lines of hieroglyphic text which were deeply cut and filled up with green paint or composition in the year eighteen eighty one monsieur maspero effected an entrance into this pyramid and he recognized at once the fact that the inscriptions which he saw before him formed the text of the book of the dead which was in use in egypt during the period of the fifth dynasty continuing his labors in this pyramid field he opened the pyramids of teta pepi the first meren ra and pepi the second kings of the sixth dynasty who reigned from about b c three thousand three hundred to b c three thousand one hundred and sixty six and he found that the texts which covered the walls inside were duplicates with additions of those which he had already found in the pyramid of eunice we thus see for the first time a collected series of texts of the book of the dead in the earliest recension known to us this recension may for convenience be called the heliopolitan because it bears unmistakable evidence that it was drawn up by the priests of anu on or heliopolis and that it contains the peculiar views held by the priests of the colleges of that very ancient city though five sets of extracts from it have come down to us in a tolerably complete state of preservation we must not assume that they represent all the texts which belong to it indeed the various sections of it which were copied upon funeral monuments and papyri in later times indicate that for all practical purposes its extent was illimitable how much editing was done to the texts of this recension by the priests of anu cannot be said but there is considerable evidence scattered throughout it which shows that they had been edited two or three times before and it is clear that we have preserved in it many religious ideas and beliefs which belong to what may be termed strata of religious thought of different periods and dates some of them certainly go back to a period in the history of the egyptians when they celebrated their triumphs over their enemies in a brutal and savage fashion and others belong to a time when their ancestors stood but little higher on the ladder of civilization than the barbarous tribes who lived on their western and southern frontiers the heliopolitan recension of the book of the dead consists of a series of paragraphs each of which is introduced by the word recite scattered throughout the text are directions to the priests who performed the ceremonies when to make certain presentations of meat drink and other objects in later days the rubrical directions were written at the ends of the sections and titles were given to the sections which henceforth became special chapters intended to produce certain definite results an excellent idea of the arrangement 
of the texts in the pyramids will be obtained from the accompanying page of hieroglyphic extract which is taken from the text written for eunice one four hundred and ninety six following at the end of the sixth dynasty the walls of the chambers of tombs built for great and wealthy men were profusely ornamented with texts and scenes both coloured and uncoloured but in none do we find religious texts belonging to the collection which the royal pyramids have revealed to us it is difficult to account for this except on the score of economy the wealthy man or owner of large estates caused the scenes which showed his greatness and affluence to be vividly depicted on the walls of his tomb but even in the east where time has always been of little value and labour cheap the difference between the cost of cutting several hundred lines of hieroglyphics in limestone and filling them up with paint and the cost of painting a number of agricultural and other scenes in tempera must have been very considerable in the former case the text had to be set out by the artist and then carefully cut by the skilled mason and it must not be forgotten that the copy from which the artist worked may have been in hieratic or cursive characters in which case the difficulties of the work would be increased in the latter the artist's work was limited to broad outline which could be quickly drawn and the filling in of the colours was an easy matter during the interval between the end of the sixth dynasty and the beginning of the eleventh we know nothing of the fortunes of the book of the dead and it is not until we come to the middle or end of the eleventh dynasty that we find other copies of the work of the history too of the period of the seventh eighth ninth and tenth dynasties very little is known and though in certain districts in upper egypt tombs of considerable size and beauty were built yet no striking development in the funeral text seems to have taken place or if it did we have no record of it belonging to the eleventh and twelfth dynasties however we have a number of coffins of considerable importance for the study of the book of the dead they may be roughly divided into three classes one those which are painted to represent funeral chambers or tombs two those which are almost plain outside but covered inside with text in the hieratic or cursive egyptian character and three those which are inscribed both inside and out the texts are usually traced in black upon the plain surface of the wood the chief inscriptions which record the name and titles of the deceased being painted in large hieroglyphics either in a vertical line down the length of the cover or in a horizontal line round the upper part of the four sides of the coffin on the right hand side at the foot is often painted or inlaid the double achat or so-called symbolic eyes plates one and two illustrate as far as possible without the use of colours the arrangement of the text on such coffins the scene in plate one is from one end inside of the famous coffin of amamu the border with its pattern of rectangles is painted in bright colours red green and yellow and all round the upper part of the sides are painted the principal objects which form the usual offerings to the dead and a prayer that the deceased may have such things offered in his tomb for ever here we see vases and jars of various shapes and sizes filled with unguents and cosmetics the names of which are given in the line of hieroglyphics above them they are set upon a stand broken examples of which have been from time to time found in tombs each of the vertical lines of text begins with the word recite a fact which shows that the text was usually inscribed upon the walls of tombs plate two gives an extract from the text inscribed upon the coffin of sebek ah preserved at berlin it will be noticed that the hieroglyphics have begun to assume a conventional form and that they do not so readily suggest the objects which they represent we notice too that the various sections on such coffins have specific titles attached to them in other words they have become chapters as the pyramids of the fifth and sixth dynasties do not all contain the same selection of extracts from the book of the dead so the coffins of the eleventh and twelfth dynasties do not all contain the same selection of chapters this fact shows that the selection of the extracts and chapters did not follow any general rule but whether it depended upon the will and discretion of the scribe or the deceased cannot be said down the length of the bottom of the coffin inside was frequently painted a band of white across which were traced in blue wavy lines to indicate water this probably represented the celestial nile or the stream upon which the deceased hoped to float to the elysian fields 
we must note in passing that at the period when these coffins were made no pyramids were inscribed with extracts or chapters from the book of the dead in other words it was found both cheaper and easier to write the text with ink or colours upon planks which could be afterwards pegged together to form coffins this custom resulted in the curtailment of the selection of texts and in less than a thousand years after the religious texts in the pyramids of the fifth and sixth dynasties were cut we find that certain portions of them had fallen into disuse we have already seen that a period lies between the sixth and eleventh dynasties during which we know nothing of the book of the dead and again during the period which lies between the twelfth and eighteenth dynasties we know nothing of it with the beginning of the eighteenth dynasty the book of the dead begins a new phase of its existence and a development of its history as interesting as it is unexpected is before us from pyramids the transition was to coffins and now the transition is from coffins to papyri and here again economy probably played an important part inscribed pyramids and sarcophagi and coffins would necessarily be only made for royal personages and for great and wealthy folk but a roll of papyrus was in comparison with these a very inexpensive thing especially if the surfaces of an ordinary scribe were employed in inscribing it end of introduction the history of the book of the dead part one introduction part two of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the history of the book of the dead part two the greater number of the copies of the book of the dead inscribed upon papyri have been found at thebes indeed those made in this city are of such importance that to the recension of the work which we commonly find in use in egypt from the eighteenth to the twenty-second dynasty the name theban has been given we owe them chiefly to the scribes and priests who were attached to the powerful confraternity of the priests of amen ra the king of the gods and speaking generally the best manuscripts are found in their tombs and coffins their original home of the text which they copied was of course memphis or heliopolis and there is reason for believing that during the earlier centuries of their existence they did little more than adopt the religious views and doctrines of the sages of the north as time went on and the worshippers of amen obtained greater power this god was slowly but surely made to usurp the attributes of the older cosmic gods of egypt and eventually as we see in chapter one hundred and seventy one his name is included among those of the old gods of the book of the dead the papyri inscribed with copies of the theban recension of the book of the dead vary in length from about fifteen to ninety feet and in width from twelve to eighteen inches in many cases the various pieces which form the papyrus are so carefully put together that it is almost impossible to see where one piece ends and the other begins in the early part of the eighteenth dynasty the text is always written with black ink in vertical columns of hieroglyphics which are separated from each other by black lines the titles of the chapters and the initial word or words of certain parts of the chapters and catchwords and rubrics are written with red ink in the eighteenth dynasty or perhaps a little earlier the scribes began to ornament the papyri with designs in black outline referring to the subject matter of the text near which they were placed such designs or vignettes as they are usually called occupy quite a subordinate position and they were drawn most probably by the scribe little by little however they increased in number and it became the fashion to illuminate them with bright colours greens reds yellows in the nineteenth dynasty the unilluminated papyrus became the exception and the vignettes flourished at the expense of the text 
an idea of the beauty of a fully coloured papyrus of the best period may be gained from the frontispiece to this volume and from the plates which face pages nineteen and one hundred and seventy and plates three through eight will illustrate the characteristics of good manuscripts of the eighteenth and nineteenth dynasties except as to colour plate three illustrates the writing and vignettes of the famous papyrus of nebseni which was found at memphis it measures seventy-seven feet seven and a half inches by one foot one and a half inch and contains seventy-seven chapters not including duplicates and triplicates the vignettes are traced in outline and are remarkably well drawn and both vignettes and text appear to be the work of one scribe probably nebseni himself the papyrus of nebseni was apparently written early in the eighteenth dynasty plate four contains a vignette and a piece of text from the papyrus of nu which was found at thebes it measures sixty-five feet three and a half inches by one foot one and a half inch and contains one hundred and thirty-one chapters though shorter than the papyrus of nebseni the texts inscribed on it are more numerous for the writing is smaller and the lines are closer together some of the chapters have vignettes but they occupy an entirely subordinate position and the colouring is not as fine as that found in documents of a later date the date of this papyrus cannot be much later than that of nebseni on plate five we have an example of the very fine bold writing which is found in the papyrus of ani which was found at thebes this document measures seventy-eight feet by one foot three inches and contains sixty-six chapters it is the finest of all the illuminated papyri of the eighteenth dynasty and from an artistic point of view its value is greater than that of any other papyrus it is made up of six distinct lengths of papyrus which have been neatly joined the text was written by several scribes and the vignettes are the work of more than one artist an examination of the document shows that the artist's work was done before the text was written at times the space needed for the text was miscalculated and the scribe was compelled to reduce the size of his writing and even to write words on the coloured border within which text and vignettes are enclosed the first sixteen feet of the papyrus were inscribed probably by ani himself the other sections were written by scribes of the same school probably after his death the hymn to osiris on plate six is probably in ani's own handwriting and the characters are formed with an attention to detail not often found elsewhere the vignettes and text on plate seven show the work of two scribes and two artists and also show that the inscribed portion of one section was done on a larger scale than was contemplated in the earlier sections here we see that the borders had to be enlarged to make the join from this we see too that the planning of a papyrus was a matter which was left to the discretion of the artist and scribe and when we consider that the papyrus of nebseni contains duplicates and even triplicates of some chapters and that the papyrus of ani contains two copies of chapter eight teen, one with an introduction and one without slightly differing from each other and having the sections of the vignette arranged differently it is clear that even the best scribes did not tie themselves to any one plan or method in preparing a copy of the book of the dead we may note too that in the papyrus of ani a large section of the text of chapter seventeen has been omitted by the scribe probably because the artist had not left sufficient space for the whole chapter in the text moreover several palpable errors occur but on the other hand we have in the vignettes descriptions of mythological scenes names of gods etc which occur in no other text among these worthy of special mention are the judgment scene and the accompanying texts and the vignette to the seventeenth chapter plate eight gives us a vignette and a few lines of text from the papyrus of hugh nefer a scribe and superintendent of cattle who flourished in the reign of seti the first about b c thirteen hundred and seventy the cartouche of the king affords conclusive proof as to its date 
this document is remarkable from many points of view it is the shortest perfect manuscript of his class known measuring eighteen feet by one foot three and three eighths inches the vignettes are beautiful specimens of the artist's work and the scene in which the performance of the ceremony of opening the mouth is depicted perfect is the most perfect known but the vignette to chapter seventeen is imperfect when compared with that of the papyrus of ani the copy of chapter one is so good that m naville employed it as the standard text in his Tadten Buch. but the copy of chapter seventeen is so incomplete and incorrect that he found it useless even for purposes of comparison here again we see that the vignettes were executed at the expense of the text in spite of this however the papyrus is valuable for it contains a hymn to osiris by the god thoth which is not found elsewhere in the same form the text is written in a good bold hand but with little attention to the details of the characters and the judgment scene exhibits many peculiarities both in respect of text and arrangement plates nine and ten illustrate the vignettes and the hieratic and hieroglyphic texts which are found in books of the dead of the twentieth dynasty in plate nine we see the royal mother netshemet standing behind her son herheru the dress and ornaments of these royal personages show the change which has taken place in such matters since the eighteenth and nineteenth dynasties and in the manner of depicting them the colours of the vignettes are more crude the delicacy of design and of execution alike has departed and a comparison of the text with that of the papyrus of nu shows that the skill of the scribe had deteriorated the hieratic text on plate ten gives an excellent idea of the writing of the period in the twentieth dynasty books of the dead inscribed for the priests of amen began with a vignette either plain or coloured in which the deceased was seen making offerings to osiris or to the gods of thebes this was followed by a selection of chapters from the book of the dead in use in the eighteenth dynasty or by a series of texts peculiar to the period accompanied by vignettes taken from other funeral works sometimes as in the case of the princess nessi Kansu, the document begins with a long detailed list of the titles of amen ra who by this time had usurped the attributes of the old gods of egypt which is followed by a series of statements in which the god in apparently legal language swears to confer every favour possible upon the deceased lady such documents are not very long and they are usually much narrower than books of the dead of the earlier period the mythological figures and scenes characteristic of the later documents of the priests of amen are not yet well understood for only a few have been published in entirety of papyri of the twenty first dynasty which preserve many characteristics of the earlier period may be mentioned that of anhai a priestess of amen a section of which is shown on plate eleven here we have however a work sui generis which is very instructive from many points of view the artist's work is the most valuable part of the papyrus and the use of gold for purposes of illumination appears for the first time in addition to the vignettes of the older period we find here the scene of the creation given much as it is found on the sarcophagus of seti i and a rare vignette which seems to refer to kemenu the city of thoth the texts are fragmentary and often have no connection with the vignettes which accompany them but many of the vignettes are of considerable interest the handwriting is in some places very good but it lacks the bold firmness which is characteristic of the older scribes in papyri of the eighteenth dynasty we find many mistakes but most of them may be attributed to momentary carelessness on the part of a weary scribe whereas in those of the twenty-first and succeeding dynasties the writers of the texts seem to be altogether reckless texts are copied beginning at the end instead of at the beginning omissions of whole sections are frequent texts that have proper vignettes are copied without the least regard to the correct vignettes 
and what is intended to be a chapter frequently consists of nothing but a series of fragments of sentences copied without break merely to fill up the space which the artist had spared for the purpose it seems as if the artist both painted the vignettes and wrote the text and as if his sole aim was to produce a handsome but not accurate document the contents of the papyri reflect no doubt the religious views commonly held at that period and if this be so it is clear that the priests of amen held the texts which they inserted alongside of the chapters of the older period to be of equal value and authority some of them went so far as to fill their papyri with religious compositions which are never to be found in the old works in plate twelve we have a vignette with a few lines of text from the papyrus which i believe was written in the twenty-second dynasty the artist's work is a copy or rather a very poor imitation of the illuminating of the nineteenth dynasty and the text consists of a series of compositions referring to the offerings which were to be made to the gods of the querti or divisions of the underworld strictly speaking these had nothing whatever to do with the book of the dead but in the opinion of the scribe they were equally efficacious in the same dynasty a large number of copies of selections of chapters from the book of the dead were written in hieratic with vignettes traced in outline in black ink in some of these the papyrus measures about forty feet by one foot six inches and in others the dimensions are considerably less an idea of the appearance of such papyri may be gained from plate thirteen which illustrates both the fine drawing and small but clear hieratic writing of the period it is probable that the books of the dead written in hieratic during the twentieth twenty-first and twenty-second dynasties belong to a recension different in many respects from the theban but that such recension is akin to the theban there is no doubt whatever in both the chapters have no fixed order and in both the chapters have special titles a characteristic which distinguishes them from the sections of the books of the dead of the fifth sixth eleventh and twelfth dynasties it is tolerably easy to identify the papyri which were inscribed before b c nine hundred in fact as long as the power of the priests of amen was paramount at thebes the copies of the books of the dead which were inscribed for them reflect the prosperity of the confraternity but when it became necessary for the priests to hide at der el bahari the mummies of the kings and queens who had been their greatest benefactors and troublous times came upon them everything relating to the rites and ceremonies connected with the dead suffered and the relatives and friends of the dead were obliged to do for them not what they would but what they could eventually it would seem a time came when no books of the dead were written and this period corresponds i believe to the final failure of the domination of the priests of amen this is not the place to lament the mistake which the priests of amen made when they tried to rule egypt temporally as well as spiritually or to regret the policy which made them exalt their god amen above the older gods of the country whom the people had known and worshipped from time immemorial it is sufficient to know that in each matter they failed they lost their own temporal power as the result of their intrigues and at best they only succeeded in obtaining for their god a place side by side with the old gods it must however not be forgotten that we owe some of the best and finest copies of the book of the dead to scribes who had married priestesses of amen and who were themselves attached to the brotherhood with the rise of the kings of the twenty sixth dynasty to power the book of the dead enters upon a new lease of life and a general revival of ancient religious customs took place the temples were repaired ancient and long forgotten texts were recopied and artists and sculptors took their models from the best works of the masters of the early empire early in this dynasty it appears the priesthood which succeeded the priests of amen awoke to the consciousness of the fact that the texts of the book of the dead needed re-editing and rearranging and they set to work to try to put some system into them how and when exactly the work was done we know not but it is probable 
that it was carried out by an assembly or college of priests we have seen above that scribes tied themselves to no one plan in making their copies of the book of the dead and that the work of the artist on the vignettes which were subordinate matters originally was at times allowed to drive the text from the papyrus in the best papyri too the selection of texts copied is never the same and the order of them is never the same in fact each papyrus had a plan of its own these things the priests of the twenty sixth dynasty tried to correct and the result of their labours was a recension of the book of the dead which is usually called the saite a number of papyri are extant which are inscribed therewith and an examination of them shows that the chapters follow a certain order and that although the papyri vary in length the selection of chapters being not as full in some of them as in others this order has few exceptions each of the early recensions of the book of the dead known to us exhibits peculiarities which reflect the religious views of the time when it was written and the saita recension is not an exception to the rule for included in it are four chapters one hundred and sixty two to one hundred and sixty five which have no counterparts in the papyri of the older period they are remarkable also for containing a number of foreign words it has been suggested that these chapters are of nubian origin and if so it would be interesting to know the circumstances under which they were inserted in the book of the dead it is difficult to identify with certainty the papyri which were actually written during the twenty sixth dynasty but manuscripts written in the period immediately preceding the ptolemaic are not difficult to recognize plate fourteen gives fourteen lines of text and part of a vignette from a document of this class and shows what a well-defined class it is the text is written with black ink in vertical columns of spidery hieroglyphics separated by black lines and the vignettes occupy small spaces above it the vignettes of the sunrise or sunset the judgment scene and the elysian fields occupy the whole length of the papyrus sometimes the vignettes are all mixed together but even when coloured they lack the artistic appearance and good work of the illuminated papyri of the eighteenth nineteenth and twentieth dynasties the recension in use in the ptolemaic period is well illustrated by plate fifteen which is reproduced from lepsius edition of the turin papyrus this papyrus is probably the best and longest manuscript of the class known the selection of chapters is remarkably full the number of chapters however is not one hundred and sixty five but one hundred and fifty three for three of them chapters sixteen one hundred and forty three and one hundred and fifty are in reality vignettes and nine others chapters forty eight forty nine seventy three one hundred and seven one hundred and eleven one hundred and twenty one hundred and twenty one one hundred and twenty nine and one hundred and thirty nine are duplicates of chapters found in other parts of the papyrus the titles of the chapters catch words parts of rubrics etc are written in red meanwhile however a number of short religious works for funeral use had been composed presumably by the priests and it seems that towards the end of the ptolemaic period it was more usual to inscribe these upon papyri than the chapters of the old recensions of the book of the dead it seems as if an attempt was made to extract only the essential portions of the old works and to omit from the shortened new text the chapters which referred to faiths which were dead and to beliefs which had little or no influence in those modern times added to this the knowledge of such matters must have disappeared from the community long before the ptolemies ruled the land and though the belief in the resurrection of the spiritual body and in life everlasting beyond the grave retained its power over the people as firmly as ever most men had no knowledge whatever of the texts which their forefathers who were dead and gone imagined to be necessary for the attainment of the same the sepulchral stelae and coffins show that neither the employer nor the employed had an exact idea of the import of the texts and symbols which were cut or painted upon them 
and to ignorance as much as to haste must be attributed the blunders which occur in funeral texts of this period here and there we find an attempt to preserve vignettes and texts of the old period along with the modern work and a good example of this class of document is the papyrus of karasher a portion of which is reproduced on plate sixteen here we have a representation of the judgment scene crude alike in colour and detail a part of the vignette of the first chapter of the old book of the dead a number of the pylons discussed in chapters one hundred and forty five and one hundred and forty six etc and two horizontal lines of hieroglyphics which contain prayers reflecting those of an earlier period no manuscript could more clearly show how little knowledge of the old book of the dead remained in the hands of the scribes at that time artistic skill moreover had sunk very low for it will be noticed that the censer which the white-skirted priest is carrying before the bier and which he was supposed to carry in his hand is almost as long as he is high the coloured portion of this papyrus is followed by three columns of text in hieratic which formed the work entitled shai on sansim or book of breathings wherein we find no hymns and no addresses to the gods and in fact no words which do not directly refer to the future life of the deceased in the world beyond the grave here we have an epitome of all that the egyptian hoped to obtain in the land of eternity we have now reached the end of the graeco roman period but the end of the book of the dead is not yet for belonging to the roman period we find a number of small rolls of papyri inscribed in very cursive hieratic with a series of statements or assertions referring to the happiness of the deceased in the next world such papyri have no vignettes and as for the texts both hymns and chapters of the old book of the dead in any recension are as absent from them as if they had never existed the aim of the writer of such documents was not to glorify the gods but to secure the goods of the next world by means of the smallest amount of writing possible and at the least expense on plate eighteen it reproduced a portion of a papyrus of this class and a comparison of it with the earlier plates in this book will show at once the change which had come over the book of the dead what form the book of the dead took in the early centuries of the christian era cannot be said but it seems not to have died out utterly for selections from it are found copied upon the outer and inner swathings of mummies and upon coffins of the roman period on a coffin in paris which was probably made about the end of the second century of our era are written a number of texts which are as old as the time of the pyramids at saqqara and this fact proves that when such documents were needed originals from which to copy them could always be found there is good reason for assuming that the art of making mummies was practised until the end of the fifth century of our era and there is no doubt that in certain places the belief that the preservation of the natural body was absolutely necessary for the growth development and existence of the spiritual body existed in full force until a much later date it is not possible to assign a date to the period when the decay of the book of the dead began but it is probably contemporary with the advent of the greeks in egypt up to that period egypt may be described as the home of a nation that was given up entirely to the care of the dead and to the consideration of the future life a few of its kings were soldiers in the true sense of the word but it is a striking fact that the temples and tombs of egypt are the chief monuments of one of the oldest and greatest civilizations of the world a tottering religion would be rudely shaken by the invasions of the country by assyrians persians greeks and others and the permanent occupation of egypt by greeks and romans would continue the work which frequent disturbances throughout the country had begun the final blow however was not inflicted until the egyptians began to renounce their own ancient religion and to become converts of the preaching of st mark and his followers when they were once able to believe that christ had the power to raise up their bodies in a spiritual form they felt that there was no need to have them mummified and simultaneously the need for the chapters of the book of the dead disappeared we are now able to summarize the various forms of the book of the dead as follows 
it first existed in oral tradition only and was next written down to preserve it of these forms nothing whatever is known the first historical recension was that made by the priest of heliopolis and the oldest copies of it known are cut in hieroglyphics upon the walls of the chambers and passages inside the pyramids of saqqara of the fifth and sixth dynasties the second recension was written or painted upon sarcophagi and coffins of the eleventh and twelfth dynasties in cursive hieroglyphics the third recension was written in hieroglyphics upon papyri from the eighteenth to the twentieth dynasty the various chapters having no fixed order this recension was illustrated by a large number of vignettes the fourth recension was written in hieratic upon papyri during the twenty-first and twenty-second dynasties and included extracts from various funeral books which were illustrated by vignettes of an unusual character the fifth or saite recension was made probably in the twenty-sixth dynasty the chapters have a fixed order and were written on papyri both in hieratic and hieroglyphics the sixth recension which was in use in ptolemaic times much resembled the saite and may be regarded as the last form of the book of the dead for the extracts from it written for the benefit of the dead upon small pieces of papyri in the graeco roman and roman periods need hardly be considered thus the great religious work of the egyptians which had lasted for thousands of years and which in early times cut in fine bold hieroglyphics covered the walls and passages of the tombs of kings ended its existence in almost illegible scrawls hastily traced upon scraps of papyrus only a few inches square from first to last throughout the book of the dead with the single exception of herutataf the second son of cheops no man is mentioned as the author or reviser of any chapter or of any part of it certain chapters may show the influence of the cult of a certain city or cities but the theban book of the dead at all events cannot be regarded as the work of any one man or body of men and it does not represent the religious views and beliefs of any one part only of egypt from time immemorial the god thoth who was both the divine intelligence which at creation uttered the words that were carried into effect by ptah and knimu and the scribe of the gods was associated with the production of the book of the dead and though he was primarily the god of time and chronologer of heaven and earth he appears frequently as the advocate and helper of the deceased in the one hundred and eighty-second chapter he is called the scribe of right and truth who abominateth sin and again behold he is the writing reed of the god nebercher the lord of laws who giveth forth the speech of wisdom and understanding whose words have dominion over the two lands of himself the god says i am thoth the lord of right and truth who trieth the right and the truth for the gods the judge of words and their essence whose words triumph over violence i have made ra to set as osiris and osiris setteth as ra setteth the deeds which thoth claims to have done on behalf of osiris are set forth at length in the two hymns to osiris which form the one hundred and eighty second and one hundred and eighty third chapters in several places in the book of the dead the deceased is made to refer to the might of the words of the utterances of the god thoth and much of what this god did for his brother osiris was effected by this power the belief in the efficacy of the words of thoth continued till the latest period for in the book of breathings we read thoth the most mighty god the lord of kemenu cometh to thee and he writeth for thee the book of breathings with his own fingers finally mention must be made of the various places in the tomb where the papyri inscribed with the chapters of the book of the dead were placed when the egyptians ceased to cut the chapters on the walls of the chambers and passages of pyramids they wrote or painted them upon the sides inner and outer of wooden coffins and this custom obtained until the end of the rule of the native kings of egypt about b c three hundred and fifty the vignettes were copied upon coffins long after all knowledge of their meaning had been forgotten until as late as the third century of our era
the inscribed papyrus was sometimes placed in a separate box beside the coffin and sometimes a niche in the wall was specifically cut for it the most perfect of the papyri known have been found in niches frequently the papyrus was laid by the side of the mummy in the coffin and in this case it is usually found broken by the movements of the mummy when the coffin was carried along more frequently the papyrus was laid under the hands and between the thighs before the final swathing took place it was also placed between the legs just above the ankles such papyri are usually much broken and they are often much discoloured by the moisture of the substances bitumen cedar oil etc used in the process of embalmment in the time of the greatest power of the priests of amen in the twenty first dynasty large wooden figures of osiris standing upon a pedestal were made to serve as cases for the papyri which were tightly rolled up and tied and pushed up inside the figures through holes in the bottom of the pedestals in later times about b c three hundred the figures were made solid and vertical cavities were cut in the backs of them to hold the papyri still later that is in the roman period when the papyri became very small they were laid in cavities in the sides of the pedestals which also contained mummified portions wrapped in linen of the bodies of the persons for whom they were made over the mummified remains which are placed in the upper parts of the pedestals we often find small models of sepulchral chests or coffins surmounted by figures of anubis and hawks the figure of the god above is no longer that of osiris simply but it represents the triune god ptasikur ausar the god of the resurrection and has all the attributes which belong to the ancient gods ptah and seeker in this trinity the creator of the world the sun and osiris as god of the dead were represented some think that ptah in this trinity represents the personification of the period of incubation which follows death and precedes the entry into eternal life the exact position of seeker cannot be definitely described he is usually depicted as a mummied body with the head of a hawk and he sometimes holds in his hands the emblems of power rule and sovereignty which belong to osiris he is said to be the incarnation of the apis bull at memphis End of introduction the history of the book of the dead introduction osiris and the resurrection of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction osiris and resurrection it will be noticed in reading the translation of the book of the dead given in this volume that the deceased is always identified with the god osiris and that he is frequently called by the god's name and if the religious texts written for the benefit of the dead in all periods be examined it will be found that from the fifth dynasty to the latest times osiris is always regarded as the king and god of the dead and that egyptian writers always assume the identity of the blessed dead with their god thus in the text inscribed on the pyramid of unas the writer identifies the king with the god osiris and says to the god tem o tem behold thy son this motionless osiris thou hast given him that whereon he may live if he liveth this unas liveth if he dieth not this unas dieth not if he perisheth not this unas perisheth not if he begetteth not this unas begetteth not if he begetteth this unas begetteth and throughout the religious literature the deceased always claims that whatever was done by the gods for osiris should also be done for him by them the hymns addressed to ra and other great gods dwell more on the majesty and power which they exhibit in heaven and upon earth and upon their goodness to man but with osiris the case is different and it is evident that in the earliest period he was regarded more in the light of a god who could be known and who was known more or less personally if we may use the word and he was of all the gods the one singled out to receive the petitions of mankind for everlasting life 
it is impossible to say when osiris began to be regarded as the god of the dead and it is only from brief allusions that any history of him can be formed throughout the egyptian texts it is assumed that the god suffered death and mutilation at the hands of his enemies that the various members of his body were scattered about the land of egypt that his sister wife isis sought him sorrowing and at length found him that she fanned him with her wings and gave him air that she raised up his body and was united unto him that she conceived and brought forth a child horus and that he osiris became the god and king of the underworld in the legend of osiris as given by plutarch de iside et osiride it is said that he was murdered at the instigation of typhon or set who tore the body into fourteen pieces which he scattered throughout the land isis collected these pieces and wherever she found one she built a tomb after the death of osiris his son horus did battle with typhon his father's murderer and in the words of the egyptians avenged his father notwithstanding the death and mutilation which the god suffered the egyptians firmly believed that he rose from the dead with a body perfect in all its members and that corruption and decay had no power over him this fact may be deduced from a large number of passages in texts of all periods but in one in particular which forms part of chapter one hundred and fifty four of the book of the dead a definite statement of it occurs the deceased says to osiris do thou embalm these my members for i would not perish and come to an end but would be even likened to my divine father capera who is the divine type of him that never saw corruption let not my body become worms but deliver me as thou didst deliver thyself homage to thee o my divine father osiris thou hast thy being with thy members thou didst not decay thou didst not become worms thou didst not waste away thou didst not become corruption thou didst not putrefy and thou didst not turn into worms i am the god capera and my members shall have an everlasting experience i shall not decay i shall not rot i shall not putrefy i shall not turn into worms and i shall not see corruption beneath the eye of the god shu i shall have my being i shall have my being i shall live i shall live i shall germinate i shall germinate i shall germinate i shall wake up in peace i shall not putrefy my intestines shall not perish i shall not suffer from any defect mine eye shall not decay the form of my visage shall not disappear mine ear shall not become deaf my head shall not be separated from my neck my tongue shall not be carried away my hair shall not be cut off mine eyebrows shall not be shaved off and no baleful injury shall come upon me my body shall be established and it shall neither fall into decay nor be destroyed upon this earth the oldest copy of this chapter is inscribed upon one of the wrappings of the mummy of tothmes the third who reigned about b c one thousand five hundred and fifty and the latest is found in the turin papyrus edited by lepsius in eighteen forty two which dates from the ptolemaic period from these extracts we see that the deceased bases his certainty of an everlasting life which was to be lived in a body which was perfect in all its members upon the assurance that osiris died and rose again and lived in a body which was perfect in all its members and it followed for the egyptian that if osiris did not die and rise again his belief in a resurrection was vain it is difficult to say with certainty whether the ancient egyptian believed that osiris endured pain and suffered death on his behalf or not but it is quite clear that he believed there was some very definite connection between the resurrection of osiris and of himself and also that the god was able to raise him up and to give him everlasting life because he himself had conquered death and risen and had become the master of everlasting life if the legend of plutarch which states that osiris was once a man who lived upon earth really represents an egyptian belief we may perhaps conclude that the manhood 
which was common to the god and to the suppliant supplied the reason why the prayers which are put into the mouth of the dead are always addressed to osiris at all events closer personal relations existed between man and osiris than between man and any other god moreover for countless generations he was the type and emblem of the resurrection and relying upon his power to give immortality to man untold generations lived and died the ceremonies connected with the celebration of the sufferings death and resurrection of osiris were performed with great solemnity and it has been thought that a representation of them took place annually in certain of his shrines the forms in which osiris is depicted on the monuments and in papyri are very numerous but we need only refer here to those which concern him in his character as king god and judge of the dead in papyri he is seated on a throne within a covered shrine his form is that of a bearded mummy wearing the atef crown and he holds in his hands the crook and flail or whip emblems of sovereignty and dominion on the side of the throne which rests upon a pedestal made in the form of a parallelogram the symbol of that which is straight or right is the emblem of the union of southern and northern egypt which typifies the sovereignty of the god over the whole land the throne is sometimes placed upon water wherein we may probably see the origin of the tradition of certain eastern peoples which makes the throne of the deity to rest above running water behind him frequently stand the goddesses isis and nephthys and facing him standing upon a lotus flower are the four children of horus thus seated praise was offered to him in these words glory be to thee o cyrus un nefer the great god within abydos king of eternity lord of the everlasting who passeth through millions of years in his existence praise be unto thee osiris lord of eternity un nefer harmachus whose forms are manifold and whose attributes are majestic those who have lain down that is the dead rise up to see thee they breathe the air and they look upon thy face when the disc riseth on its horizon their hearts are at peace inasmuch as they behold thee o thou who art eternity and everlastingness in an address to osiris by thoth which forms the one hundred and eighty-second chapter of the book of the dead he is said to be the governor of those who are in the underworld and to make men and women to be born again the new birth being the birth into the life which is beyond the grave and being himself everlasting he had power to bestow eternal existence upon his followers concerning the form in which osiris rose from the dead the texts are silent and nothing is said as to the nature of his body in the underworld that he dwelt in the material body which was his upon earth there is no reason whatever to suppose for there are indications in the texts which point to a definite belief in the resurrection of a spiritual body both in the case of the god and of men before however this point is touched upon reference must be made to the ideas which the egyptians held concerning the component parts of man's entity material spiritual and mental the physical or material body called khat was liable to decay and could only be preserved by mummifying both gods and man possessed bodies of this nature when the material body had been brought to the tomb for burial provided that the prescribed prayers had been said over it and the proper ceremonies had been duly performed by the priests it acquired the power of sending forth from itself a body called sahu which was able to ascend to heaven and to dwell with the gods there the only suitable rendering for the word sahu is spiritual body and this meaning fits very well into the translation of the text where the word is found the educated egyptian never believed that the material body would rise again and take up a new life for he well understood that flesh and blood could not inherit immortality it has been urged by some that the custom of mummifying the dead which obtained throughout egypt for so many thousands of years was maintained because the egyptian believed in the resurrection of the material body but it is not so they mummified their dead simply because they believed that spiritual bodies would 
germinate in them in several places it is distinctly said that the soul is in heaven and the body upon earth and even the dead body of osiris himself rested upon earth in heliopolis elsewhere it is said to the deceased thy soul is in heaven before ra thy ka hath what should be given to it with the gods thy sahu hath power or is glorious with the khus and thy body kat is established in the underworld tuat it is possible that certain simple folk may have been led to believe that because meat offerings and drink offerings in abundance were taken to the tombs the deceased must naturally partake of them and it is more than probable that the egyptians in a semi-savage state made such offerings because they believed them necessary for their dead the offerings taken to the tomb were intended for the ka of the deceased the word ka has formed the subject of several learned dissertations by various scholars and it is now generally rendered by double it has its equivalent in the coptic ro and in the greek elaukon and in certain places may be rendered by all the meanings of these equivalents this abstract individuality or personality possessed all the attributes of the man himself and though its normal dwelling-place was in the tomb along with the body it could wander about at will it was independent of the man to whom it belonged and could even go and dwell in the statue of a man the ka could both eat and drink and at a very early period a small chamber was specially prepared for it in the hall of the tomb this was provided with an opening through which it might snuff the smell of the incense and other offerings made therein and it was the duty of certain members to minister duly and regularly to its needs when actual offerings failed it would seem that the ka fed upon those which were painted or sculptured upon the walls and altars in the tomb and when these were wanting it appears that it might even be reduced to eating offal and drinking filthy water connected in some inexplicable way with the ka was the ba or soul which according to some texts is said to eat of the funeral offerings along with the ka in whom or with whom it was supposed to dwell but according to others it ascended into heaven where it lived with ra and the beautiful dead from one point of view it is not a material thing and from another it is a tangible thing it is depicted as a human-headed hawk and in a vignette in the papyrus of nebket it is seen flying down the funeral pit bearing air and food to the mummified body lying in the mummy chamber to which it belongs the ba could leave its place in heaven and visit the body whenever it pleased and it had power to assume any form which it pleased certain of the characteristics of the ba were shared by the heart ab which was believed to be the source both of life and of good and evil in man the preservation of the heart was of the first importance and several chapters of the book of the dead were composed with the object of keeping it out of the clutches of the stealers of hearts in the judgment scene it is the one member of the body which is singled out for a special examination and the large numbers of heart amulets which are preserved in the national collections of egyptian antiquities testify to the anxiety which the egyptians felt as to its security with the ba or soul the kaya bit or shadow is often mentioned and it seems to have been nourished by the offerings which were made in the tomb of the man to whom it belonged it had an existence apart from the body and like the ka or double it could wander wherever it pleased an interesting passage concerning the shadow is found in the ninety-second chapter of the book of the dead where the deceased prays o keep not captive my soul o keep not ward over my shadow but let a way be opened for my soul and for my shadow and let them see the great god in the shrine on the day of the judgment of souls and let them recite the utterances of osiris whose habitations are hidden to those who guard the members of osiris and who keep ward over the khus and who hold captive the shadows of the dead who would work evil against me another integral part of a man was the khu or 
shining translucent covering of the spiritual body which dwelt in heaven with the gods it is difficult to explain its exact relationship to the double and the soul and the heart and the shadow but in certain passages in which the word occurs it seems as if it had some close connection with the soul for it is mentioned along with it in several passages both in early and late texts the sekum of a man is mentioned with the ba or soul and sometimes with both the ka or double and the ba one of the meanings of sekum is form or statue but another meaning is power and it seems as if the egyptians conceived the idea of the power or vital force of a man living with him in heaven the gods were supposed to possess doubles and souls and shadows and hearts and coups but it is doubtful if they were endowed with sekum it is probable that they were not many of them were themselves sekum or powers there remains now but one attribute of a man to mention and that is the ren or name in egypt a man took the most extraordinary precautions to prevent his name from being blotted out for it was the common belief that unless the name of a person were preserved he ceased to exist already in the pyramid texts as dr wiedemann has pointed out we find the deceased making supplication that his name may flourish literally germinate along with the names of tem shu seb and other gods and the same desire is expressed in texts from the sixth dynasty down to the roman period when we find that a number of papyri were inscribed with invocations to one or more gods with the sole object of making to flourish the names of those for whom they were copied the ren or name had some close connection with the ka or double as may be seen from the passage in the text of pepi the first thus we see that the sahu or spiritual body the ka or double the ba or soul the ab or heart the ku or shining form the sekum or vital force and the ren or name and the kai bit or shade were all believed to come into existence after death and it seems that the various parts which we have enumerated together made up the spiritual body which germinated in the cot or material body there is little doubt that the beliefs in the existence of these various members of the spiritual body are not all of the same age and they probably represent several stages of intellectual development on the part of the egyptian their origin and development it is now impossible to trace for already in the fifth and sixth dynasties their existence is accepted as an accomplished fact a question naturally arises at this point as to when this spiritual body began its existence but unfortunately no satisfactory answer can at present be given to it for no text yet discovered supplies the necessary information it is natural to suppose that the sahu or spiritual body came into being as a result of the prayers which were recited on the day of the burial of the mummified body and of the ceremonies which were performed at the same time on the other hand there exist distinct proofs that the egyptians believe in a judgment which was to be held in the domain of osiris and we should hardly expect the spiritual body to begin its career until after the trial of the heart in the balance and until the verdict of the gods at this judgment was favourable to the deceased the whole question is full of difficulty chiefly because the egyptians themselves did not i imagine form definite ideas on such subjects or if they did they did not put them in writing it is however perfectly certain that they believed that osiris had the power to make men to be born after death into a new life and that such life was everlasting and they ascribed to him this power because he had himself suffered death and mutilation and had risen from the dead End of introduction osiris and resurrection introduction the judgment of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the judgment of the dead an examination of the papyri inscribed with the theban recension of the book of the dead shows that they may be divided into two classes 
these one those in which the chapters of coming forth by day are preceded by introductory hymns to ra and osiris and by a judgment scene and two those in which they are preceded by a simple vignette in which the god osiris is seen seated within a shrine the oldest papyri of the eighteenth dynasty lack such introductory hymns and the judgment scene which appear most often in the illuminated papyri of the last half of the eighteenth dynasty they continue in the nineteenth dynasty but frequently in a less full form in the older recensions of the book of the dead there is no attempt to describe the judgment pictorially and although it is pretty certain that every egyptian believed that he would be judged after death there is no definite statement of the fact it will be noticed that a section of chapter thirty b contains the words my heart my mother my heart my mother my heart whereby i came into being may naught stand up to oppose me at my judgment may there be no opposition to me in the presence of the sovereign princes of osiris may there be no parting of thee from me in the presence of him that keepeth the balance let there be joy of heart unto us at the weighing of words let not that which is false be uttered against me before the great god the lord of amentet here clearly we have suggested the idea of weighing the heart as the symbol of the seed of life and the source of good and evil actions and as a matter of fact the vignette of the chapter which first appears in the eighteenth dynasty represents the deceased sitting in one pan of the scales and being weighed against his heart which is placed in the other it is not easy to say exactly what belief underlies this vignette but it seems to indicate that the guardian of the scale weighed the body to see if it had carried out properly the heart's directions and that if it had done so it would counterbalance exactly the heart and the beam of the scales would be straight this testing of the body or heart or both took place in the presence of osiris on the day when words were weighed in the papyrus of ani four small vignettes accompany the negative confession which forms part of the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter and in one of these we see the heart of the deceased in one pan of the balance and a feather emblematic of right and truth that is what is straight in the other the god anubis is testing the tongue of the balance and close by stands the monster am met or eater of the dead here we have a proof that in addition to the weighing of a man's body against his heart the heart itself was weighed against right and truth and that this stage of the judgment also took place in the presence of the god osiris the judge of the dead in the eighteenth dynasty if not earlier the idea of the judgment took great hold upon the minds of the egyptians and it found expression in the large and elaborate vignette which is prefixed to the copies of the chapters of coming forth by day which were made at this period it is however impossible to say whether the large vignette is a development of that which accompanies the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter or whether each had a distinct origin when once the idea of the great judgment scene had developed itself it seems to have been felt that the deceased ought not to enter into the hall of judgment without having first uttered words of prayer and praise to the great gods ra and osiris to the former as the greatest of the cosmic gods and to the latter as the judge and god of the dead hence were composed the introductory hymns to ra and osiris of which several examples are known in the hymns to ra the deceased apostrophizes the glory and majesty of the one god the creator of the world and all that therein is 
who manifests himself to his creatures under the form of the sun and by whose heat and light men and women beasts and feathered fowl fish and creeping things trees and herbs have their being the darkness of night into which the sun disappeared when he set was personified as an enemy of the sun and the daily victory of light over darkness was hymned with gladness by his worshippers from one point of view the egyptian regarded the course of the sun as a type of his own life and day symbolized life and night death the conflict in which the sun engaged with the powers of darkness typified the struggle of the deceased with his enemies in the underworld and man hoped that he would overcome them even as the sun vanquished all who opposed his course in a fine hymn the deceased says o thou beautiful being thou dost renew thyself in thy season in the form of the disc within thy mother hathor therefore in every place every heart swelleth with joy at thy rising eternally o ra the divine man-child the heir of eternity self-begotten and self-born prince of the tuat governor of the regions of okert thou god of life thou lord of love all men live when thou shinest thou art crowned king of the gods those who are in thy following sing unto thee with joy and bow down their foreheads to the earth when they meet thee thou lord of heaven thou lord of earth thou king of right and truth thou lord of eternity thou prince of everlastingness thou sovereign of all the gods thou god of life thou creator of eternity thou maker of heaven wherein thou art firmly established the company of the gods rejoice at thy rising the earth is glad when it beholdeth thy rays the peoples that have been long dead come forth with cries of joy to see thy beauties daily the serpent fiend that is darkness hath fallen his arms are hewn off the knife hath cut asunder his joints ra liveth in unchanging and eternal law and order again in another hymn we read thou risest thou risest thou shinest thou shinest thou art crowned king of the gods thou art the lord of heaven thou art the lord of earth thou art the creator of beings celestial and of beings terrestrial thou art the one god who came into being in the beginning of time thou didst create the earth thou didst fashion man thou didst make the watery abyss of the sky thou didst form hapi that is the nile thou didst create the watery abyss and didst give life to all that therein is thou hast knit together the mountains thou hast made mankind and the beast of the field to come into being thou hast made the heavens and the earth thou art crowned prince of heaven thou art the one dowered with all sovereignty who comest forth from the sky ra is victorious o thou divine youth thou heir literally flesh and bone of everlastingness thou self-begotten one o thou who didst give thyself birth o one mighty one of myriad forms and aspects king of the world prince of anu lord of eternity and ruler of everlastingness the company of the gods rejoice when thou risest and when thou sailest across the sky thou art unknown and no tongue is worthy to declare thy likeness only thou thyself canst do this thou hearest with thine ears and thou seest with thine eyes millions of years have gone over the world i cannot tell the number of those through which thou hast passed from these passages it is clear that the egyptians believed that the god who was typified by the sun was eternal immortal and unknown that is invisible that he created himself and the world and the beings and things in it he was also one and alone and there was none like unto him for the gods of whom he was king only possessed certain of his attributes and characteristics 
it had been denied by some that his oneness or unity is the same as the unity of god almighty though i believe there is no good reason for this view but whether it be or not it is perfectly certain that when the egyptians declared that their god was one they meant exactly what the hebrews meant when they declared that jehovah was one and what the arabs meant and still mean when they cry out that allah is one at all events the one god of the egyptians possessed all the essential attributes of the christian's god in the hymns to osiris the deceased enumerates the various titles of the god and mentions his most ancient shrines osiris is declared to be the son of seb the earth god and of nut the sky goddess and as prince of gods and men to have received the crook and the whip and the dignity of his divine fathers he is the king of eternity and lord of everlastingness and his existence is for millions of years in his name osiris he is most terrible and he endureth for ever in his name unnefer though possessing the attribute of eternal which is ascribed to ra he is not self-begotten and self-born like that god ra has no offspring in the human sense of the word but osiris begot a son after his death according to one legend who succeeded to his father's throne upon earth and avenged him on set his murderer from ra the deceased asks only that he may behold him at dawn each day but from osiris he asks that his ka or double may have splendour in heaven and might upon earth and triumph in the underworld and he adds may i sail down to tatu mendes or busiris like a living soul and up to abtu abydos like a benu bird may i go in and come out without repulse at the pylons of the lords of the underworld may there be given unto me loaves of bread in the house of coolness and offerings of food in anu heliopolis and a homestead for ever in Sekhet aru with wheat and barley therefore judging by the arrangement of the papyrus of ani the papyrus of hugh nefer the papyrus of kenna and other documents of the period it seems pretty clear that the introductory hymns and the vignette of the judgment seen together formed a special section of the fine papyri of the theban recension the vignette of the judgment scene varies in detail greatly in the various papyri though the essential parts of it are always preserved the fullest form known of it is given in the papyrus of ani and may be thus described in one portion of a chamber in the domain of osiris which we may assume to be the hall of the double maat or right and truth a balance is set wherein the heart of the deceased is to be weighed the beam of the balance is suspended upon a projection from the standard made in the form of the feather which symbolizes right and truth upon the beam of the balance sits the dog-headed ape which was associated with thoth the scribe of the gods the weighing of the heart is carried out in the presence of the company of the gods which is here represented by the following members of it one ra heru kuti or ra hamarchus the great god within his boat this boat was called the bark of millions of years and there sat in it along with ra the gods kapera and tem his own forms in the morning and evening respectively two temu or tem the form of ra at eventide he was the head of the company of gods at heliopolis and is always represented in human form this fact indicates that already in the earliest times known to us he had gone through all the various stages through which gods pass and had assumed a final and definite form three shu the son of ra and hathor who lifted up the goddess nut or the sky from the embrace of seb the earth god he typified the light for tefnut the twin sister of shu she is depicted as a woman with the head of a lioness she typified moisture five seb the earth god the son of shu husband of nut 
and by her father of osiris and isis set and nephthys six nut the female counterpart of nu or the watery mass from which all the gods were evolved and upon which the bark of millions of years floated seven isis the sister wife of osiris the mother of horus son of isis she probably typified the dawn eight nephthys daughter of seb and nut sister of osiris and isis and the sister wife of set she is also said to be the mother of anubis by osiris she probably typified eventide or twilight nine horus the sun-god who is to be distinguished from horus the son of isis he is represented in human form but with the head of a hawk the hawk was the symbol of horus and the worship of that bird is probably the oldest in egypt ten hathor the goddess of that portion of the sky wherein horus the sun-god rose and set eleven hue and sa two gods who had their places in the boat of the sun at creation it will be noticed that several of the gods for example nu ptah knemu kepera set anpu apuat amsu hapi and several goddesses for example maat nit sekhet bast serk uachit are not here represented the explanation of this fact is that only the gods and the goddesses of the funeral company of osiris are considered to be interested in the judgment of the dead on one side of the scale we see the god anubis testing the tongue of the balance and behind him stand thoth the scribe of the gods writing down the result of the weighing and the triform beast Amit, the eater of the dead who is waiting to devour the heart of ani should it be found light in the balance on the other side of the balance are ani's luck or destiny an object called meskin which has been described as a cubit with human head it either typifies the embryo or has some connection with the birth of ani his soul in the form of a human-headed bird perched upon a pylon and behind these are the goddesses renanet and mekenet who presided over ani's birth chamber and rearing behind these stand ani himself and his wife thu thu with heads reverently bent ani is here depicted in human form and wearing garments and ornaments similar to those which he wore upon earth it is quite clear that the body which he has in this hall of judgment cannot be the body with which he had been endowed upon earth and we are probably to understand that it is his spiritual body wearing the white robes of the beatified dead in the world beyond the grave which we see he is perfect in all his members which are endowed with the strength and power that belong to those who have risen in a spiritual or glorified body from the dead though he stands at the entrance of the hall and the weighing of the heart has not yet taken place the artist depicted him in the form in which it was always assumed the just would appear before osiris the heart having been placed in one pan of the scales and the feather symbolic of truth in the other ani utters the words which form chapter thirty b of the book of the dead wherein he prays that there may be no parting of his heart from him in the presence of the guardian of the balance this done anubis tests the tongue of the balance and finds that the beam is exactly straight and that the heart balances the feather exactly the dog-headed ape seated on the standard reports this to thoth who standing with his writing reed in hand is ready to note the result and to declare it to the gods it is interesting to observe that the heart was only required to balance the feather and not to outweigh it a fact which indicates that the pious egyptian was supposed to be able to satisfy the demands and requirements of the law and that he took his stand in the judgment and hoped for acquittal by virtue of the good deeds which he had done in the body the god thoth next addressed the company of the gods as follows hear ye this judgment 
the heart of osiris hath in very truth been weighed and his soul hath stood as a witness for him it hath been found true by trial in the great balance there hath not been found any wickedness in him he hath not wasted the offerings in the temples he hath not done harm by his deeds and he spread no evil reports about men while he was upon earth to this speech the gods reply that which cometh forth from thy mouth o thoth dwelling in kamenu is confirmed osiris the scribe ani is holy and righteous he hath not sinned neither hath he done evil against us the devourer amemet shall not be allowed to prevail over him and meat offerings and entrance into the presence of the god osiris shall be granted unto him together with a homestead for ever in sekhet hetepu as unto the followers of horus the gods confirm the report of thoth and ani having been found just is led into the presence of osiris by horus the son of isis the words found just represent in a measure the words ma keru or ma ut keru masculine feminine which are always added after the name of the deceased in funeral texts there is no example of their application to a living person much has been written about them and many renderings have been suggested for them such as true of voice justify triumphant victorious they actually mean right ma and word keru and seem to be meant to express the belief on the part of the writer that the deceased has satisfactorily passed the ordeal of judgment and that he has attained to the state in which his commands whatever they may be will be carried out duly and effectually while horus is leading ani into the presence of his father he addresses osiris saying i have come unto thee o unnefer and i have brought thee osiris ani unto thee his heart has been found righteous coming forth from the balance and it hath not sinned against any god or goddess thoth hath weighed it according to the decree uttered unto him by the company of the gods and it is very true and righteous grant unto him cakes and ale and let him enter into the presence of osiris that is into thy presence and may he be like unto the followers of horus for ever in the last division of the judgment scene we see ani kneeling by a table of offerings placed before the shrine of the god osiris to whom he says o lord of amentet i am in thy presence there is no sin in me i have not lied wittingly nor have i done aught with a false heart grant that i may be like unto those favoured ones who are round about thee and that i may be an osiris greatly favoured of the beautiful god and beloved of the lord of the world the royal scribe indeed who loveth him ani triumphant before the god osiris it will be noticed that ani now has his hair whitened and that he wears upon his head the object which is called a comb the signification of which is unknown he has at length penetrated to the throne of osiris the lord of eternity as the words written above read and ani's petition to the god is that he may become an osiris that is to say a being endowed with a spiritual body which can never again see death or suffer corruption the answer of osiris is not given in the papyrus nor is it as far as i have seen in any papyrus where a similar petition is made but just as it is always assumed that the heart of the deceased will always balance the feather of law or right and truth so is it also assumed that the petition of the deceased will always be favourably received and that he will henceforth be free to go about in the god's domains without let or hindrance and to participate in all the occupations of the great god himself thus the judgment scene ends and this section of the papyrus in which it is found is followed by the chapters of coming forth by day the question naturally arises here when did the judgment in the hall of osiris take place to this no definite answer can be given for the reason that no text supplies the information needed 
there are no grounds so far as i see for assuming that the egyptians believed in a great general day of judgment when all the world shall be judged and the wicked shall be punished and the righteous shall be rewarded or for thinking as some have done that the mummified bodies were laid in the tomb to await a general resurrection on the contrary all the evidence seems to point to the conclusion that the judgment of each individual was thought to take place immediately after death and if this was the belief it follows that punishment or reward was allotted to the dead at once the evil heart or the heart which had failed to balance the feather symbolic of the law was given to the monster Amit to devour thus punishment consisted of instant annihilation unless we imagine that the destruction of the heart was extended over an indefinite period the difficulty of the subject is further complicated when we come to consider the use and object of the funeral ceremonies and prayers if at his death the soul of a man passed to immediate judgment what could the ceremonies and prayers of the priests avail it we know that the embalming of a body in the best and most expensive way occupied a period varying from seventy to about one hundred days and that several more days were necessary before the body was coffined and laid with the proper ceremonies in the tomb if the prayers which the priests recited and the ceremonies which they performed over it at the grave were absolutely necessary for the future well-being of its soul and if the soul could not begin its beatified existence until such prayers had been said and such ceremonies had been performed it is difficult to understand why such a lengthy process of embalmment was resorted to for during the period which elapsed between death and burial the soul must have tarried in some intermediate place in the absence of exact knowledge we can only assume that certain prayers were said for the benefit of the deceased immediately after death and that such prayers assured his acquittal in the hall of osiris and procured for him entrance into the abode of the blessed this done the embalmment of the body might be carried out at the convenience of all concerned and the elaborate and formal ceremonies connected with the sepulture of the great would follow in due course the beliefs which are connected with the judgment of the dead are so numerous and so conflicting and belong to so many various periods of development of religious thought in egypt that it is impossible to harmonize them as new texts are discovered the difficulties will probably disappear one by one and the future labours of egyptologists will clear up many obscure passages which up to the present have been misunderstood end of introduction the judgment introduction the elysian fields of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain the elysian fields of heaven at a very early period in their history the egyptians believed in the existence of a place wherein the blessed dead led a life of happiness the characteristics of which much resemble those of the life which he had led upon earth these characteristics are so similar that it is hard to believe that in the early times the one life was not held to be a mere continuation of the other at all events the delights and pleasures of this world were believed to be forthcoming in the next and a life there in a state of happiness which depended absolutely upon material things was contemplated such ideas date from the time when the egyptians were in a semi-savage state and the preservation of them is probably due to their extreme conservatism in all matters connected with religion the remarkable point about them is their persistence for they occur in texts which belong to periods when it was impossible for the egyptians to have attached any serious importance to them and some of the coarsest ideas are in places mingled with the expression of lofty spiritual conceptions 
in a passage in the text of eunice it is said of this king eunice hath come to his pools which are on both sides of the stream of the goddess metert and to the place of verdant offerings and to the fields which are on the horizon he hath made his fields on both sides of the horizon to be verdant he hath brought the crystal to the great eye which is in the field he hath taken his seat in the horizon he riseth like sebek the son of neith he eateth with his mouth he voideth water he enjoyeth the pleasures of love and he is the begetter who carrieth away women from their husbands whenever it pleaseth him so to do and in the text of teta we read hail osiris teta horus hath granted that thoth shall bring thine enemy unto thee he hath placed thee behind him that he may not harm thee and that thou mayest make thy seat upon him and that when coming forth thou mayest sit upon him so that he may not be able to force intercourse upon thee these passages give a very clear idea of the state of egyptian morals when they were written and they indicate the indignities to which those vanquished in war both male and female were exposed at the hands of the conquerors the texts of the early period as will be seen from the extracts given further on give a large amount of information about the pleasures of the deceased in the world beyond the grave but no attempt to illustrate the employments of the blessed dead is given until the eighteenth dynasty when the vignette to the one hundred and tenth chapter of the book of the dead was inserted in papyri here we have an idea given of the conception which the egyptian formed of the place wherein he was to dwell after death a homestead or farm or country intersected with canals is at once his paradise and the home of the blessed dead and the abode of the god of his city this place is called sekhet aru or field of reeds and this name seems to indicate that the egyptian placed his paradise in the north of egypt probably in some part of the delta or in the islands of the sea still further north certain it is that the deceased prays several times that the sweet breath of the north wind may be given unto him and those who have experienced the discomfort of a south wind on a hot day in egypt will sympathize with him the fields of reeds however was but a portion of the district called sekhet hetep or sekhet hetepet or fields of peace over which there presided a number of gods and here the deceased led a life which suggests that the idea of the whole place originated with a nation of agriculturists in the coloured vignette which faces chapter one hundred and ten the scribe ani is seen being introduced to the gods of sekhet hetep by thoth who accompanies him to smooth his way and to do for him all that he did for osiris next we see him sailing in a boat laden with offerings which he is bearing to the hawk god lower down we see him reaping wheat and driving the oxen which tread out the corn and beyond that he is kneeling before two heaps of grain one red and one white in the next division he is ploughing the land of sekhet anru or sekhet aru by the side of a stream of vast length and unknown breadth and which contains neither worm nor fish in the fourth division is the abode of the god osiris and here are the places where dwell those who are nourished upon divine food and the spiritual bodies of the dead in one section of this division the deceased placed the god of his city so that even in respect of his religious observances his life might be as perfect as it was upon earth his wishes in the matter of the future life are well expressed in the following prayer let me be rewarded with thy fields o god hetep that which is thy wish shalt thou do o lord of the winds may i become a ku therein may i eat therein may i drink therein may i plough therein may i reap therein may i fight therein may i make love therein may my words be mighty therein may i never be in a state of servitude therein but may i have authority therein elsewhere in the same chapter the deceased addresses the gods of the various lakes 
and sections of the elysian fields and he states that he has bathed in the holy lake that all uncleanness has departed from him and that he has arrayed himself in the apparel of ra in his new life even amusements are provided but they are the amusements of earth for he snares feathered fowl and sails about in his boat catching worms and serpents a remarkable passage in the text of unas describes the deceased king as a soul in the form of a god who devours his fathers and mothers and mankind generally and gods he hunts and entraps the gods in the plains of the next world and having tied them securely he slays and disembowels them the choice portions of their bodies he boils and consumes at his meals at dawn eventide and midnight the remainder he burns to heat the cauldrons he eats the hearts carefully so that he may absorb the vital powers of the gods and by eating other portions also he acquires all the attributes of the god inasmuch as he has eaten the bodies of the gods he becomes indeed a god and since they possess the attribute of everlasting life and could not die again the king becomes straightway possessed of their attributes here again we have a trace of a savage custom namely that of cutting out a portion of some intestine of a foe and eating it in order to acquire his mental and physical powers such a custom must have disappeared from egypt long before the monuments known to us were made and it is hard to understand the retention of such a notion in a text filled with sublime thoughts and ideas in the texts of all periods we read often that the deceased lives with ra that he stands among the company of the gods and that he is one like unto the divine beings who dwell with them but little is told us concerning his intercourse with those whom he has known upon earth and if it were not for some two or three passages in the theban recension of the book of the dead we should be obliged to assume that the power to recognize the friends of earth in the next world was not enjoyed by the deceased but that he really possessed this power at least so far as his parents were concerned we learn from the one hundred and tenth chapter where the deceased addressing a pool or a lake situated in the first section of the elysian fields says o quenquitet i have entered into thee and i have seen the osiris my father and i have identified my mother a delight however which he brackets with the pleasures of making love and of catching worms and serpents in the papyrus of the priestess on high we actually see the deceased lady in converse with two figures one of whom is probably her father and the other certainly her mother for above the head of the latter are written the words her mother mutes followed by the name a supplementary proof of this is afforded by a passage in the fifty-second chapter where the deceased says the god shall say unto me what manner of food wouldst thou have given unto thee and i reply let me eat my food under the sycamore tree of my lady the goddess hathor and let my times be among the divine beings who have alighted thereon let me have the power to order my own fields in tatu and my own growing crops in anu let me live upon bread made of white barley and let my ale be made from red grain and may the persons of my father and my mother be given unto me as guardians of my door and for the ordering of my territory the same idea is also expressed in the one hundred and eighty ninth chapter thus the deceased hoped to have in the next world an abundance of the material comforts which he enjoyed in this world and to meet again his own god and his father and mother as we see him frequently accompanied by his wife in several vignettes to other chapters we may assume that he would meet her again along with the children whom she bore him it will be noticed that little is said throughout the book of the dead about the spiritual occupations of the blessed dead and we are told nothing of the choirs of angels who hymn the deity everlastingly in the religious works of later western nations the dead who attain to everlasting life 
became in every respect like the divine inhabitants of heaven and they ate the same meat and drank the same drink and wore the same apparel and lived as they lived no classification of angels is mentioned and grades of them like cherubim and seraphim thrones powers dominions etc such as are found in the celestial hierarchy of semitic nations are unknown a celestial city constructed on the model described in the apocalypse is also unknown we have seen that the elysian fields much resemble the flat fertile lands intersected by large canals and streams of running water such as must always have existed and may still be seen in certain parts of the delta of the distance to be traversed by the dead before they were reached nothing whatever is said as the egyptian made his future world a counterpart of the egypt which he knew and loved and gave to it heavenly counterparts of all the sacred cities thereof he must have conceived the existence of a waterway like the nile with tributaries and branches whereon he might sail and perform his journeys according to some texts the abode of the dead was away beyond egypt to the north but according to others it might be either above or below the earth the oldest tradition of all placed it above the earth and the sky was the large flat or vaulted iron surface which formed its floor this iron surface was supported upon four pillars one at each of the cardinal points and its edges were some height above the earth to reach this iron ceiling of the earth and floor of heaven a ladder was thought to be necessary as we may see from the following passage in which pepi the king says homage to thee o ladder of the god homage to thee o ladder of set set thyself up o ladder of the god set thyself up o ladder of set set thyself up o ladder of horus whereby osiris appeared in heaven when he wrought protection for ra for it is thy son pepi and this pepi is horus and thou hast given birth to this pepi even as thou hast given birth to the god who is the lord of the ladder thou hast given unto him the ladder of the god and thou hast given unto him the ladder of set whereby this pepi hath appeared in heaven when he wrought protection for ra and in another place we read pepi goeth to his mother nut there that is in heaven and he entereth therein in his name of ladder elsewhere we are told that pepi is holy he hath received his staff he is provided with his throne and he hath taken his seat in the boat of the double company of the gods ra acteth as his pilot in his journey to the west and he establisheth his throne for him at the head of the lords of Kaz, and he hath inscribed his name at the head of the living the pe ka which is in the waters openeth its doors to this pepi and the iron which formeth the ceiling of the heavens unbolteth its gates to this pepi pepi passeth through them having his panther skin upon him and his whip in his hand a later belief placed the abode of the departed away to the west or northwest of egypt and the souls of the dead made their way thither through a gap in the mountains on the western bank of the nile near abydos a still later belief made out that the abode of the departed was a long mountainous narrow valley with a river running along it starting from the east it made its way to the north and then taking a circular direction it came back to the east in this valley there lived all manner of fearful monsters and beasts and here was the country through which the sun passed during the twelve hours of night it is impossible to reconcile all the conflicting statements concerning the abode of the dead and the egyptians themselves held different views about it at different periods the following extracts however from the pyramid texts will show the reader what views were held by them concerning the home of the blessed dead in the next world and concerning their treatment therein by the gods behold unas cometh behold unas cometh behold unas cometh forth and if unas cometh not of his own accord thy message having come to him shall bring him unas maketh his way to his abode and the cow goddess of the great lake boweth down before him none shall ever take away his food from the great boat and he shall not be repulsed at the white house of the great ones by the region 
kent on the border of the sky behold unas hath arrived at the height of heaven and he seeth his body in the semketet boat and unas laboreth therein he hath satisfied Eureus in the mat boat and hath washed it and the hammamat beings have testified concerning him the winds and storms of heaven have strengthened him and they introduce him to ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace ra so that he may go forth towards the horizon o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace heru kuti harmachus so that he may go forth towards the horizon with ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace unas so that he may go forth towards the horizon with ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace unas so that he may go forth towards the horizon along with haru kuti and ra this unas is happily united to his ka his panther skin and his grain bag are upon him his whip and his is in his hand his sceptre is in his grasp they bring to him the four khus who dwell in the hair of horus who stand on the east side of heaven and are glorious by reason of their sceptres and they declare the fair name of unas to ra and they make him to escape from neheb kau and the soul of this unas liveth in the north of the seket aru and he saileth about in the lake of ka whilst this unas saileth towards the east side of the horizon whilst he saileth saileth towards the east side of heaven his sister the star septet giveth him birth in the tuat thou hast thy heart osiris thou hast thy legs osiris thou hast thine arms osiris and unas himself hath his heart and unas himself hath his legs and unas himself hath his arms he hath walked with his legs towards heaven he hath come forth with them into heaven and his mouth declareth itself by the great dew unas flieth like a feathered fowl he hovereth and alighteth like a beetle he flieth like a feathered fowl and alighteth like a beetle upon the empty seat which is in thy boat o ra kindle the fire in order that the flame may rise up and throw incense upon it in order that the smell of incense may rise up thy scent cometh towards unas incense thy scent cometh toward unas incense your scent cometh towards this unas and the scent of unas cometh towards you o ye gods unas is with you and you are with unas o ye gods unas liveth with you and you live with unas o ye gods love ye unas o ye gods love him o ye gods come o part of ra come o matter which cometh forth from the thighs of horus come o ye who have come forth come o ye who have come forth come o ye who are feeble come o ye who are feeble come shu come shu come shu for unas cometh forth upon the thighs of isis for unas is feeble o ye gods upon the thighs of nephthys and he hath been ejected from the womb he who setteth up the ladder for osiris is ra and he who setteth up the ladder is horus for his father osiris when he goeth forth to his soul ra is on one side and horus is on the other and unas is between them being indeed the god of holy dwelling-places coming forth from the sanctuary unas standeth up and is horus unas sitteth down and is set ra receiveth him soul in heaven and body in earth those who are happy and who see unas those who are content and who contemplate unas are the gods if this god come forth towards heaven unas also shall come forth towards heaven and he shall have his souls upon him and his book shall be upon both sides of him and his inscribed amulets shall be upon his feet and the god seb shall do for him what hath been done for himself the divine souls of the city of pei and the divine souls of the city of nekon shall come unto him along with the gods of heaven and the gods of the earth and they shall lift unas up upon their hands come forth then unas to heaven and enter therein thy name of ladder heaven hath been given unto unas and earth hath been given unto him this is the decree which tem hath issued to seb and the domains of horus and the domains of set and the second aru with their harvests adore thee in thy name of khonsu sept teta hath not hunger like shu teta hath not thirst like tefnut for hapi tal 
utef queb senef and amset that is the four children of horus destroy the hunger which is in the belly of teta and this thirst which is upon the lips of teta the hunger of teta is with shu the thirst of teta is with tefnut teta liveth upon the daily bread which cometh in its season he liveth upon that upon which shu liveth and he eateth that which shu eateth filth is an abomination to teta and he rejecteth filthy water ye have taken teta to you o ye gods and he eateth what ye eat he drinketh that which ye drink he liveth upon that upon which ye live he sitteth down as ye sit he is mighty with the might which is yours he saileth about even as ye sail about the house of teta is a net in the second aru he hath streams of running water in second hatep the offerings of teta are with you o ye gods the water of teta is as wine even as is water to ra teta revolveth in heaven like ra and he goeth round about the sky like thoth the two doors of heaven are open for thee o teta for thou hast raised up thy head for thy bones and thou hast raised up thy bones for thy head thou hast opened the two doors of heaven thou hast drawn back the great bolts thou hast removed the seal of the great door and with a face like that of a jackal and a body like that of a fierce lion thou hast taken thy seat upon thy throne and thou criest to the khus come to me come to me come to horus who hath avenged his father for it is teta who will lead thee in thou puttest thy hand upon the earth and with thine arm thou doest battle in the great domain and thou revolvest there among the khus and thou standest up like osiris hail osiris tata horus hath come to embrace thee with his arms and he hath made thoth to drive away for thee in defeat the followers of set and he hath taken them captive on thy behalf and he hath repulsed the heart of set for he is stronger than set and now thou art come forth before him and seb hath watched thy journey and he hath set thee in thy place and hath led unto thee thy two sisters isis and nephthys horus hath united thee unto the gods and they show themselves as brothers unto thee in thy name sent and they do not repulse thee in thy name atert he hath granted that the gods shall guard thee and seb hath set his sandal upon the head of thine enemy thou hast driven back the enemy thy son horus hath smitten him and he hath torn out his own eye and given it unto thee in order that thou mayest be strong thereby and that thou mayest gain the mastery thereby among the khus horus hath permitted thee to hack thine enemy in pieces with this eye he smiteth down thine enemy with it for horus is stronger than he is and he passeth judgment upon his father who is in thee in thy name he whose father is stronger than heaven the goddess nut hath made thee to be a god unto set in thy name of god and thy mother nut hath spread out her two arms over thee in her name of coverer of heaven horus hath smitten set and he hath cast him down beneath thee and set beareth thee up and is a mighty one beneath thee inasmuch as he is the great one of the earth which he ordereth in the name of ta cha sir ta horus hath granted that set shall be judged in his heart in his house with thee and he hath granted that thou shalt smite him with thy hand when and so whensoever he doeth battle with thee hail osiris tata horus hath avenged thee and he hath caused his ka which is in thee to make thee to rest in thy name of ka hetep hail osiris tata seb hath given to thee thy two eyes that thou mayest rest in the two eyes of this great one that is osiris who is in thee seb hath made them to be given unto thee by horus that thou mayest rest upon them that isis and nephthys may see thee and that they may find thee horus hath made an offering unto thee horus hath granted that isis and nephthys may protect thee and they have handed thee over to horus that he may rest upon thee horus hath glorified thee in thy name of horizon where ra showeth himself in thy arms in the name of dweller in the palace thou hast made thy hand to be like a wall behind him behind him to give stability to his bones and to magnify his heart the right side of teta belongeth to horus who smiteth the tachen true in his two sceptres and nephthys in the two eyes the left side of teta belongeth to set who judgeth teta hail 
bolt which closeth the door of nut it is tata shu who cometh forth from tem hail nu grant that the door may be opened to tata for he cometh as a divine soul nu hath adjudged tata to tem and peka hath adjudged tata to shu he granteth that the two doors of heaven shall be opened and he hath decreed that tata shall be among men without name but behold thou hast grasped tata by the hand and thou hast drawn him to heaven so that he may never die upon earth among men o father of tata o father of tata in the darkness o father of tata tem in the darkness thou hast brought tata near thee because he hath performed the shooting forth of flame and the making protection even as the four goddesses isis nephthys neith and Serkethetu did for the father of nu on the day of protecting the throne o road of horus extend thy sail for tata give thy hand to tata hail ra come for tata passeth to the shore even as thy followers the unka who love thee have passed thee stretch out thy hand to the west stretch out thy hand to tata stretch out thy hand to the east stretch out thy hand to tata even as thou hast done to the place where is the eldest son this tata is osiris and he hath motion this tata hath detestation of the earth and he will not enter into seb this tata hath broken for ever his sleep and his dwelling which is upon earth the bones of tata flourish and obstacles to him are are destroyed for he is purified with the eye of horus the obstacles which he encountered are beaten down by the two tichert goddesses that is isis and nephthys and tata hath cast to the earth his seed in kes the sister of this tata the lady of the city of pe bewaileth him and the two nurses who created osiris also create him tata is in heaven this tata is in heaven like shu and ra this tata perisheth not and nothing in him perisheth nay this tata is the governor of his leg of the first-born gods this tata sitteth not as the guardian of god the offerings of this tata are for horus and ra and the sepulchral offerings of this tata are in nu this is tata and he goeth with ra this tata cometh with ra he hath embraced his habitations he giveth opposition and destroyeth it he gathereth the cause and delivereth them this tata watcheth and lieth down and he hath destroyed the two anuti in unu the foot of this tata departeth not and the heart of this tata is not repulsed rise up tata and lift up thy legs o most mighty one to go and seat thyself among the gods and do thou that which osiris has done in the house of the prince which is in anu thou hast received thy spiritual body sa and none shall set bounds to thy foot in heaven and none shall repulse thee on earth the khus who are the children of nut whom nephthys hath suckled have gathered together to thee thou standest up upon thy strength and thou doest that which thou must do for thy khu in the presence of all the khus thou goest to the city of pe thou art glorified and returnest thou goest to the city of nekin thou art glorified and returnest thou doest that which osiris did and behold this most mighty khu teta tata is upon his throne and standeth up being provided with all things like the goddess sam ur none shall repulse thee in any place wherein thou wouldst enter and none shall set bounds to thy foot concerning any place wherein it pleaseth thee to be hail osiris tata stand up rise up for thy mother nut hath brought thee forth and seb hath placed thy mouth for thee the great company of the gods have defended thee and they have set thine enemy beneath thee thou hast borne that which is greater than thou art through them in thy name atef mahur which is greater than thou art in thy name of ta abtu thy two sisters isis and nephthys come to thee and they make thee to pass by quemt ert in thy name of quem ur and aneb uchet ert in thy name of uach mu they thy sister isis came to thee with thy members and thou wert united into her and thou didst give her seed and didst provide her with offspring like septet hail hail rise up tata thou hast received thy head thou hast embraced thy bones thou hast gathered together thy flesh and blood and thou goest round about the earth seeking for food thou hast received thy bread which decayeth never and thy beer which goeth bad never thou standest at the gates which drive back the wreck 
khent mentef cometh forth unto thee he graspeth thee by the hand and he leadeth thee to heaven to thy father seb who is glad when he meeteth thee he giveth thee his two hands he maketh himself a brother unto thee he feedeth thee he setteth thee among the khus who never perish and the beings whose habitations are hidden make adoration unto thee rise up then o thou tata who never diest of the exudations which have fallen from the eye of horus upon the branches of the olive tree of the two horus gods who are in the temples o mighty lord of divine food in anu thou givest bread to tata and thou givest beer to tata thou makest tata to flourish thou makest his offerings to flourish and thou makest his to flourish if tata suffereth hunger the two lion gods suffer hunger if tata suffereth thirst thy mother nekebet suffereth thirst tata maketh broad the throne with seb tata lifteth on high the vault of heaven with ra tata walketh round about in sekhet hetep tata is the eye of ra who lieth down and is born each day homage to thee o ra in thy beauty in thy splendours in thy seats and in thy plenitude thou hast brought the milk of isis to tata and the water of the celestial stream of nephthys and power to journey over the great green sea and life and strength and health and the pleasures of love and bread and beer and apparel and everything whereon tata liveth and power to hearken to the gods who speak throughout the day and to rest with them during the night and to partake of the offerings which are made unto them tata looketh upon thee when thou goest forth in the form of thoth leading the boat of ra to the fields which are in asu and when thou goest in among those who bear him up homage to thee o tata on this thy day whereon thou standest up before ra who cometh forth from the east and who clotheth thee in thy spiritual body sa among the souls anubis governor of amenti giveth thee thousands of cakes thousands of vessels of beer thousands of vases of oil thousands of oxen thousands of changes of apparel and thousands of bulls for thee is the smen goose slain for thee is the thirp goose shot with an arrow horus hath destroyed all the evil which is in tata by his four children and set forgetteth what he wrought against tata by means of his eight fiends and those whose habitations are hidden throw open the doors to him rise thou go to the earth and seek the things which have issued from thee rise thou up and pass thou on opposite to the khus thy two wings are like those of a hawk and thy hair is like the rays of a star cast ye nothing evil upon tata neither do ye carry off the heart of tata nor steal away the place wherein it abideth hail thou pepi thou journeyest on thou art glorious thou hast gotten power like the god who is on his throne that is osiris thou hast thy soul within thy body thou hast thy power behind thee thy uraret crown is upon thy head thy head dress is upon thy shoulders thy face is in front of thee those who acclaim thee are upon both sides of thee the followers of the god are following after thee the spiritual body sahu of the god are upon both sides of thee and they make the god to come the god cometh and pepi cometh upon the throne of osiris the khu which dwelleth in the city of natat cometh the form which dwelleth in the nome of teni isis speaketh with thee and nephthys holdeth converse with thee the khus come unto thee paying homage unto thee and they bow down even to the ground at thy feet by reason of thy book o pepi in the cities of sa thou comest forth before thy mother nut and she strengtheneth thine arm and she giveth unto thee a path in the horizon to the place where ra is the doors of heaven are open for thee the gates of quebhu are unbolted for thee thou findest ra who guardeth thee and he strengtheneth for thee thy hand and he guideth thee into the northern and southern heavens and he setteth thee upon the throne of osiris hail thou pepi the eye of horus cometh unto thee and holdeth converse with thee thy soul which dwelleth with the gods cometh unto thee and thy form sekum which dwelleth among the khus cometh unto thee in the same way that the son avenged his father in the same way that horus avenged osiris even so shall horus avenge pepi upon his enemies 
and thou shalt stand there o pepi avenged and armed and provided with the forms of osiris who is upon the throne of the governor of amenti and thou shalt have thy being as he hath his among the indestructible khus and thy soul shall stand up upon thy throne provided with thy attributes and it shall have its being as thou hast thine in the presence of him who is the governor of the living according to the decree of ra the great god who shall plough the wheat and the barley and give it unto thee as a gift therein hail thou pepi it is ra who hath given unto thee all life and strength for ever along with thy speech and thy body and thou hast received the attributes of the god and thou hast become great therein before the gods who dwell on the lake hail thou pepi thy soul standeth among the gods and among the khus and the fear of thee constraineth their hearts hail pepi inasmuch as thou hast set thyself upon thy throne of the governor of the living thy book it is which worketh upon their hearts and thy name liveth upon earth and groweth old upon earth and thou shalt neither perish nor decay for ever and ever rise thou up o pepi stand thou up o thou of great strength and take thy seat at the head of the gods and do thou the things which osiris did in the house of the prince in anu heliopolis thou hast received thy spiritual body sa and thy foot shall not be restrained in heaven and thou shalt not be repulsed upon earth and behold the khus who are the children of nut to whom nephthys hath given suck have gathered themselves together unto thee and thou standest up on thy strength and thou doest that which it is thine to do in the presence of thy khu for all the khus thou journeyest to the city of pei and thou doest what must be done therein and thou returnest thou goest to the city of nekin and thou doest what must be done therein and thou returnest thou doest that which osiris did and thou art upon his throne and this khu the one most mighty standeth up armed like smai ur and wherever thou goest more shall repulse thee none shall repulse thee repulse thee and none shall set a limit to thy feet wherever it pleaseth thee to go hail osiris pepi arise stand up for thy mother nut hath given birth unto thee and seb hath arranged thy mouth for thee the great company of the gods have avenged thee and they have put thine enemies beneath thee thou hast carried that which is greater than thyself through them in thy name of atef me ur and thou hast netted that which is greater than thyself through them in thy name of ta tani thy two sisters isis and nephthys come unto thee and they make thee to traverse kem turt and thy name of kem ur and aneb uchit urt in thy name of uach ur and verily thou art urt shent in shanur and teben shent in teben peshur heb nebu shent at in shen a sekmu and isis and nephthys have protected thee in the city of sot from their master who is in thee in thy name of master of sot and from their god who is in thee in thy name of god they adore thee so that thou mayest not depart from them in thy name of morning star and they bring offerings before thee so that thou mayest not suffer pain in thy name of techen true thy sister isis hath come unto thee rejoicing in thy love and thou hast had intercourse with her and hast made her to conceive and she is heavy with septet and hero sept cometh forth from thee as heru the dweller in septet and thou doest what must be done in him in thy name of khu dweller in tchentru and he avengeth thee in his name of horus the son who avengeth his father hail osiris pepi thou hast offered thy libation and thou hast made thy libation before horus in the name of comer forth from keb thou hast offered thine incense which maketh thee divine and thy mother nut hath made thee to be as a god to thine enemy in thy name of god thou hast offered the emanations which come forth from thee and horus hath granted that the gods which whithersoever thou goest thou hast offered the emanations which come forth from thee and horus hath granted that thou shalt judge his children wheresoever thou takest them and he decreeth for thee the renewals of youth in thy name of water of youth horus hath strength then and he judgeth his father in thee in his name of heru bat hail pepi thy journeying and thy and the journeying of thy mothers along with thee are the journeying of horus when he journeyeth forth and the journeying of his mothers who journey with him those who are with him urge him on and they lead him to the east hail thou pepi thine arms are ua pau and thy face is ab uat hail thou pepi a royal oblation thou seatest thyself in the regions of horus and thou goest about through the regions of set 
thou seatest thyself upon the iron throne and thou art judge at the head of the great company of the gods who dwell in anu hail thou pepi kent on marti or mat mati guardeth thee whilst thou guardest thy calves hail pepi ar guardeth thee against the coups hail pepi know that thou shalt receive for thine holy oblation which thou offerest each day thousands of cakes thousands of vessels of ale thousands of oxen thousands of feathered fowl thousands of sweet things and thousands of linen garments hail pepi thou hast thy water thou hast thine abundance thou hast thy purifying gums which are brought to thee before thy brother nekek o osiris pepi thou risest as king of the south and of the north by reason of thy power over the gods and their cause that is doubles and behold do thou o nut spread thyself over thy son osiris pepi and protect him and deliver him from set come o nut and protect thy son for thou must protect this mighty one o nut cast thyself over thy son osiris pepi and protect him o great wife of this mighty one who is among thy children the god seb hath come unto thee o nut and thou didst possess strength and thou didst gain power in the womb of thy mother tefnut when as yet thou wert not born o do thou unite life and strength unto pepi so that he may not die thou didst make strong thy heart and didst spring forth from the womb of thy mother in thy name of nut o thou daughter who didst gain the mastery over thy mother and didst make herself to rise as queen of the north protect thou this pepi who is within thy womb that he may not die for me o nut to whom thou hast given birth proclaim the name of osiris pepi through horus beloved of the two lands pepi the king of the north and of the south pepi the lord of the diadems of the vulture and of the uraeus beloved from the womb pepi the triple hawk of gold pepi the flesh and bone of seb by whom he is beloved pepi the friend of all the gods pepi the giver of all life and stability and power and health and joy of heart like the sun living for ever thy water is thine thy flood is thine that is to say the emanations which come forth from the god the excretions which come forth from osiris thy hands are washed thine ears are opened and this form sekum doeth what hath to be done for his son thou art washed and thy ka double is washed and thy ka hath sat down and he eateth bread with thee for ever and ever inasmuch as thou hast gone and hast taken thy seat o osiris thy mouth is open before thee acclamations are upon thy hand thy nostrils are gratified with the odour of the uraeus thy legs walk to keep the feast thy teeth are and thy fingers reckon up the lakes over which thou passest like the great bull of anu and of the gnome of uachit to go to the fields of ra which he loveth rise up then o pepi and die not hail pepi arise stand up thou art pure thy ka is pure thy soul is pure thy sekum is pure thy mother cometh to thee thy mother nut the mighty creatress cometh to thee and she maketh thee pure o pepi she fashioneth thee o pepi and thou hast motion o pepi and thou art pure thy ka is pure thy sekum is pure among the khus and thy soul is pure among the gods o pepi hail pepi thy bones have been presented unto thee thou hast received thy head before seb and he hath destroyed the evil which belongeth to thee o pepi before ten thou hast opened the gates of heaven thou hast unbolted the doors of kabu which repulse the beings of understanding reket and ment acclaimeth thee mankind and memet greeteth thee and the stars which never fail stand up before thee thy winds are incense and thy north wind is a flame for thou art he who hath become mighty in the gnome teni and thou art the star that existeth by thyself and which appeareth in the cast eastern half of heaven which never groweth old and to which horus of the city of tot hath given his body hail thou established one thou most exalted one among the stars which never fail thou shalt never perish the heavens speak and the earth quaketh by reason of thy book o osiris when thou makest thine appearance hail ye cows of amutenen who have suckled amutenen go ye round about behind him and weep before him and acclaim him by word and deed for pepi who goeth forth goeth into heaven among his brethren the gods pepi is pure pepi hath taken his staff he hath provided himself with his throne and he hath taken his seat in the boat of the great and little companies of the gods ra transporteth pepi to the west and he establisheth the throne of pepi above the lords of Kaz, and he writeth down pepi at the head of the living the pe ka which dwelleth in keb 
is opened unto this pepi and the iron which formeth the ceiling of the sky is opened unto this pepi and he passeth through onwards his panther skin is upon him and his sceptre and flail are in his hand and pepi is sound with his flesh he is happy with his name he liveth with his ka and he ra destroyeth the evil which is upon both sides of pepi he driveth away the evil which followeth him even as Ma'a-Utu, who dwelleth in sechem driveth away the evil which is upon both sides of him and doeth away with the evil which followeth him let ra be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he may go forth therein before herukuti harmachus let herukuti be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he may go forth before ra let pepi be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he himself may go forth before ra and before herokuti o enter into the verdant stream of the lake of ka o fill with water the fields of aru and let pepi set sail for the eastern half of heaven towards that place where the gods are brought forth wherein pepi himself may be borne along with them as herokuti for pepi is triumphant and pepi acclaimeth and the ka of pepi acclaimeth the gods and they invoke pepi and they bring to him these four gods who make their ways over the tresses of horus and who stand with their sceptres in the eastern half of heaven and they declare to ra the excellent name of pepi and they exalt the excellent name of pepi before neheb kau for pepi is triumphant and pepi acclaimeth and his ka acclaimeth the gods the sister of pepi is septet sothis and the birth of pepi is the morning star and it is he who is under the body of heaven before ra pepi is triumphant and he acclaimeth and his ka acclaimeth the gods pepi knoweth his mother and he is not unmindful of her the white crown who begetteth and who dwelleth in the city of nekeb she is the lady of the great house the lady of the land of union the lady of the hidden land the lady of the field of the boat the lady of the lake which bringeth offerings she decreeth the red crown she is the lady of the domains of the city of tep o mother of this pepi cry out and present the breast to him and suckle him o thou her son pepi o father the breast hath been presented unto thee and it hath suckled thee o father thou livest o father thou art little o father thou comest forth into heaven like the hawks having feathers like unto those of geese o father it is the god hetch hetch who bringeth these things to pepi o sema ur thou bull of offerings remove thy horn and let this pepi pass by inasmuch as pepi passeth through thee and inasmuch as he goeth to heaven in full life and power this pepi seeth his father this pepi seeth ra this pepi is indeed god and the envoy or angel of god pepi cometh and he is pure in seket aru this pepi goeth down to the field of kenset and the followers of horus purify him they guard carefully this pepi and they recite for him the chapter of mao and they also recite for him the chapter of coming forth in life and in power this pepi cometh forth to heaven in life and in power in the boat and in the boat of ra he, pil pil he piloteth for ra the gods thereof and they rejoice in this pepi as they rejoice when ra goeth forth from the eastern part of the sky in peace in peace this pepi cometh forth to the eastern part of heaven where the gods are born and where he himself is born as heru kuti pepi is triumphant Ma -ziru and the ka of pepi is triumphant pepi maketh adoration and the ka of pepi maketh adoration the sister of this pepi is septet he is born as the morning star he goeth with you and he journeyeth with you in second aru and he draweth nigh as do you unto the field of turquoise he eateth of that of which ye eat he liveth upon that upon which ye live he putteth on apparel like unto the apparel which ye put on he anointeth himself with the sweet-smelling substances with which ye anoint yourselves he receiveth his water with you at the lake of mena of this pepi and he drinketh it out of the vessels of the khus ra hath purified heaven and horus hath purified the earth and every god who is with them purifieth this pepi for pepi adoreth the god o thou path of pepi which leadeth to the great halls testify ye concerning pepi before these two great gods for pepi is unka the son of ra who beareth the heavens upon his shoulders and who guideth the earth hail ye gods let pepi take his seat among you hail ye stars bear ye pepi upon your shoulders as ye bear ra follow ye this pepi as ye follow apuat and love ye him as ye love this pepi hath come to thee o lord of heaven this pepi hath come to thee o cyrus he strengtheneth thy face and he arrayeth thee in the garment of a god he hath purified thee in ayata he hath 
destroyed the members of thine enemies he hath hacked them in pieces and he hath changed himself into the being who is among those who have been hacked in pieces for horus the son of whom thou hast given birth hath not placed this pepi among the dead but among the divine gods their water is the water of this pepi their bread is the bread of this pepi their purifications are the purifications of this pepi and that which horus hath done for osiris he hath also done for this pepi heaven uttereth words the earth quaketh seb advanceth the two divine gnomes part asunder the ceremony of ploughing the earth is ended and the offering is set before pepi the living one the established one he goeth forth from heaven and goeth about over the iron sky in life and stability he saileth over it and overthroweth in his course the fortifications of shu he goeth forth to heaven upon his wings like a mighty duck which hath broken its bonds and anubis fleeteth the procession which horus made in abydos when osiris was interred he goeth forth into heaven among the stars which never perish or diminish his sister is septet and his guide the morning star leadeth him to seket hetep and he seateth himself there upon his iron throne which hath lions heads and feet in the form of the hoofs of the bull semar ur he standeth up there in his vacant place between the two great gods and his sceptre which is in the form of a papyrus he hath with him he stretcheth out his hand over the hemen met beings and the gods come to him bending their backs in homage the two great gods watch one on each side of him and they find pepe like the great and little companies of the gods acting as the judge of words being the prince over every prince they bow down before pepe and they make offerings unto him as unto the great and little companies of the gods hail o cyrus it is not pepe who entreateth to see thee in the form in which thou art pepe hath gone down into the great green sea and thou o great green sea hast dropped thy head and bent thy back and the children of nut who come down upon thee putting their garlands upon their heads and round their necks offer the flowers which are the crowns of the pools of seket hetep to isis the great lady and the goddess who beareth the pike in akhet bringeth them and spreadeth them out as a gift before her son horus whom she suckleth at the breast so that he may traverse the earth in his two white sandals and may go to his father osiris pepi hath opened out his way among the birds he hath travelled with the lords of food he hath gone to the great lake which is in seket hetep on which the great gods alight and these great and imperishable beings give to him the tree of life whereupon they themselves whereon they themselves do live that he also may eat and live thereon take then this pepi with thee to this great country which hath become subject unto thee by the will of the gods wherein thou eatest during the night even until dawn and where thou becomest master of divine food in such wise that pepi may eat of that of which thou eatest that he may drink of that of which thou drinkest the following prayer which is found in shortened forms in graeco roman and roman periods occurs in the text of pepi the second hail great company of the gods who are in anu grant that pepi nefer ka ra may flourish and grant that his pyramid his everlasting building may flourish even as the name of temu the governor of the great company of the gods flourisheth if the name of shu the lord of the upper shrine in anu flourisheth pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid his everlasting building shall flourish if the name of tefnut the lady of the lower shrine in anu is established the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall be established and his pyramid shall be established for ever if the name of seb the soul of the earth flourisheth the name of pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and his everlasting building shall flourish if the name of nut flourisheth in het shent in anu the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of osiris flourisheth the nome teni the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of osiris governor of amenti flourisheth the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of set in nupt ambus flourisheth the name of pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of horus of Bahutet 
flourisheth the name of pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of ra flourisheth in the horizon the name of this pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of kent merti in sekum is established the name of this pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of uatchit who dwelleth in tep flourisheth the name of this pepi nefir ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever end of introduction the elysian fields introduction the magic of the book of the dead of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the magic of the book of the dead the egyptians from the earliest to the latest period of their history were addicted to the use of formulae which were thought to be able to effect results usually beyond the power of man and they accompanied such formulae with the performance of certain ceremonies the formulae consisted of the repetition of the names of gods and supernatural beings benevolent or hostile to man as the case might be and of entreaties or curses the ceremonies were of various kinds and the object of the present chapter is to describe briefly those which relate to the various sections of the book of the dead the egyptian believed that every word spoken under certain circumstances must be followed by some effect good or bad a prayer uttered by a properly qualified person or by a man ceremonially pure in the proper place and in the proper manner must necessarily be answered favourably and similarly the curses which were pronounced upon a man or beast or thing in the name of a hostile supernatural being were bound to result in harm to the object cursed it seems that this idea had its origin in the belief that the world and all that therein is came into being immediately after thoth had interpreted in words the will of the deity in respect of the creation of the world and that creation was the result of the god's command in very early times the egyptian called in the professional religious man to utter words of good omen over the dead body of his relative or friend and later the same words written upon some substance and buried with him were believed to be effectual in procuring for him the good things of the life beyond the grave in the text on the pyramid of unas is a reference to something written which the deceased was supposed to possess in the following words the bone and flesh which have no writing are wretched but behold the writing of unas is under the great seal and behold it is not under the little seal and in the text on the pyramid of pepi the first we find the words the ureus of this pepi is upon his head there is a writing on each side of him and he hath words of magical power at his two feet thus equipped the king enters heaven in the reign of cheops however we are told that his second son harutataf brought to the court a man who possessed magical powers and who was able to join the head to a decapitated body and to make the complete body live again as before when cheops ordered the head to be struck off from a prisoner that the sage might fasten it on again the sage excused himself from performing this difficult task but when a goose was brought and its head was cut off and laid on one side of the room and the body on the other he spake certain magical words whereupon the goose stood up and began to waddle and the head began to move towards it when the head had joined itself again to the body the bird stood up and cackled thus in that remote period a man claimed to be able to restore life to decapitated creatures by means of words of magical power and it seems that the belief in the efficacy of the words of thoth was already well established in the late period the mourner consoled himself by asserting that the book of the dead prepared for his dead relative or friend had been written by the fingers of the god thoth himself 
a common way to effect certain results good or evil was to employ figures made of various substances chiefly wax or amulets made of precious stones and metals in various forms both figures and amulets were inscribed with words which gave them the power to carry out the work assigned to them by those who caused them to be made it is well known that the egyptians believed that the qualities and much else including the ka of a living original could be transferred to an image thereof by means of the repetition over it of certain formulae and a good or evil act done to a statue or figure resulted in good or evil to the person whom it represented in the west car papyrus we are also told that the wife of a high egyptian official called abba anar fell in love with one of the king's followers and that she sent to him and told him of her desire subsequently the pair met in the woman's garden and they passed the day in drinking and in pleasure on the morrow the husband was told of his wife's conduct and he determined to punish both with death having sent for his ebony box bound with fine metal he made a waxen crocodile a few inches long and having recited magical formulae over it he gave it to his chief servant and told him to throw it into the water when he saw his wife's paramour going to bathe in the evening when the guilty pair had passed another day together and the young man went down to the river in the evening the chief servant cast the waxen crocodile into the water and as it was falling it turned into a huge living crocodile about twelve feet long which swallowed the young man seven days later abba anir and the king nebka went to the water where the crocodile was and abba aner ordered it to give up the young man and it came out of the water and straightway brought up the young man when the king had made some remark abba aner picked up the crocodile which at once turned into the small waxen crocodile that it was originally and when he again ordered it to devour the young man it once more became a living reptile and seizing the young man made its way to the water and disappeared with him the faithless wife was burnt the principal actors in this story are said to have flourished during the rule of the third dynasty of egypt nearly four thousand years before christ and it is a noteworthy fact that the narrative mentions the ebony and metal box and the making of a waxen crocodile in a way which seems to show that their owner was in the habit of using the box and the wax frequently about the time of the eighteenth dynasty we learn from a papyrus that a man was prosecuted in egypt for having made figures of men and women in wax by which he caused sundry and divers pains and sicknesses to the living beings whom they represented and according to pseudo callisthenes nectanibus wrought magic by means of a bowl of water some waxen figures and an ebony rod the waxen figures were made in the forms of the soldiers of the enemy who were coming against him by sea or by land and were placed upon the water in the basin by him nectanibus then arrayed himself in suitable apparel and having taken the rod in his hand began to recite certain formulae and the names of divine powers known unto him whereupon the waxen figures became animated and straightway sank to the bottom of the bowl at the same moment the hosts of the enemy were destroyed if the foe was coming by sea he placed the waxen soldiers in waxen ships and at the sound of the words of power both ships and men sank into the waves as the waxen models sank to the bottom of the sea the same informant tells us that when nectanibus wished olympias the mother of alexander the great to believe that the god ammon had visited her during the night he went forth from her presence into the plain and gathered a number of herbs which had the power of causing dreams and pressed out the juice from them 
he then fashioned a female figure in the form of olympias and inscribed the queen's name upon it and having made the model of a bed he laid the figure thereon nectanebus next lit a lamp and reciting the words of power which would compel the demons to send olympias a dream he poured out the juice of the herbs over the waxen figure and at the moment of the performance of these acts olympias dreamed that she was in the arms of the god ammon a tradition also exists to the effect that aristotle gave to alexander the great a number of waxen figures nailed down in a box which was fastened by a chain and which he ordered him never to let go out of his hand or at least out of that of one of his confidential servants the box was to go wherever alexander went and aristotle taught him to recite certain formulae over it whenever he took it up or put it down the figures in the box were intended to represent the various kinds of armed forces that alexander was likely to find opposed to him some of the models held in their hands leaden swords which were curved backwards and some had spears in their hands pointed head downwards and some had bows with cut strings all these were laid face downwards in the box when alexander was engaged in war with any nation armed with swords or spears or bows if he recited the formulae which aristotle had taught him the swords of the foe would become as lead and bend backwards the spears would become impotent in the hands of those who held them and their heads would turn to the ground and the strings of the bows would snap returning to purely egyptian sources for information concerning the use of wax figures we come to an important work consisting of several chapters which were to be recited to keep away storm clouds and thunder from the sky one chapter reads fire upon thee o apep thou enemy of ra the eye of horus prevaileth over the accursed soul and shade of apep the flame of the eye of horus gnaweth into that enemy of ra the flame of the eye of horus eateth into all the enemies of pa in death and in life the rubric belonging to the chapters orders that it shall be recited over apep written in green ink upon a piece of new papyrus and over a wax figure of apep on which his name is inscribed in green ink this figure shall then be put in the fire that the enemy of ra may be devoured when apep is put in the fire speak ye words of power and say taste thou death to thee apep get thee back retreat thou enemy of ra fall down wriggle away depart retreat i have driven thee back i have hacked thee in pieces back thou fiend an end to thee therefore have i cast fire at thee therefore have i caused thee to be destroyed therefore have i judged and condemned thee to an evil doom an end to thee an end to thee taste thou an end to thee mayest thou never rise up again an end an end to thee an end to thee taste thou and come to an end i have destroyed the enemy of ra this figure of apep shall be burnt in a grass fire and when burnt its ashes are to be mixed with excrement and thrown into a fire afterwards when thou hast thrown apep into the fire at daybreak of the festival of the six spit upon him and defile him with thy left foot thus shall be repulsed the roarings of the backward of face thou shalt do the like of this at daybreak on the festival of the fifteenth day for by means of it apep shall be repulsed and slain before the sectet boat thou shalt do the like of this when tempests rage in the eastern parts of the sky when ra sets in the land of life to prevent the arrival of red threatening clouds in the eastern quarter of the sky thou shalt do the like of this many times as a preventive against the shower the sun's disk shall shine and apep shall be overthrown in very truth elsewhere we are told that if it be wished to destroy the fiends which accompany apep we must 
write the names of their fathers and mothers and offspring with green paint upon new papyrus and also inscribe their names upon wax figures of them which shall be tied round with dark hair these figures shall be spit upon and shall be spurned with the left foot and stabbed with a stone knife the most important mention of figures in the book of the dead occurs in the sixth chapter which properly speaking forms one of the texts that accompany the scenes of the funeral chamber as exhibited in chapter one hundred and fifty one when the egyptian in very early days conceived the existence of the elysian fields it occurred to him that the agricultural labours which would have to be carried out there might entail upon himself toil and fatigue to avoid this a short chapter five was drawn up the recital of which was believed to free the deceased from doing any work in the underworld but it was felt that the work must be done by some person or thing and eventually it became the custom to bury a figure or figures of the deceased with him in his tomb so that it or they might perform whatever work fell to his share it is probable that in semi-savage times the wealthy egyptian's burial was accompanied by the slaughter of several slaves who were supposed to follow him to the next world and to minister to his wants there the figures which were buried with the dead in the later times seem to have taken the place of the slaughtered slaves to these figures the egyptian gave the name ush ab tiu a word which is commonly rendered by respondents or answerers and they are often described in modern times as the working figures of hades they are made of stone of various kinds wood faience etc i know of none earlier than the eleventh dynasty they are inscribed with a text in which the deceased says if i be called if i be adjudged to do any work whatsoever of the labours which are to be done in the underworld by a man in his turn let the judgment fall upon thee instead of upon me always in the matter of sowing the fields of filling the water-courses with water and of bringing the sands of the east to the west to this the shabti figure makes reply verily i am here and will come whithersoever thou biddest me several of the chapters of the book of the dead are followed by rubrics which give directions for the performance of certain magical ceremonies and among them may be specially mentioned the following chapter thirteen this chapter was to be recited over two rings made of ankh hum flowers one was to be laid on the right ear of the deceased and the other was to be wrapped up in a piece of bysus whereon the name of the deceased was inscribed chapter nineteen this chapter was to be recited over the divine chaplet which was laid upon the face of the deceased while incense was burnt on his behalf chapter one hundred this chapter was to be recited over a picture of the boat of the sun painted with a special ink upon a piece of new papyrus which was to be laid on the breast of the deceased who would then have power to embark in the boat of ra and to journey with the god chapter one hundred and twenty five the judgment scene was to be painted upon a tile made of earth upon which neither the pig nor any other animal had trodden and if the text of the chapter was also written upon it the deceased and his children will flourish for ever his name would never be forgotten and his place would henceforth be with the followers of osiris chapter one hundred and thirty this chapter was to be recited over a picture of the god ra wherein a figure of the deceased sitting in the bows was drawn this done the soul of the deceased would live for ever chapter one hundred and thirty three this chapter was to be recited over a faience model of the boat of ra four cubits in length whereon the figures of the divine chiefs were painted painted figures of ra and of the ku of the deceased were to be placed in the boat 
a model of the starry heavens was also to be made and upon it the model of the boat of ra was to be moved about in imitation of the motion of the boat of the god in heaven this ceremony would cause the deceased to be received by the gods in heaven as one of themselves chapter one hundred and thirty four this chapter was to be recited over figures of a hawk ra tem shu tif nut seb nut osiris isis suti and nephthys painted on a plaque which was to be placed in a model of the boat of ra wherein the deceased was seated this ceremony would cause the deceased to travel with ra in the sky chapter one hundred and thirty six a this chapter was to be recited over a figure of the deceased seated in the boat of ra chapter one hundred and thirty seven a this chapter was to be recited over four fires fed by a special kind of cloth anointed with unguent which were to be placed in the hands of four men who had the names of the pillars of horus written upon their shoulders four clay troughs whereon incense had been sprinkled were to be filled with the milk of a white cow and the milk was to be employed in extinguishing the four fires if this chapter were recited daily for the deceased he would become like unto osiris in every respect the rubric supplies a series of texts which were to be recited one over a tet of crystal set in a plinth which was to be placed in the west wall of the tomb two over a figure of anubis set in a plinth which was to be placed in the east wall three over a brick smeared with pitch which was set on fire and then placed in the south wall and four over a brick inscribed with the figure of a palm tree which was set in the north wall chapter one hundred and forty this chapter was to be recited over an utchat or figure of the eye of horus made either of lapis lazuli or mock stone and over another made of jasper during the recital of the chapter four altars were to be lighted for ra tem and four for the utchat and four for the gods who were mentioned therein chapter one hundred and forty four the seven sections of this chapter were to be recited over a drawing of the seven arits at each of which three gods were seated by these means the deceased was prevented from being turned back at the door of any one of the seven mansions of osiris chapter one hundred and sixty two this chapter was to be recited over the figure of a cow made of fine gold which was to be placed at the neck of the deceased during the performance of this ceremony the priest is ordered to say o amen o amen who art in heaven turn thy face upon the dead body of thy son and make him sound and strong in the underworld chapter one hundred and sixty three this chapter was to be recited over a serpent having legs and wearing a disc and two horns and over two utchats having both eyes and wings chapter one hundred and sixty four this chapter was to be recited over a three-headed ithyphallic figure of mut painted upon a piece of linen and over the figures of two dwarfs painted one on each side of the goddess chapter one hundred and sixty five this chapter was to be recited over the figure of the god of the lifted hand who had a body in the form of that of a beetle besides these a number of chapters have rubrics varying in length from two to twenty lines which declare that if the deceased be acquainted with their contents or if they be inscribed upon his coffin they will enable him to attain great happiness and freedom in the world beyond the grave seven other chapters consist of texts which were written upon the amulets that were usually laid upon the mummy namely numbers thirty b eighty nine one hundred and fifty five one hundred and fifty six one hundred and fifty seven one hundred and fifty eight and one hundred and fifty nine chapter thirty b is found inscribed upon thousands of large green basalt scarabs which were usually set in a banded frame of gold and laid inside or upon the breast just over the heart it is also found inscribed upon green basalt amulets made in the form of the heart 
the object of this amulet was to preserve the heart of the deceased and to protect it from the attacks of those who were thought to steal away the hearts of the dead its use is as old as the fourth dynasty in which period the text was not cut but painted upon it chapter eighty nine which was written to ensure the union of the soul with the body in the underworld was recited over the human-headed hawk made of gold and inlaid with precious stones which was laid upon the neck of the mummy examples of this amulet have been found with a few words of the chapter inscribed upon them chapter one hundred and fifty five is found inscribed upon tets made of gold and precious stones which have been found attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet represents the tree trunk with four branches pointing to the four cardinal points which contain the dead body of osiris and it bestowed upon its possessor stability and lasting preservation chapter one hundred and fifty six is found inscribed upon several carnelian buckles which have been found attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet gave to the deceased the powers which were enshrined in the blood and power and enchantments of the goddess isis chapter one hundred and fifty seven is found inscribed upon gold vultures which have been found attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet gave the deceased the protection of the goddess isis such as she exercised on behalf of her own son horus chapter one hundred and fifty eight was inscribed upon the collar of gold which was placed on the neck of the mummy this amulet gave the deceased freedom from the bandages with which he was swathed chapter one hundred and fifty nine is found inscribed upon several mother of emerald sceptres which were attached to the neck of the mummy this amulet gave protection or strength to the deceased chapter one hundred and sixty two is found inscribed upon circular pieces of papyri laid down upon cartonnage backs commonly known as hypocephaly they were placed under the back of the head of the mummy and by this warmth similar to that which he possessed upon earth was imparted chapter one hundred and sixty six is found inscribed upon small pillows made of hematite and other substances as the ordinary pillow raised the head of the mummy from the bed of the coffin so this amulet raised the head of the deceased in the horizon and prevented it from being laid low finally figures of the gods in metal stone faience wood wax etc were attached to the mummy in order to place it under the special protection of the deities whom they represented the following are the amulets which are commonly found in egyptian tombs and their significations one thet buckle the protection of the blood power and incantation of isis two tet tree trunk stability firmness lastingness three mut mother the protection of the goddess isis who in the form of a vulture protected her son horus and bewailed her husband osiris for a sec collar freedom from the fetters of the bandages five uach sceptre green youth vigor to flourish and to renew youth six earth pillow the lifting up of the head and body seven ab heart the seat of life and source of good and evil thoughts the heart of green basalt was connected with chapter thirty b the heart of lapis lazuli with chapter twenty six the heart of mother of emerald with chapter twenty seven and the heart of carnelian with chapter twenty nine b eight ankh the object which this hieroglyphic represents is not known but it means life and symbolizes the life which the gods live nine ut chat eye of ra or horus good health safe sound protection two ut chats typify the two eyes of ra and the sun and moon ten nefer a musical instrument good luck happiness joy eleven psalm a tool union unity twelve kut 
the sun on the horizon the coming forth with the rising sun and the abode of the blessed dead with ra in the west thirteen hetch white crown southern or upper egypt fourteen tesher red crown northern or lower egypt fifteen shen the sun's orbit eternity sixteen user sceptre power seventeen ren a rope which enclosed the name of kings and royal persons this sign is commonly known as cartouche name the preservation of the name was considered to be of the highest importance for the blotting out of a man's name brought with it eternal death eighteen menat an instrument joy pleasure sexual pleasure happiness nineteen naha an angle protection twenty hefnu frog a new life resurrection twenty one sec hec level equilibrium straightness twenty two ket staircase steps the steps whereon ra rested in kemenu and where on osiris stands in the underworld twenty three maket ladder the ladder by which the deceased ascended into heaven twenty four tichi bowi two fingers the fingers which the god extended to the deceased to enable him to enter heaven twenty five maat feather what is straight right truth law twenty six kepur beetle the type of the self-begotten god the creator of the gods and of heaven and earth and all that therein is and the symbol of the resurrection finally mention must be made here of the great importance attached by the egyptians to the knowledge of the names of gods supernatural beings etc and it seems that the deceased who was ignorant of them must have fared badly in the underworld thus in chapter one b it is said that the deceased knoweth osiris and his names in chapter ninety nine the deceased is obliged to tell the names of every portion of the boat wherein he wishes to cross the great river in the underworld in chapter one hundred and twenty five anubis makes him declare the names of the two leaves of the door of the hall of osiris before he will let him in and even the bolts and bolt sockets and lintels and planks will not allow him to enter until the deceased has satisfied them that he knows their names entrance into the seven arits or mansions could not be obtained without a knowledge of the names of the doorkeeper watcher and herald who belonged to each and similarly the pylons of the domains of osiris could not be passed through by the deceased without a declaration by him of the name of each the idea underlying all such statements is that the man who knows the name of a god could invoke and obtain help from him by calling upon him and that the hostility of a fiend could be successfully opposed by the repetition of his name the knowledge of the names of fiends and demons constituted the chief power of the magicians of olden times and the amulets of the gnostics which were inscribed with numbers of names of supernatural powers are the practical expression of the belief in the efficacy of the knowledge of names which existed in egypt from time immemorial End of introduction the magic of the book of the dead introduction the object and contents of the book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the object and contents of the book of the dead though the chapters of the book of the dead represent beliefs belonging to various periods of the long life of the egyptian nation and opinions held by several schools of thought in egypt the object of them all was to benefit the deceased they were intended to give him the power to have and to enjoy life everlasting to give him everything which he required in the life beyond the grave to ensure his victory over his foes 
to procure for him the power of going whithersoever he pleased and when and how he pleased to preserve the mummy intact and finally to enable his soul to enter into the bark of ra or into whatever abode of the blessed had been conceived of by him a perusal of the translations of the chapters will show the reader what their contents are but it will not be out of place here to group certain chapters which have a common object for the various beliefs which they represent then become more clear a certain number of the chapters of the book of the dead are hymns which are addressed either to ra or to osiris in the present work these are represented by the hymns from the papyri of ani kenna hu nefer and necht which i have called hymns introductory and to these we should add chapters one hundred and eighty two and one hundred and eighty three which are really hymns to osiris by thoth another collection of fine hymns is found in chapter fifteen where we have hymns to ra and osiris and a litany to osiris the papyrus of ani from which these are translated gives the oldest and most complete form of the chapter they are most important for they enable us to understand what attributes were ascribed to ra and it seems as if many of them were in later times transferred to osiris who was originally nothing but a god of the dead with these hymns should be mentioned the texts which accompany the judgment scene but these have already been described in the chapter on that subject given above and they are fully translated the judgment scene also leads us to the consideration of the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter which is certainly one of the most important and interesting in the whole book it consists of three parts introduction negative confession and concluding text introduction was said by the deceased at the entrance to the hall of dabba maati the negative confession was recited by him before the forty-two gods who sat in judgment upon him in this hall and the concluding text was uttered by him when he had passed the ordeal of judgment and was beginning his new life it is probable that these three texts were originally merely versions each of the other but in the eighteenth dynasty they are all copied together into papyri the deceased first asserted that he had not committed certain sins he next addressed forty-two gods by their names and declared before each that he had not committed the special sin which it was the duty of the god to punish and lastly he makes a third confession the first part of which is practically in the same words as a portion of the introduction the introduction provided the passwords which enabled him to enter the hall and the concluding text provided those which enabled him to go forth from it it is impossible to say when or how this beautiful chapter with its lofty conceptions of morality grew but although the form in which these are set forth is not older than the eighteenth dynasty the ideas themselves belong to a period which is as old as the rule of the kings of the third dynasty from the negative confession we see that the pious egyptian abhorred fraud theft deceit robbery with violence iniquity of every kind adultery unchastity and sins of wantonness manslaughter murder incitement to murder and that he delighted in showing he had wronged none in any way he neither purloined the things which belonged to his god nor did he slay the sacred animals he thought not lightly of the god of his city and he never cursed him he honoured his king and he neither wasted his neighbour's ploughed lands nor defiled his running stream he spake not haughtily he behaved not insolently he multiplied not his speech overmuch he abused no man he attacked no man he swore not at all he stirred not up strife he terrified no man he was not a man of wrath he spake evil of none and he never pried into matters to make mischief he judged not hastily he defrauded not his neighbour in the market he shut not his ears to the words of right and truth he sought not honours he never gave way to anger except for a proper cause and he sought not to enrich himself at the expense of his neighbours 
it is difficult to give the exact shades of meaning of many of the words in this confession but the general sense is thoroughly well made out the egyptian code of morals as may be seen from the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter was the grandest and most comprehensive of those now known to have existed among the nations of antiquity the one hundred and tenth chapter which describes the employments and enjoyments of the deceased in the sekhet heptep and sekhet aru or elysian fields contains ideas of the greatest antiquity which date probably from the time when the system of village communities was in vogue in egypt the deceased ploughs sows and reaps and lives exactly the same kind of life as a farmer would live in the fertile lands of the delta and it would seem that he enjoys all the pleasures which a human being enjoys upon earth in the fifth chapter of the book of the dead the deceased found a text which would free him from certain agricultural labours which had to be done in the elysian fields but inasmuch as the work of watering and top dressing the fields and sowing the crops had to be done by some one figures made in the form of the deceased and inscribed with his name were buried with the dead to toil for him such figures have often in their hands models of the basket in which the field labourer carried earth and the hoe with which he filled it and the text of the sixth chapter which was also inscribed upon them provided the deceased with substitutes to toil for him in the farms of the gods the reader will seek and seek in vain for many of the attributes of the prayers of christian nations and it is a noticeable fact that the egyptian had no conception of repentance at the judgment which took place in the hall of osiris he based his claim for admission into the kingdom of that god upon the fact that he had not committed certain sins and that he had feared god and honoured the king and had given bread to the hungry drink to the thirsty clothes to the naked and a boat to him that had suffered shipwreck on the nile his belief in the efficacy of works was great and when he had any doubt about their power to deliver him finally from the hosts of darkness he protected himself by means of amulets inscribed or plain and figures of gods painted upon his coffin and papyrus or cut in wood or on stones which possessed magical powers the chapters which refer to such amulets are numbers thirteen nineteen thirty b eighty nine one hundred one hundred and twenty five one hundred and thirty one hundred and thirty three one hundred and thirty four one hundred and thirty six a one hundred and thirty seven a one hundred and forty one hundred and forty four one hundred and fifty six one hundred and fifty seven one hundred and fifty eight one hundred and fifty nine one hundred sixty two one hundred and sixty three one hundred and sixty four one hundred and sixty five and one hundred and sixty six one of the most interesting chapters in the whole book is the seventeenth which contains a series of statements concerning the origin of the gods and the things of the next world to many of these statements more than one explanation of their meaning is appended and as these occur in copies of the chapter which are found inscribed upon coffins of the eleventh dynasty it is clear that already at that early date several opinions on these matters existed the views expressed in the chapter appear to be those of an ancient college of priests at heliopolis which became gradually adopted throughout egypt the vignettes which accompany the chapter in the best illuminated papyri are most elaborate and they show by their attention to detail that it formed one of the most important of the texts of this class which were copied for general use the sixty-fourth chapter was very highly esteemed and it was believed to be one of the oldest parts of the book of the dead already in the eleventh dynasty it existed in two versions one of which was thought to have been composed or edited in the first dynasty and the other in the fourth dynasty the longer version is entitled simply the chapter of coming forth by day in the underworld but the shorter is described as the chapter of knowing the chapters of coming forth by day in a single chapter whether we are to understand by the latter title that the chapter contained the essence of all the chapters of the book of the dead and that the deceased who was provided with it was as well protected as if he had copies of them all is not quite clear but it seems probable 
it will be noticed that several chapters are called chapters of coming forth by day and among them may be specially noticed chapters two and three which provide that the deceased may come forth in the underworld and live after he hath died even as doth ra day by day chapter sixty five which provides that the khu of the deceased shall live and shall inflict blows upon his enemy chapter sixty six which gives the deceased power to alight upon the forehead of ra chapter sixty eight which gives him mastery over everything which is in the underworld and enables him to journey about among the living chapters sixty nine seventy and seventy one wherein he identifies himself with osiris sa orion anubis horus and tem and declares his power over the winds of heaven chapter seventy two which enables him to come forth by day in all the forms which he pleaseth to take and to enter into an abode in the elysian fields where he shall be amply provided with wheat and barley and chapter one hundred and eighty which enables him to go about in the underworld with freedom of movement and to perform all the transformations of a living soul an important group of chapters referring to the transformations which a man may undergo if he pleases in the underworld is introduced by chapter seventy six wherein the deceased declares that he has been led unto the house of the king by the mantis or so-called praying insect these chapters enable him to transform himself into a hawk of gold chapter seventy seven into a divine hawk chapter seventy eight into the governor of the divine sovereign princes chapter seventy nine into the god who giveth light in the darkness chapter eighty into a lotus chapter eighty one a and chapter eighty one b into the god ptah and into a living being in anu chapter eighty two into a benu phoenix chapter eighty three into a heron chapter eighty four into a living soul chapter eighty five into a swallow chapter eighty six into the serpent sata chapter eighty seven and into a crocodile chapter eighty eight a considerable number of chapters refer as we should naturally expect to the preservation of the body of the deceased in the tomb and several were expressly written to give him power to resist the attacks of enemies and to obtain meat and drink and the power of motion in the underworld thus chapter one which is proved by its title and vignette to refer to the ceremonies which took place on the day of the funeral provides for the burial of the body in the proper way so that the deceased may go in after coming forth and chapters eight nine eleven twelve thirteen forty eight sixty seven one hundred and seven one hundred and eighteen one hundred and nineteen one hundred and twenty two one hundred and sixty one and one hundred and eighty enable him to make his way in the underworld without let or hindrance and to overcome his enemies the deceased wished to protect himself by means of magical formulae chapter twenty four provides these formulae for him and chapter thirty two gives him the power to keep hold of them chapters twenty one and twenty two give the deceased a mouth and chapter twenty three provides him with the power of opening it chapter twenty five gave him the faculty of remembering his name seven chapters twenty six through thirty b gave him a heart and provided him with prayers and formulae which prevented those who stole hearts from snatching it away from him and from driving it away from him when it was weighed in the judgment hall of osiris the crocodile which came to steal away the words of power and protection which the deceased had with him was repulsed by the words of chapter thirty one chapters thirty three thirty four thirty five thirty six thirty seven and thirty nine prevented him from being stung or bitten by snakes and serpents and did away with the power of the beetle apes shate to gnaw his body to pieces chapters thirty eight a and thirty eight b enabled him to escape from the deadly cobra and chapter forty delivered him from the power of the serpent who though he is here acting as the friend of horus by devouring the ass which typifies the fiend set 
is nevertheless to be feared in the underworld and the cities thereof punishment was inflicted on the dead and to provide the favorite of osiris with power to escape from stripes and wounds and decapitation at the deadly block chapters forty one forty two forty three and fifty were composed the deceased wished for a seat in the celestial anu heliopolis and this was given him by chapter seventy five and chapter forty seven prevented his throne and his habitation from being removed by any hostile being he sighed to have power over running water and to snuff the sweet breath of the north wind and these comforts were secured for him by chapters fifty four fifty five fifty six fifty seven fifty eight fifty nine sixty sixty one and sixty two the large number of chapters written for this purpose will show how great was the anxiety of the egyptian in this matter as fire and boiling water existed in the underworld he hastened to protect himself from burns or scalds by the use of chapters sixty three a and sixty three b proper food was as necessary to the ka or double of the deceased as fresh air and water and to ensure it against the need to eat filth and to drink dirty water chapters fifty two fifty three one hundred and five one hundred and ten one hundred and forty eight and one hundred and eighty nine were composed the idea of the ka being obliged to wander about starving and in search of food was so abhorrent to the pious egyptian that every text which could in any wise help to secure sufficient meat and drink for it was gladly copied over and over again the object of chapters four seventy four one hundred and seventeen one hundred and nineteen was to enable the deceased to walk about at will and to roam through re stau or the passages of the tomb and underworld and when his way was stopped by apep chapter seven enabled him to pass over the back of the fiend the union of the soul with the body was provided for by chapter eighty nine as was the escape of the soul and the shade from the bonds of the tomb by chapters ninety one and ninety two though the deceased had no wish to go to the east in the underworld see chapter ninety three he nevertheless wished to visit the celestial abydos a successful journey to this city was secured by the use of chapter one hundred and thirty eight in spite of the best efforts of the embalmers bodies sometimes rotted and perished in their tombs such calamities were averted by chapters forty five and forty six especially by chapter one hundred and fifty four which is one of the most interesting in the whole book overthrow in the underworld was averted by the use of chapter fifty one the wrath of the god was appeased by chapter fourteen and the danger of dying a second time was done away with by chapters forty four one hundred and seventy five and one hundred and seventy six the love of ritual and ceremony induced the egyptians to take special care about the arrangement of the mummy and coffin and funeral furniture in the mummy chamber and to make certain that all was properly done in this matter chapter one hundred and fifty one which consists of a view of the chamber and a group of short but important texts was composed the type of this chamber was of course the tomb of osiris the hall of osiris wherein the god dwelt with his princes could only be reached after certain doors and mansions and domains which were guarded by porters in the form of monsters had been successfully passed through by the deceased to enable the deceased to go through the seven mansions and the twenty-one pylons and the fifteen domains chapters one hundred and forty four one hundred and forty seven one hundred and forty nine and one hundred and fifty were written these provided the deceased with the names of the beings who were in charge of the doors and supplied him with the speeches which it was necessary that he should make during his journey in the underworld the deceased came to a huge river which he was obliged to cross to enable him to embark in the mystical boat every portion of which possessed a name which he was bound to know and be able to repeat he provided himself with chapters ninety eight and ninety nine but this boat only served to take him across the river and he longed to be able to embark in the boat of ra and to sit in its bows and to sail about with the god for ever 
this delight however could only be secured for him by means of chapters one hundred one hundred and one one hundred and two one hundred and thirty four one hundred and thirty six a and one hundred and thirty six b and as a result copies of most of these chapters exist in nearly all large papyri the egyptian believed that he would encounter the foes who attacked osiris in the underworld and that the calamities which befell the god would come upon him also he who delivered osiris out of all his troubles was thoth the scribe of the gods and to him were addressed chapters eighteen and twenty which secured for the deceased the protection and triumph which this god had secured for his brother osiris the favour of thoth was so necessary that four chapters ninety four ninety five ninety six ninety seven were written to instruct the deceased to make an offering of a pallet and an ink jar to the god and how to become nigh unto him before the deceased could roam at will in the underworld it was necessary that he should know the deities of the chief cities of the four quarters of the land wherein he was chapters one hundred and seven and one hundred and eight enabled him to know the souls of amentet that is of the west chapter one hundred and nine enabled him to know the souls of the east chapter one hundred and twelve enabled him to know the souls of the city of pei in the north chapter one hundred and thirteen enabled him to know the souls of the city of neken in the south chapter one hundred and fifteen enabled him to know the souls of anu and chapters one hundred and fourteen and one hundred and sixteen enabled him to know the souls of the city of kemenu hermopolis in the underworld the deceased was threatened by the danger of the snarer or fowler and his net and chapters one hundred and fifty three a one hundred and fifty three b were written to enable him to escape from them two chapters one hundred and sixty nine and one hundred and seventy provided for the establishing of the funeral bed of the deceased two chapters one hundred and sixty eight a and one hundred and sixty eight b set out at length the libations which it was necessary for him to pour out chapter one hundred and twenty three gave him power to enter the great house chapters one hundred and twenty six one hundred and twenty seven one hundred and twenty eight one hundred and eighty five and one hundred and eighty six supplied him with the prayers which had to be said to the holy apes and to the gods who were the leaders and guides in the underworld and to osiris and hathor chapter one hundred and thirty two enabled him to go back to see his house chapter one hundred and fifty two gave him power to build a house upon earth chapter one hundred and seventy one provided him with the girdle of purity chapters one hundred and three one hundred and twenty four one hundred and thirty one and one hundred and eighty one gave him power to go in before the divine sovereign chiefs of osiris and to be nigh unto ra chapter one hundred four gave him a seat among the great gods and chapter one hundred and eighty four brought him nigh unto osiris chapter one hundred and thirty which made perfect the coup was ordered to be recited on the birthday of osiris chapter one hundred and thirty three made the coup perfect before the great company of the gods chapter one hundred and thirty five which was to be recited on the day of the new moon gave the deceased power to become like unto thoth chapter one hundred and forty which was to be recited on the last day of the sixth month of the egyptian year enabled him to appear in glory before all the gods when the utchat or eye of ra was full and chapter one hundred and forty seven conferred upon him the power which the utchat possessed and enabled him to identify himself with it chapters one hundred and forty one and one hundred and forty two provided the text which a man was directed to recite for his father or for his son during the festival of amentet they made the deceased to be perfect with ra and with the gods and chapter one hundred and seventy three contained the addresses which horus made to his father osiris and which were also assumed to be made to the deceased by horus chapter one hundred and seventy two is a remarkable and beautiful composition in nine sections the contents of which were first made known in detail by m naville 
in it the limbs of the deceased are described in highly poetical language and the comparisons at times resemble the descriptions of the limbs of the beloved one in the song of solomon four chapters one hundred and forty two one hundred and sixty three one hundred and sixty four and one hundred and sixty five have no equivalents in the recensions of the book of the dead older than the twenty sixth dynasty and as they contain foreign words and foreign ideas they are probably the work of non-egyptian authors each of them is followed by a long rubric which orders certain curious amulets to be made and the performance of ceremonies in chapters one hundred and seventy four and one hundred and seventy seven and one hundred and seventy eight we have extracts from the old heliopolitan recension of the book of the dead which was in use in the fifth and sixth dynasties and the comparison of the texts which thanks to m maspero we are now able to make is very instructive we can see how misunderstandings of the meaning of certain passages arose through the want of adequate determinatives and we can note how later copyists modified and adapted old texts to suit modern views thus in the passage from the text of unas we have a reference to the love-making of the deceased which is entirely omitted from the later copy of it given in the papyrus of neb seni and it seems as if the ideas expressed in it found no favour with the cultured mind of neb seni the great designer draughtsman and artist who was attached to the temple of ptah at memphis in a similar manner it will be noticed that most of the coarse expressions and ideas which are found in the religious books of the old period have no counterparts in the theban recension of the book of the dead it will be seen from the above brief summary that although the contents of the papyri containing the theban recension are miscellaneous there are references to other works connected with the burial of the dead from which no extracts are given among such may be specially mentioned the texts which are connected with the performance of the ceremony of opening the mouth but as it is impossible to give any adequate description of them in the space now left to me i refer the reader to my papyrus of ani in of introduction the object and contents of the book of the dead introduction a book of the dead of nessi Kansu, of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction a book of the dead of nessi Kansu, a priestess of amen about b c one thousand this holy god the lord of all the gods amen ra the lord of the throne of the two lands the governor of apt the holy soul who came into being in the beginning the great god who liveth by or upon maat the first divine matter which gave birth unto subsequent divine matter the being through whom every other god hath existence the one one who hath made everything which hath come into existence since primeval times when the world was created the being whose births are hidden whose evolutions are manifold and whose growths are unknown the holy form beloved terrible and mighty in his risings the lord of wealth the power Kepera, who createth every evolution of his existence except whom at the beginning none other existed who at the dawn in the primeval time was etenu the prince of rays and beams of light who having made himself to be seen caused all men to live who saileth over the celestial regions and faileth not for at dawn on the morrow his ordinances are made permanent who though an old man shineth in the form of one that is young and having brought or led the uttermost parts of eternity goeth round about the celestial regions and journeyeth through the tuat to illumine the two lands which he hath created the god who acteth as god who moulded himself who made the heavens and the earth by his will or heart the greatest of the great the mightiest of the mighty the prince who is mightier than the gods the young bull 
with sharp horns the protector of the two lands in his mighty name of the everlasting one who cometh and hath his might who bringeth the remotest limit of eternity the god prince who hath been prince from the time that he came into being the conqueror of the two lands by reason of his might the terrible one of the double divine face the divine aged one the divine form who dwelleth in the forms of all the gods the lion god with awesome eye the sovereign who casteth forth the two eyes the lord of flame which goeth against his enemies the god new the prince who advanceth at his hour to vivify that which cometh forth upon his potter's wheel the disk of the moon god who openeth a way both in heaven and upon earth for thy beautiful form the beneficent or operative god who is untiring and who is vigorous of heart both in rising and in setting from whose divine eyes come forth men and women at whose utterance the gods come into being and food is created and tchefau food is made and all things which are come into being the traverser of eternity the old man who maketh himself young again with myriads of pairs of eyes and numberless pairs of ears whose light is the guide of the god of millions of years the lord of life who giveth unto whom he pleaseth the circuit of the earth along with the seat of his divine face who setteth out upon his journey and suffereth no mishap by the way whose work none can destroy the lord of delight whose name is sweet and beloved and dawn mankind make supplication unto him the mighty one of victory the mighty one of twofold strength the possessor of fear the young bull who maketh an end of the hostile ones the mighty one who doeth battle with his foes through whose divine plans the earth came into being the soul who giveth light from his two uchats eyes the god by iti who created the divine transformations the holy one who is unknown the king who maketh kings to rule and who girdeth up the earth in its courses and to whose souls the gods and the goddesses pay homage by reason of the might of his terror since he hath gone before that which followeth endureth the creator of the world by his secret counsels the god capera who is unknown and who is more hidden than the other gods whose substitute is the divine disk the unknown one who hideth himself from that which cometh forth from him he is the flame which sendeth forth rays of light with mighty splendour but though he can be seen in form and observation can be made of him at his appearance yet he cannot be understood and at dawn mankind make supplication unto him his risings are of crystal among the company of the gods and he is the beloved object of every god the god new cometh forward with the north wind in this god who is hidden who maketh decrees for millions of double millions of years whose ordinances are fixed and are not destroyed whose utterances are gracious and whose statutes fail not in his appointed time who giveth duration of life and doubleth the years of those unto whom he hath a favour who graciously protecteth him whom he hath set in his heart who hath formed eternity and everlastingness the king of the south and of the north amen ra the king of the gods the lord of heaven and of earth and of the deep and of the two mountains in whose form the earth began to exist he the mighty one who is more distinguished than all the gods of the first and foremost company amen ra the king of the gods the great god the beginning of what hath come into being hath sent forth his great and holy edict for the deification of nesi khonsu the daughter of ta henu tehuti both in amentet and in neter kurt and he saith i deify nesi khonsu the daughter of ta henu tehuti in amentet and i deify her in neter kurt i have granted that she shall receive water in amentet and funeral offerings in neter kurt i deify her soul and her body in neter kurt and i will not let her soul be destroyed therein nay i deify her soul in neter kurt and i make it like unto that of every god and of every goddess who have been deified therein and like unto that of everything whatsoever which hath been deified in neter kurt 
i have granted that every god and every goddess and every divine being and everything which hath been deified shall receive her in neter kurt and i have granted that all her kinsfolk shall receive her therein with a gracious reception and i have granted that every good thing which cometh into being with a man when he assumeth this form whether he be carried off into the underworld or whether he become deified or whether every good thing be wrought for him where he is or whether he made to receive water and offerings or whether he be made to receive his cakes from those which those who have been deified receive or whether he be made to receive his divine offerings from those which those who have been deified receive shall be done for her so that it shall be with her amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith i cause nesi khonsu the daughter of ta hen tehuti a to make every kind of food and every kind of drink which every god and every goddess who have been deified in the underworld make and i cause her to make every good thing which is with every god and every goddess who have been deified in the underworld and by means thereof i have delivered my servant pa nechem from every evil thing and i will not let any of the calamities which occur in the underworld fall upon nesi khonsu to do her harm and i grant that her soul may come forth and that it may enter in according to its desire and never be repulsed amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith i have gone round i have examined the heart of nesi khonsu the daughter of ta hen tehuti a and she hath done no evil thing against pa nechem the son of osset m kebet i have carefully examined her heart and i have not let her attack his life and i have not allowed her to attack his life through other folk i have carefully examined her heart and i have not let her do any evil thing unto him such as is done against a living man i have carefully examined her heart and i have not allowed her to do by means of other folk any of the evil things which are done against a living man amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith i have caused her not to seek to do any evil thing which would cause death unto pa nechem the son of osset m kebet i have carefully examined her heart and she hath done no evil thing unto him in particular nor any evil thing which could harm him in general she hath not worked against him by means of any god or any goddess who has been deified nor by means of any male ku or of any female ku who has been deified and she hath not worked against him by means of any kind of beings whatsoever who work schemes and plans so that beings of every kind may be obedient unto their words i have carefully examined her heart and see that she hath sought that which was good for him whilst he was upon earth and i have caused her to seek in every way to give him a long life upon earth and a life of health and soundness and power and strength and might and i have caused her in every way to procure for him happiness wherever the sound of his words was heard i have caused her to seek neither harm for him nor anything which could inflict an injury upon man nor anything which could cause evil to pa nechem the son of osset m kebet i have caused her not to seek any evil thing or any noxious thing which would induce death or any harmful thing like unto those things which make the heart of man to tremble or those which do harm unto the men and women who were beloved by potnetchen nor unto him by making his heart terrified at them by means of the evil words which have been directed against them the men and women i have caused all that concerneth the heart and soul of nesi khonsu to be in good case that is to say her heart hath not been driven away from her soul her soul hath not been driven away from her heart her heart hath not been driven away from herself nesi khonsu herself hath not been in any way driven back with the repulse with which a being in her form that is to say a being who hath been deified in the underworld whatever its nature may be is sometimes repulsed and no evil thing whatsoever such as may be done unto the human being who is in a state like unto hers hath been done unto her nay but i have given all that could delight nesi khonsu namely that pa nechem might enjoy a very long life along with might and strength and power that his life might not be cut short that no evil thing of any kind whatsoever and none of the things which do harm unto a man and strike terror into his heart might come nigh him or his wives or his children or his brethren or atawi 
or nesta neb asher or masa herotha or tichui nefer the children of nesi kansu or the brethren of nesi kansu and i have caused that everything which would be of advantage to panetchem and all that would be of benefit to him in any way whatsoever and which could happen to a man in his condition and an exceedingly long life for himself and his wives and his children and his brethren may also come to nesi kansu and to her children and to her sisters amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith i grant that all things of whatever kinds they may be which a man hath when he is in the state in which nesi kansu is and by which he is deified shall be possessed by her and i grant that the seventy addresses to ra may be recited in my name so that her soul may not be destroyed in the underworld amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith every good word which can deify nesi kansu which will give her power to receive water and offerings and which shall be uttered or said before me by any person whatsoever i will fulfil to the uttermost omitting nothing every good word which shall be uttered before me on behalf of nesi kansu i will fulfil at every season of the heavens when shu cometh forth in such wise that none of the evil things which can reach a person who is in the condition in which she is shall touch her at any season of the heavens when shu cometh forth from the waters with his weapons and when day beginneth in the sky and i will utterly do away with the evil effect of every word which may be spoken by any person whatsoever of a being who is in the state in which is nesi kansu omitting nothing at every season of the heavens when shu cometh forth from the waters with his weapons and when day beginneth in the sky amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith i have caused the seventy addresses to ra to be recited in my name and i have not allowed any single benefit which belongeth to a man who is in the condition in which is nesi kansu to escape her and i have caused her to receive offerings bread and ale and unguents and wine and pomade and milk and raisins and have caused her to receive all the benefits and all the good things which a being who is in her condition and who is favoured by me and who hath been deified can receive and i have caused her to share equally with every god and every goddess every good thing whatsoever which those who have been deified in the underworld receive and i have caused her to receive her divine offerings along with the gods amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith if the word by which the offering of seket aru and of a field in seket aru is made is not one which is good for the person who is in the condition in which is nesi kansu and it hath no effect i myself will make unto her the offering of seket aru and of a field in seket aru when that which is beneficial for her in this kind of offering shall come into being and it shall suffer no diminution thereof whatsoever amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith all good things which shall be spoken in my presence saying let such and such things be done for nesi kansu the daughter of ta henu tehutia i will perform for her and they shall not be lessened and they shall not be abrogated and nothing therefrom shall be cut off at every season of the heavens when shu cometh forth and moreover she shall receive in abundance the choicest things of all that is good for her even as do every man and every god who have been deified and who go forth and who come in and who journey unto every place as they please amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning saith as concerning all good things which have been spoken in my presence that is to say perform them for pa Nechem, the son of auset m kebet my servant and for his wives and his children and his brethren and his friends and for those for whom his heart is afraid lest evil come upon them behold i will send forth my great and mighty and holy word into every place that it may cause every good thing to be with pa Nechem and his wives and his children and his brethren and all his friends in such wise that if any man shall omit to say let the decree of amen ra the king of the gods the great god the prince of that which hath come into being from the beginning be performed i myself will make that which the great god hath spoken to come to pass end of introduction the book of the dead of nesi kansu
introduction a book of the dead of the graeco roman period of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction a book of the dead of the graeco roman period the book of breathings from the papyrus of karasher one here beginneth the book of breathings one hail osiris karasher the son of teshen atit thou art pure and thy heart is pure the four parts of thee are pure two thy hind parts are cleansed and thy interior is made clean with bet incense and natron no member of thine hath any defect whatsoever the osiris karasher three the son of tashenatit hath been cleansed by means of the waters of seket hetep that is field of peace which is situated to the north of seket sanahem that is field of the grasshoppers for the goddesses uat chit and nekebet make thee to be pure at the eighth hour of the night and at the eighth hour of the day come then o osiris five karasher the son of tashenatit and enter into the hall of maati thou art pure from all offence and from six defect of every kind stone of right and truth is thy name hail osiris karasher the son of tashenatit thou enterest the tuat that is underworld seven as one mighty in purity thou art purified by the two maat goddesses in the great hall a libation hath been made for thee in the hall of seb and thy body hath been made pure eight in the hall of shu thou lookest upon ra when he setteth as tem at eventide amen is nigh unto thee to give thee air nine and ptah likewise to mould into form thy members thou enterest the horizon along with ra they receive thy soul in the neshem boat of osiris ten they make thy soul divine in the house of seb and they make thee to be triumphant for ever and for ever hail osiris karasher the son of teshenetit eleven thy name is made to endure thy material body is established and thy spiritual body is made to germinate thou art turned back neither in heaven nor upon earth thy face shineth before twelve ra thy soul liveth before amen and thy material body is renewed before osiris thou breathest for ever and for ever thy soul maketh offerings unto thee thirteen of cakes and ale and beasts and feathered fowl and cool water in the course of each day thou comest and it is triumphant the flesh is upon thy bones fourteen and thy form is even as it was upon earth thou takest drink into thy body thou eatest with thy mouth and thou receivest bread along with the souls fifteen of the gods the god anubis protecteth thee and he maketh himself thy protector thou art not turned away from the gates of the tuat that is underworld thoth the most mighty sixteen god the lord of kemenu cometh to thee and he writeth for thee the book of breathings with his own fingers then doth thy soul breathe for seventeen ever and ever and thy form is made anew with life upon earth thou art made divine along with the souls of the gods thy heart is the heart of ra and thy members nineteen are the members of the great god hail osiris karasher the son of tashenatit amen is nigh unto thee twenty to make thee to live again and the god apuat that is the opener of the ways hath opened up for thee a prosperous path thou seest with thine eyes thou hearest with thine ears thou speakest with thy mouth twenty one and thou walkest with thy legs thy soul hath been made divine in the tuat so that it may make every transformation at thy will thou breathest with delight the odours of twenty two the holy persea tree of anu that is heliopolis thou wakest each day and seest the rays of ra 
amen cometh to thee twenty three having the breath of life and he causeth thee to draw thy breath within thy funeral house thou appearest upon the earth each day and the book of breathings of thoth twenty four is a protection unto thee for thereby dost thou draw thy breath each day and thereby do thine eyes behold the beams of the divine disk the goddess of right and truth maketh speech on thy behalf before osiris twenty five and her writings are upon thy tongue horus the avenger of his father protecteth thy body he maketh thy soul to be divine like those of all the gods to one the god ra vivifieth thy soul and the soul of shu uniteth the passages of thy nostrils hail osiris karasha to the son of Tashenatit, thy soul draweth its breath in the place which thou lovest thou art even as osiris osiris the governor of those in amentet is thy name three the water flood of the prince cometh unto thee from abu elephantine and it filleth thy table of offerings with techefa food hail osiris karasher for the son of tashenatit the gods of the south and of the north come unto thee and thou art led by them to the ends of the countries of five millions of years thy soul liveth thou art in the following of osiris and thou drawest thy breath in re stau the strength which protecteth thee six is hidden in the lord of setet and in the great god thy material body liveth in tatu and in nifertet and thy soul liveth in heaven seven each day hail osiris karasha the son of tashenatit the goddess seket hath gained the mastery over what is baleful to thee heru aa eight abu protecteth thee heru sheshet hara maketh thy heart and heru maati protecteth thy body or as others say nine thy tongue thou art stablished with life and strength and health and thou art firmly seated upon thy throne in ta chesertet come then osiris karasha ten the son of tashenatit thou risest in thy form thou art arrayed in thine ornaments thou hast firm hold upon life thou passest thy days eleven in health thou journeyest hither and thither and thou drawest thy breath in every place whatsoever ra riseth upon thine abode even as osiris thou drawest thy breath twelve and thou livest through his rays amen ra heru kuti vivifieth thy ka that is double and he maketh thee to flourish by means of the book of breathings thou thirteen art in the following of osiris horus the lord of the Henubot thou art like the great god at the head of the gods thy face liveth o thou whose births are lovely thy name fourteen blossometh each day thou goest into the most mighty and divine hall in tatu thou seest him that is head of those in amentet during the uka festival the order of the fifteen is sweet as that of the venerable ones therein and thy name is magnified like those of the divine spiritual bodies hail osiris karasha the son of sixteen tashenatit thy soul liveth through the book of breathings thou art united through the book of breathings seventeen thou enterest into the tuat and hast no enemy therein thou art as a living soul in tatu and thou hast thine heart which hath not departed from thee thou hast eighteen thine eyes and they open daily the gods who are in the train of osiris speak unto osiris karasha the son of tashenatit nineteen saying thou followest ra and thou followest osiris and thy soul doth live for ever and ever the gods who dwell in the tuat twenty of osiris the governor of those in amentet speak unto osiris karasha the son of tashenatit saying the gates of the tuat are opened unto him twenty one let him show himself in neter kertet verily his soul shall live for ever he shall build habitations for himself in twenty two neter kertet the god thereof shall show favour unto his ka and he shall receive the book of breathings and verily he shall twenty three draw his breath 
may osiris the governor of those in amentet the great god the lord of abydos grant a royal oblation may he give offerings of cakes twenty four and ale and oxen and wine and akit drink and bread and techu fa food and all beautiful things to the ka of osiris karasha twenty five the son of teshenetit thy soul doth live and thy material body doth germinate by the command of ra himself thou shalt never perish and thou shalt never suffer diminution three one but shalt be like ra for ever and for ever hail usek nemtet who comest forth from anu the osiris karasha the son of tu teshenetit hath not committed sin hail urat who comest forth from karaba the osiris karasha the son of teshenetit three hath not done deeds of violence hail fenti four who cometh forth from kamenu the osiris karasha the son of tashenetit five hath not committed slaughter hail amam maat who cometh forth from the two quarti the osiris karasha six the son of tashenetit hath not plundered the possessions of the dead hail naha ra seven who cometh forth from rustal the osiris karasher the son of tashenetit eight hath not inflicted injury hail rereti who cometh forth from heaven the osiris nine karasher the son of tashenetit hath not committed sins of of the heart hail maati m ket ten who cometh forth from sekum the osiris karasher the son of tashenetit eleven hath not made revolt hail ye gods who are in the tuat hearken ye unto the voice of osiris karasher the twelve son of teshenetit and let him come before you for there is neither any evil whatsoever nor any sin whatsoever thirteen with him and no accuser can stand before him he liveth upon maat he feedeth upon maat and he hath satisfied fourteen the heart of the gods by all that he hath done he hath given food to the hungry and water to the thirsty and clothes fifteen to the naked he hath made offerings to the gods and to the khus and no sixteen report whatsoever hath been made against him before the gods o come let him enter the tuat and not be repulsed seventeen come let him follow osiris with the gods of the querti let him be a favoured being among the favoured ones eighteen and let him be divine among the perfect ones come let him live come let his soul live let his soul nineteen be received in whatever place it pleaseth and let him receive the book of breathings twenty come let him draw breath with his soul in the tuat and let him perform twenty-one whatsoever transformations he will along with those who are in amentet come let his soul go into every place where it would be and let it live upon earth for ever and for ever and for ever end of introduction a book of the dead of the graeco-roman period introduction a book of the dead of the roman period of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain a book of the dead of the roman period hail hathor tackert piru abt triumphant born of fent nubt triumphant thy soul liveth in heaven before ra gifts are made unto thy ka before the gods thy spiritual body is glorious among the khus thy name is established upon earth before seb and thy body shall endure permanently in the netter curt underworld or grave thy house is in the possession of thy children and thy husband who weep as they follow thee when thou goest about therein with thy children and they are rewarded for what they have done for thy ka they have given thee good and perfect burial and they make offerings to thy ka at the west of thebes in the sight of the folk of thy city and of the lady of the temples 
the beautiful amentet stretcheth out her hands to receive thee according to the decree of the lady of abydos thy tomb shall never be overthrown thy swathings shall never be torn in pieces and thy body shall never be mutilated the god anubis hath received thee in the land of the hall of double Maat, and he hath made thee to be one of those favoured and perfect beings who are in the following of seker thy soul flieth up on high to meet the soul of the gods and it hovereth also over thy dead body which is in akert thou journeyest about upon earth thou seest all that are therein thou observest all the affairs of thy house and thou eatest bread there having been performed by thee transformations which are like unto those of baba thou goest to the city of nif ur tet at the festival of the altars on the night of the festival of six and at the festival of anep thou goest into the city of nif ur tet at the festival of the little heat and the festival of lifting up the sky thou goest into the city of tatu on the festival of kahra ka on the day when the tet is set up the breath of the wind hath made thy throat to breathe with kensu and shu the mighty one in thebes and thou hast abundant offerings for thy ka every tenth day with the living image of ra in thebes thy life is for ever and ever and thy sovereignty is for ever and thou shalt endure for an endless number of periods of twice sixty years End of introduction a book of the dead of the roman period introductory hymns of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain hymns introductory to the book of the dead the judgment etc hymn to ra when he riseth vignette the scribe ani standing with hands raised in adoration before a table of offerings consisting of haunches of beef loaves of bread and cakes vases of wine and oil fruits and flowers he wears a fringed linen garment and has a wig necklace bracelets etc behind him stands his wife thuthu a member of the college of amen ra at thebes she is similarly robed and holds a sistrum a vine branch and a monot or emblem of pleasure in her hands text a hymn of praise to ra when he riseth in the eastern part of heaven behold osiris i need the scribe of the holy offerings of all the gods who saith homage to thee o thou who hast come as capera capera the creator of the gods thou risest thou shinest thou makest light in thy mother the goddess nut thou art crowned king of the gods thy mother nut doeth an act of homage unto thee with both her hands the land of manu receiveth thee with satisfaction and the goddess maat embraceth thee both at morn and at eve may he ra give glory and power and triumph and a coming forth as a living soul to see heru kuti horus of the two horizons to the double ka of osiris the scribe ani victorious before osiris who saith hail all ye gods of the temple of the soul who weigh heaven and earth in the balance and who provide sepulchral meals in abundance hail tatunan thou one thou creator of mankind and maker of the substance of the gods of the south and of the north of the west and of the east o come and acclaim ye ra the lord of heaven the prince life health strength the creator of the gods and adore ye him in his beautiful form at his rising in the atet boat 
they who dwell in the heights and they who dwell in the depths worship thee the god thoth and the goddess maat have written down thy course for thee daily and every day thine enemy the serpent hath been given over to the fire the serpent fiend sabau hath fallen down headlong his arms have been bound in chains and his legs hath ra hacked off from him the children of impotent revolt shall never more rise up the temple of the aged one keepeth festival and the voice of those who rejoice is in the mighty dwelling the gods exult when they see ra as he riseth and when his beams flood the world with light the majesty of the holy god goeth forth and advanceth even unto the land of manu he maketh brilliant the earth at his birth each day he journeyeth on to the place where he was yesterday o oh, be thou at peace with me and let me behold thy beauties may i journey forth upon earth may i smite the ass may i crush the serpent fiend sabau may i destroy apep in his hour may i see the abtu fish at his season and the ant fish piloting the ant boat in its lake may i see horus acting as a steersman with the god thoth and the goddess maat one on each side of him may i grasp the bows of the sectet boat and the stern of the atet boat may he ra grant unto the double ka of osiris ani to behold the disk of the sun and to see the moon god without ceasing each and every day and may my soul come forth and walk hither and thither and whithersoever it pleaseth may my name be proclaimed and may it be found upon the board of the table of offerings may offerings be made unto me in my presence even as they are made unto the followers of horus and may there be made ready for me a seat in the boat of the sun on the day when the god goeth forth and may i be received into the presence of osiris in the land of victory him to ra when he riseth vignette kenna and his wife standing with hands raised in adoration text a hymn of praise to ra when he riseth in the eastern part of heaven behold osiris kenna the merchant who saith homage to thee o ra when thou risest and to thee o temu in thy risings of beauty thou risest thou risest thou shinest thou shinest at dawn of day thou art crowned king of the gods and the goddess shuti performeth an act of homage unto thee the company of the gods praise thee from the places of sunrise and sunset thou passest over the height of heaven and thy heart is filled with gladness the sectet boat draweth on and ra advanceth in the atet boat with fair winds ra rejoiceth ra rejoiceth thy father is new thy mother is nut o thou who art crowned as ra herukuti ra harmachus thy divine boat advanceth in peace thine enemy hath been given over to the flame and he hath fallen his head hath been cut off the heart of the lady of life isis is glad because the foe of her lord hath fallen headlong the mariners of ra have content of heart and anu heliopolis exalteth the merchant kenna victorious saith i have come to thee o lord of the gods temu herukuti temu hamarchus whom maat directeth i know that whereupon thou dost live grant thou that i may be like unto one of those who are thy favoured ones among the followers of the great god may my name be proclaimed may it be found may it be set with their names 
the oars have been taken into the sectet boat and the boat of the sun advanceth in peace may i see ra when he appeareth in the sky at dawn and when his enemy hath fallen at the block may i see horus working the rudder on each side and bringing along the boat may i see the abtu fish at its time of coming into being may i see the ant fish as it becometh the pilot of the ant boat in its waters o thou only one o thou perfect one o thou who dost endure who sufferest never an evil moment who cannot be smitten down by him that doeth deeds of might none other shall have power and might over the things which belong to thee none shall obtain by fraud possession of the things which belong to the divine father who hath need of abundance the tongue of veneration the lord of abtu abadas the merchant kenna victorious saith homage to thee o heru kuti temu heru kepera thou mighty hawk who makest glad the body of man thou beautiful of face by reason of thy two great plumes awake o lord of beauty at dawn when the company of the gods and mortals say unto thee hail they sing hymns of praise unto thee at eventide and the starry deities also adore thee o thou firstborn who dost lie motionless thy mother showeth loving-kindness unto thee daily ra liveth and the serpent fiend nak is dead thou art in good case for thine enemy hath fallen headlong thou sailest over heaven with life and strength the goddess nehebka is in the atet boat and thy boat rejoiceth thy heart is glad and the two uriai goddesses rise upon thy brow him to ra when he riseth vignette kenna and his wife standing with hands raised in adoration text a hymn of praise to ra when he riseth in the eastern part of heaven behold osiris kenna the merchant triumphant who saith homage to thee o thou who risest in new and who at thy manifestation dost make the world bright with light the whole company of gods sing hymns of praise unto thee after thou hast come forth the divine merti who minister unto thee cherish thee as king of the north and south thou beautiful and beloved man-child when thou risest men and women live the nations rejoice in thee and the souls of anu heliopolis sing unto thee songs of joy the souls of the cities of pe and neken exalt thee the apes of dawn adore thee and all beasts and cattle praise thee with one accord the goddess seba overthroweth thine enemies therefore rejoice thou within thy boat thy mariners are content thereat thou hast attained unto the atet boat and thy heart swelleth with joy o lord of the gods when thou didst create them they ascribed unto thee praises the azure goddess nut doth compass thee on every side and the god nu floodeth thee with his rays of light o cast thou thy light upon me and let me see thy beauties me the osiris kenna the merchant victorious and when thou goest forth over the earth i will sing praises unto thy fair face thou risest in heaven's horizon and thy disc is adored when it resteth upon the mountain to give life unto the world saith kenna the merchant victorious thou risest thou risest and thou comest forth from the god new thou dost renew thy youth and thou dost set thyself in the place where thou wast yesterday o divine youth who hast created thyself i am not able to describe thee thou hast come with thy diadems and thou hast made heaven and earth bright with thy rays of pure emerald light the land of punt is established to give the perfumes which thou smellest with thy nostrils thou risest o marvellous being in heaven the two serpent goddesses murti are established upon thy brow and thou art the giver of laws o lord of the world and of the inhabitants thereof all the gods and kenna the merchant victorious adore thee 
him to ra when he riseth text a hymn of praise to ra when he riseth in the eastern part of heaven behold osiris hu nefer victorious who saith homage to thee o thou who art ra when thou risest and temu when thou settest thou risest thou risest thou shinest thou shinest thou who art crowned king of the gods thou art the lord of heaven thou art the lord of earth thou art the creator of those who dwell in the heights and of those who dwell in the depths thou art the god one who came into being in the beginning of time thou didst create the earth thou didst fashion man thou didst make the watery abyss of the sky thou didst form hapi the nile thou didst create the watery abyss and thou dost give life unto all that therein is thou hast knit together the mountains thou hast made mankind and the beasts of the field to come into being thou hast made the heavens and the earth worshipped be thou whom the goddess maat embraceth at morn and at eve thou dost travel across the sky with heart swelling with joy the lake of testes becometh contented thereat the serpent fiend nak hath fallen and his two arms are cut off the sectet boat receiveth fair winds and the heart of him that is in the shrine thereof rejoiceth thou art crowned prince of heaven thou art the one dowered with all sovereignty who comest forth from the sky ra is victorious o thou divine youth thou heir of everlastingness thou self-begotten one o thou who didst give thyself birth o one mighty one of myriad forms and aspects king of the world prince of anu heliopolis lord of eternity and ruler of everlastingness the company of the gods rejoice when thou risest and when thou sailest across the sky o thou who art exalted in the sectet boat homage to thee o amen ra who dost rest upon maat and who passest over the heaven every face seeth thee thou dost wax great as thy majesty doth advance and thy rays are upon all faces thou art unknown and no tongue is worthy to declare thy likeness only thou thyself canst do this thou art one even as is he that bringeth the tenna basket men praise thee in thy name ra and they swear by thee for thou art lord over them thou hearest with thine ears and thou seest with thine eyes millions of years have gone over the world i cannot tell the number of those through which thou hast passed thy heart hath decreed a day of happiness in thy name of traveller thou dost pass over and dost travel through untold spaces requiring millions and hundreds of thousands of years to pass over thou passest through them in peace and thou steerest thy way across the watery abyss to the place which thou lovest this thou doest in one little moment of time and then thou dost sink down and dost make an end of the hours behold osiris the governor of the palace of the lord of the two lands said he the first who nefer victorious saith hail my lord thou who passest through eternity whose being is everlasting hail thou disc lord of beams of light thou risest and thou makest all mankind to live grant thou that i may behold thee at dawn each day hymn to ra when he riseth text a hymn of praise to ra by neket the royal scribe the captain of soldiers who saith homage to thee o thou glorious being thou who art dowered with all sovereignty o tem heru kuti tem hemarchus when thou risest in the horizon of heaven a cry of joy cometh forth to thee from the mouth of all peoples o thou beautiful being thou dost renew thyself in thy season in the form of the disc within thy mother hathor therefore in every place every heart swelleth with joy at thy rising for ever the regions of the north and south come to thee with homage and send forth acclamations at thy rising in the horizon of heaven thou illuminest the two lands with rays of turquoise light o ra thou who art herukuti 
the marcus the divine man-child the heir of eternity self-begotten and self-born king of earth prince of the tuat governor of the regions of Akert. thou comest forth from the water thou hast sprung from the god nu who cherisheth thee and ordereth thy members o thou god of life thou lord of love all men live when thou shinest thou art crowned king of the gods the goddess nut doeth homage unto thee and the goddess maat embraceth thee at all times those who are in thy following sing unto thee with joy and bow down their foreheads to the earth when they meet thee thou lord of heaven thou lord of earth thou king of right and truth thou lord of eternity thou prince of everlastingness thou sovereign of all the gods thou god of life thou creator of eternity thou maker of heaven wherein thou art firmly established the company of the gods rejoice at thy rising the earth is glad when it beholdeth thy rays the peoples that have been long dead come forth with cries of joy to see thy beauties every day thou goest forth each day over heaven and earth and art made strong each day by thy mother nut thou passest through the heights of heaven thy heart swelleth with joy and the lake of testes is content thereat the serpent fiend hath fallen his arms are hewn off the knife hath cut asunder his joints ra liveth in maat the beautiful the sectet boat draweth on and cometh into port the south and the north the west and the east turn to praise thee o thou primeval substance of the earth who didst come into being of thine own accord isis and nephthys salute thee they sing unto thee songs of joy at thy rising in the boat they protect thee with their hands the souls of the east follow thee the souls of the west praise thee thou art the ruler of all the gods and thou hast joy of heart within thy shrine for the serpent fiend nock hath been condemned to the fire and thy heart shall be joyful for ever the mother nut is a judge to thy father new him to osiris unnefer vignette the scribe of ani standing with both hands raised in adoration before a table of offerings consisting of haunches of beef loaves of bread and cakes vases of wine and oil fruits and flowers etc he wears a fringed linen garment and a wig bracelets etc behind him stands his wife thuthu a member of the college of amen ra at thebes she is similarly robed and holds a sistrum a vine branch and a manat in her hands text glory be to osiris unnefer the great god within abtu abidas king of eternity lord of the everlasting who passeth through millions of years in his existence eldest son of the womb of nut engendered by seb the erpot lord of the crowns of the north and south lord of the lofty white crown as prince of gods and of men he hath received the crook and the whip and the dignity of his divine fathers let thy heart which is in the mountain of ament be content for thy son horus is established upon thy throne thou art crowned lord of tatu and ruler of abtu abidas through thee the world waxeth green in triumph before the might of neberchur he leadeth in his train that which is and that which is not yet in his name of taher staneth he toweth along the earth in his name of seker he is exceedingly mighty and most terrible is in his name osiris he endureth for ever and for ever in his name of unnefer homage to thee king of kings lord of lords prince of princes who from the womb of nut hast ruled the world and accurt thy body is of bright and shiny metal thy head is of azure blue and the brilliance of the turquoise encircleth thee o god on of millions of years all pervading with thy body and beautiful in countenance in ta cert grant thou to the ka double of osiris the scribe ani splendour in heaven and might upon earth and triumph in the underworld and grant that i may sail down to tatu like a living soul and up to abtu abidas like a benu bird and that i may go in and come out without repulse at the pylons of the lords of the underworld 
may there be given unto me loaves of bread in the house of coolness and offerings of food in anu heliopolis and a homestead for ever in sekhet aru with wheat and barley therefore the scene of the weighing of the heart of the dead vignette the scribe ani and his wife thuthu enter the hall of double maat wherein the heart symbolic of the conscience is to be weighed in the balance against the feather emblematic of right and truth in the upper register are the gods who sit in judgment whose names are harmarchus the great god in his boat temu shu tefnut the lady of heaven seb nut the lady of heaven isis nephthys horus the great god hathor the lady of amenta who and sa on the standard of the scales sits the dog-headed ape the companion of thoth the scribe of the gods and the god anubis jackal-headed tests the tongue of the balance on the left of the balance facing anubis are ani's luck the mesk hen or cubit with human head thought by some to be connected with the place of birth the goddesses mesk henet and renanet who presided over the birth birthplace and early education of children and the soul of ani in the form of a human-headed bird standing on a pylon on the right of the balance behind anubis stands thoth the scribe of the gods who holds in his hands his reed-pen and palette with which to record the result of the trial behind thoth stands the monster called either amam the devourer or amit the eater of the dead text osiris the scribe of ni saith my heart my mother my heart my mother my heart my coming into being may there be nothing to resist me at my judgment may there be no opposition to me from the tchatcha may there be no parting of thee from me in the presence of him that keepeth the scales thou art my ka double within my body which knitteth together and strengtheneth my limbs mayest thou come forth to the place of happiness to which i am advancing may the shenet not cause my name to stink and may no lies be spoken against me in the presence of the god good good is it for thee to hear thoth the judge of right and truth of the great company of the gods who are in the presence of osiris saith hear ye this judgment the heart of osiris hath in very truth been weighed and his soul has stood as a witness for him it hath been found true by trial in the great balance there hath not been found any wickedness in him he hath not wasted the offerings in the temples he hath not done harm by his deeds and he hath uttered no evil reports while he was upon earth the great company of the gods reply to thoth who dwelleth in Kemmenu, hermopolis that which cometh forth from thy mouth shall be declared true osiris the scribe ani victorious is holy and righteous he hath not sinned neither hath he done evil against us it shall not be allowed to the devourer amamet to prevail over him meat offerings and entrance into the presence of the god osiris shall be granted unto him together with the homestead for ever in second hetepu as unto the followers of horus vignette the scribe ani is led by horus the son of isis into the presence of osiris who is enthroned within a shrine in the form of a funeral chest osiris has upon his head the atef crown and he holds in his hands the crook the sceptre and the whip emblematic of authority dominion and sovereignty from his neck hangs the manat his title here is osiris the lord of everlastingness behind him stand nephthys his sister and on his right hand and isis his sister and wife on his left before him standing on a lotus flower are the gods of the cardinal points or as they are sometimes called the children of horus and children of osiris the first mestha has the head of a man the second hapi the head of an ape the third tuam ma tef the head of a jackal and the fourth queb senuf the head of a hawk near the lotus hangs the skin of an animal the side of the throne of osiris is painted to resemble that of a funeral chest the roof of the shrine is supported on pillars with lotus capitals and is surmounted by a figure of horus sept or horus secker and by rows of 
uraee the pedestal on which the shrine rests is in the form of the hieroglyphic which is emblematic of maat or right and truth before the shrine is a table of offerings by which on a reed mat kneels ani with his right hand raised in adoration in the left hand he holds the kerp sceptre he wears on his head a whitened wig and the so-called cone the signification of which is unknown text saith horus the son of isis i have come to thee o un nefer and i have brought unto thee the osiris ani his heart is found righteous and it hath come forth from the balance it hath not sinned against any god or any goddess thoth hath waited according to the decree pronounced unto him by the company of the gods and it is most true and righteous grant that cakes and ale may be given unto him and let him appear in the presence of the god osiris and let him be like unto the followers of horus for ever and for ever and osiris ani saith behold i am in thy presence o lord of amentet there is no sin in my body i have not spoken that which is not true knowingly nor have i done aught with a false heart grant thou that i may be like unto those favoured ones who are in the following and that i may be an osiris greatly favoured of the beautiful god and beloved of the lord of the world who am indeed a royal scribe who love thee ani victorious before the god osiris End of introductory hymns chapters one through ten of coming forth by day of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one vignettes the funeral procession to the tomb and the ceremony thereat are here depicted the mummy of the deceased lying in a funeral chest placed in a boat is being drawn along by oxen figures of the goddesses nephthys and isis stand at the head and foot respectively by the side kneels the wife of the deceased in the front of the boat stands the sem priest dressed in a panther's skin burning incense and sprinkling water and behind follow eight male mourners in the rear are servants drawing a small funeral chest surmounted by a figure of anubis and carrying vases of unguents along with the couch staff chair pallet etc of the deceased preceding the oxen drawing the funeral boat are men carrying on yokes boxes of flowers vases of unguents etc and a group of wailing women with uncovered heads and breasts who smite their heads and faces in token of grief close by stand a cow and her calf intended to be slaughtered for the funeral feast and tables loaded with offerings of herbs fruits etc at the door of the tomb stands the god of the dead anubis clasping the mummy of the deceased before which kneels the weeping wife at a table of funeral offerings stand two priests one the sem priest wears a panther's skin and holds in his hand a libation vase and censer the other holds in his right hand the instrument ur heka in the form of a ram-headed serpent the head of which is surmounted by an ureus and in his left hand an instrument in the shape of an adze with the former he is about to touch the mouth and eyes of the mummy and with the latter the mouth on the ground by their side lie the instruments which are to be employed in the ceremony of opening the mouth that is the ceremony which will give the deceased the power to eat and to drink and to talk in the next world namely the mesket the group of instruments in the form of ads the peshen kef the libation vases the boxes of purification the bandlet the feather etc behind them stands the reader who recites the funeral service from a papyrus roll and to the rear is a ministrant who holds the haunch of beef which is to be used in the ceremony at the door of the tomb 
text here begin the chapters of coming forth by day and of the songs of praise and glorifying and of coming forth from and of going into the glorious netter kurt in the beautiful amentet which are to be recited on the day of the burial whereby the deceased shall go in after coming forth saith osiris ani osiris the scribe ani homage to thee o bull of amentet the god thoth the king of eternity is with me i am the great god near the divine boat i have fought for thee i am one of the gods those divine chiefs who make osiris to be victorious over his enemies on the day of the weighing of words i am thy mediator o osiris i am one of the gods born of the goddess nut who slay the foes of osiris and who hold in bondage for him the fiend sabal i am thy mediator o horus i have fought for thee and i have put to flight the enemy for thy name's sake i am thoth who made osiris to be victorious over his enemies on the day of the weighing of words in the great house of the aged one ra who dwelleth in anu heliopolis i am teteti the son of teteti i was begotten in tatu i was born in tatu i am with those who weep and with the women who bewail osiris in the two lands of rekt and i make osiris to be victorious over his enemies ra commanded thoth to make osiris victorious over his enemies and that which was decreed for osiris thoth did for me i am with horus on the day of the clothing of teshtesh and of the opening of the wells of water for the purification of the divine being whose heart moveth not and of the drawing the bolt of the door of the concealed things and restau i am with horus who acteth as the guardian of the left shoulder of osiris in sekum letopolis and i go in and i come forth from among the divine flames on the day of the destruction of the sabal fiends in sekum i am with horus on the days of the festivals of osiris and of the making of offerings on the sixth day festival and on the tanat festival which is celebrated in anu i am the ab priest who poureth out libations in tatu rear the dweller in the temple of osiris heliopolis on the day of casting up the earth i see the things which are concealed in restau i read from the book of the festival of the divine ram which is in tatu i am the sem priest and i perform his course i perform the duties of the great chief of the work on the day of placing the henu boat of the god seker upon its sledge i have grasped the spade on the day of digging the ground in sutton henen heracleopolis magna o ye who make perfected souls to enter into the temple of osiris may ye cause the perfected soul of osiris the scribe ani to be victorious with you in the temple of osiris may he hear as ye hear may he see as ye see may he stand as ye stand may he sit as ye sit therein o ye who give cakes and ale to perfected souls in the temple of osiris give ye cakes and ale at the two seasons that is at morn and at eve or sunrise and sunset to the soul of osiris ani who is victorious before all the gods of abtu abadas and who is victorious with you o ye who open the way and lay open the paths to perfected souls in the temple of osiris open ye the way and lay open the paths to the soul of osiris the scribe and steward of all the divine offerings ani who is victorious with you may he enter in confidence and may he come forth in peace from the temple of osiris may he not be rejected may he not be turned back may he enter in as he pleaseth may he come forth as he desireth and may he be victorious may the things which he commandeth be performed in the temple of osiris may he walk and may he talk with you and may he become a glorious being along with you he hath not been found to rise up there and the balance having weighed him is now empty 
in the turin papyrus this chapter ends with the following lines for which no equivalent occurs in the earlier texts let not the decree of judgment passed upon me be placed or according to another reading made known in the mouths of the multitude may my soul lift itself up before osiris having been found to have been pure when on earth may i come before thee o lord of the gods may i arrive at the name of double right and truth may i be crowned like a god endowed with life may i give forth light like the company of the gods who dwell in heaven may i become like one of you lifting up my feet in the city of kur about may i see the sectet boat of the sacred sahu orion passing forth over the sky may i not be driven away from the sight of the lords of the tuat underworld or according to another reading the company of the gods may i smell the sweet savour of the food of the company of the gods and may i sit down with them may the ker heb the reader make invocation at my coffin and may i hear the prayers which are recited when the offerings are made may i draw nigh unto the neshem boat and may neither my soul nor its lord be turned back homage to thee o thou who art at the head of amentet thou osiris who dwellest in the city of nifu ur grant thou that i may arrive in peace in amentet and that the lords of ta may receive me and may say unto me hail hail thou that comest in peace may they prepare for me a place by the side of the chief in the presence of the divine chiefs may isis and nephthys the two divine nursing goddesses receive me at the seasons and may i come forth into the presence of un nefer osiris in triumph may i follow after horus through re Statet, and after osiris in tatu and may i perform all the transformations according to my heart's desire in every place wheresoever my ka double pleaseth so to do rubric if this text be known by the deceased upon earth or if he causeth it to be done in writing upon his coffin then will he be able to come forth on any day that he pleaseth and to enter into his habitation without being driven back the cakes and ale and haunches of meat which are upon the altar of ra shall be given unto him and his homestead shall be among the fields in the sectet anru and to him shall be given wheat and barley therein and for he shall be vigorous there even as he was upon earth chapter one b vignette the god anubis jackal-headed standing by the side of the bier on which lies the mummy text the chapter of making the sahu the spiritual body to enter into that tuat underworld on the day of the funeral when these words are to be said homage to thee o thou that dwellest in set to set cert of amentet osiris the royal scribe neck to amen victorious knoweth thee and he knoweth thy name deliver thou him from the worms which are in rostau which live upon the bodies of men and women and which feed upon their blood for osiris the favoured one of the god of his city the royal scribe nektu amen victorious knoweth you and he knoweth your names let this be the first bidding of osiris neber who keepeth hidden his body may he give air and escape from the terrible one who dwelleth in the bite of the stream of amentet and may he decree the actions of him that is rising up let him pass on unto him whose throne is within the darkness who giveth glory in ristau o lord of light come thou and swallow up the worms which are in amentet the great god who dwelleth in tatu and who is unseen heareth his prayers but those who are in affliction fear him as he cometh forth with the sentence of the divine block i osiris the royal scribe nektu amen have come bearing the decree of Nebercher, and horus hath taken possession of his throne for him his father the lord of those who are in the boat of father horus hath ascribed praise unto him he cometh with tidings and may he see anu heliopolis their chief standeth upon the earth before him and the scribes magnify him at the door of their assemblies and they bind his swathings in anu he hath led captive heaven and he hath seized the earth in his grasp neither the heavens nor the earth can be taken away from him for behold he is ra the first-born of the gods his mother suckleth him 
and she giveth to him her breast in the horizon rubric the words of this chapter are to be recited after the deceased is laid to rest in amentet whereby the region tananet is made to be content with her lord then shall osiris the royal scribe neck to amen triumphant come forth and he shall embark in the boat of ra and his body upon its bier shall be counted with those therein and he shall be established in that tuat underworld chapter two vignette a man standing upright holding a staff text the chapter of coming forth by day and of living after death saith osiris ani victorious hail one shining from the moon hail one shining from the moon grant that this osiris ani may come forth among those multitudes which are outside and let him be established as a dweller or let him go about among the denizens of heaven and let the underworld be opened unto him and behold osiris osiris ani shall come forth by day to do whatsoever he pleaseth upon the earth among the living ones chapter three vignette this chapter has no vignette text another chapter like unto the preceding the chancellor-in-chief new triumphant saith hail thou god tem who comest forth from the great deep and who shinest with glory under the form of the double lion god send out with might thy words unto those who are in thy presence and let the chancellor-in-chief new triumphant enter into their assembly he hath performed the decree which hath been spoken to the mariners of ra at eventide and the osiris new triumphant liveth after he hath died even as doth ra day by day as ra is born from yesterday even so shall the osiris new be born from yesterday and every god shall rejoice at the life of the osiris new even as they rejoice at the life of ptah when he maketh his appearance from the great temple of the aged one which is in anu chapter four vignette this chapter has no vignette text the chapter of passing over the celestial road of ristau the overseer of the palace the chancellor-in-chief the osiris new triumphant saith i open out a way over the watery abyss which formeth a path between the two combatants horus and set and i have come may the fields of osiris be given over into my power chapter five vignette a seated man text the chapter of not letting work be done in the underworld by nebseni the scribe and draughtsman in the temple of ptah who saith i lift up the hand of the man who is inactive i have come from the city of unu hermopolis i am the divine soul which liveth and i lead with me the hearts of the apes chapter six vignette a standing bearded male figure text the chapter of making the shabti figure to do work for a man in the underworld the scribe nebseni the draughtsman in the temples of the north and south the man highly venerated in the temple of ptah saith o thou shabti figure of the scribe nebseni the son of the scribe thena victorious and of the lady of the house Mutreshtha, victorious if i be called or if i be adjudged to do any work whatsoever of the labours which are to be done in the underworld behold for thee opposition will there be set aside by a man in his turn let the judgment fall upon thee instead of upon me always in the matter of sowing the fields of filling the watercourses with water and of bringing the sands of this east to the west the shabti figure answereth verily i am here and will come whithersoever thou biddest me chapter seven vignette the deceased spearing a serpent text the chapter of passing over the abominable back of apep the overseer of the palace the chancellor-in-chief new triumphant saith hail thou creature of wax who leadest away victims and destroyest them and who livest upon the weak and helpless may i never become weak and helpless before thee may i never suffer collapse before thee and thy poison shall never enter 
into my members for my members are as the members of the god tem and since thou thyself dost not suffer collapse i shall not suffer collapse o oh, let not the pains of death which come upon thee enter into my members i am the god tem and i am in the foremost part of nu the sky and the power which protecteth me is that which is with all the gods for ever i am he whose name is hidden and whose habitation is holy for millions of years i am he who dwelleth therein and i come forth along with the god tem i am he who shall not be condemned i am strong i am strong chapter eight vignette the emblem of amenta towards which ani clad in white and holding a staff in his left hand and a bandlet in the right is walking text the chapter of passing through amentet and coming forth by day saith osiris ani the city of unu hermopolis is opened my head is sealed up o thoth and strong is the eye of horus i have delivered the eye of horus which shineth with splendours on the forehead of ra the father of the gods i am the same osiris the dweller in amentet osiris knoweth his day and that he shall live through his period of life and shall not i do likewise i am the moon god who dwelleth among the gods i shall not perish stand up therefore o horus for osiris hath reckoned thee among the gods chapter nine vignette a ram having upon his head the atef crown standing upon a pylon shaped pedestal which rests on a green reed mat before him is an altar upon which stand a libation vase and a lotus flower the scribe ani clothed in white stands with both hands raised in adoration text the chapter of coming forth by day after having made the passage through the tomb saith osiris ani hail soul thou mighty one of strength verily i am here i have come i behold thee i have passed through the tuat underworld i have seen my divine father osiris i have scattered the gloom of night i am his beloved one i have come i have seen my divine father osiris i have stabbed the heart of suti i have performed all the ceremonies for my divine father osiris i have opened every way in heaven and in earth i am the son who loveth his father osiris i have become a sahu i have become a ku i am furnished with what i need hail every god hail every ku i have made a path for myself i osiris the scribe ani victorious chapter ten vignette ani clad in white spearing a serpent text another chapter to be said by a man who cometh forth by day against his enemies in the underworld saith osiris ani i have divided the heavens i have cleft the horizon i have traversed the earth following upon his footsteps the mighty khu taketh possession of me and carrieth me away because behold i am provided with his magical words for millions of years i eat with my mouth i crush my food with my jaw-bones behold i am the god who is the lord of the tuat underworld may there be given unto me osiris ani these things in perpetuity without fail or lessening End of chapters one through ten of coming forth by day chapters eleven through seventeen one of the egyptian book of the dead by a e wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven vignette this chapter is without a vignette in both the theban and saita recensions text the chapter of a man coming forth against his enemies in the underworld the overseer of the palace the chancellor-in-chief new triumphant saith o thou god who eatest thine arm i have departed from thy road i am ra and have come forth from the horizon against my enemies and he hath granted to me that they shall not escape from me i have made an offering and my hand is like that of the lord of the ureret crown i have lifted up my feet even as the urii goddesses rise up my overthrow shall not be accomplished and as for mine enemy he hath been given over into my power 
and he shall not be delivered from me i shall stand up like horus and i shall sit down like ptah and i shall be mighty like thoth and i shall be strong like tem i shall therefore walk with my legs i shall speak with my mouth i shall go round about in quest of mine enemy and as he hath been delivered over to me he shall not escape from me chapter twelve vignette this chapter is without a vignette in both theban and saita recensions text the chapter of going into and of coming forth from the underworld the osiris nu triumphant saith hymns of praise to thee o ra thou keeper of secret gates which are on the brow of the god seb by the side of the balance of ra wherein he lifteth up right and truth mayat day by day in very truth i have burst through the earth grant thou unto me that i may go forward and arrive at the state of old age chapter thirteen or one hundred and twenty one vignette this chapter is without a vignette in both the theban and saita recensions text the chapter of entering into and of coming forth from amentet osiris the scribe nebseni victorious saith mortals i go in like the hawk and i come forth like the benu bird the morning star of ra may a path be made for me whereby i may enter into peace into the beautiful amentet and may i be by the lake of horus and may i lead the greyhounds of horus and may a path be made for me whereby i may enter in and adore osiris the lord of life in the theban recension this chapter appears without a rubric but in the saita recension as given in the turin papyrus we have the following rubric this chapter is to be recited over a ring made of ankum flowers which shall be laid on the right ear of the ku together with another ring wrapped up in a strip of byssus cloth whereon the name of osiris alf ankh victorious born of the lady shirt amsu victorious shall be done in writing on the day of sepulture chapter fourteen vignette this chapter has no vignette either in the theban or in the saita recension text the chapter of putting an end to any shame that may be in the heart of the god for the chief deputy of amen the scribe mesem netter victorious who saith hymns of praise to thee o thou god who makest the moment to advance thou dweller among mysteries of every kind thou guardian of the word which i speak behold the god hath shame of me but let my faults be washed away and let them fall upon both hands of the god of right and truth do away utterly with the transgression which is in me together with my wickedness and sinfulness o god of right and truth may this god be at peace with me do away utterly with the obstacles which are between thee and me o thou to whom offerings are made in the divine city of kanur grant thou that i may bring to thee the offerings which will make peace between thee and men whereon thou livest and that i also may live thereon be thou at peace with me and do away utterly with all the shame of me which thou hast in thy heart because of me chapter fifteen vignette ani standing with both hands raised in adoration before ra hawk-headed and seated in a boat floating upon the sky on a platform in the bows sits the god herupakrat harpocrates with his right hand raised to his mouth which he touches with one finger the side of the boat is ornamented with feathers of mayat and with an unchat the handles of the oars and the tops of the rowlocks are in the form of hawks heads and on the blades of the oars are uchats text a hymn of praise to ra when he riseth upon the horizon and when he setteth in the land of life osiris the scribe ani saith homage to thee o ra when thou risest as tem Harukuti tem hamarchus thou art adored by me when thy beauties are before mine eyes and when thy radiance falleth upon my body thou goest forth to thy setting in the sectet boat with fair winds 
and thy heart is glad the heart of the matet boat rejoiceth thou stridest over the heavens in peace and all thy foes are cast down the never-resting stars sing hymns of praise unto thee and the stars which rest and the stars which never fail glorify thee as thou sinkest to rest in the horizon of manu o thou who art beautiful at morn and at eve o thou lord who livest and art established o my lord homage to thee o thou who art ra when thou risest and tem when thou settest in beauty thou risest and shinest on the back of thy mother nut o thou who art crowned king of the gods nut doeth homage unto thee and everlasting and ever changing order embraceth thee at morn and at eve thou stridest over the heaven being glad of heart and the lake of testes is content thereat the sabal fiend hath fallen to the ground his arms and his hands have been hacked off and the knife hath severed the joints of his body ra hath a fair wind the sectet boat goeth forth and sailing along it cometh into port the gods of the south and of the north of the west and of the east praise thee o thou divine substance from whom all forms of life come into being thou sendest forth the word and the earth is flooded with silence o thou only one who didst dwell in heaven before ever the earth and the mountains came into existence o runner o lord o only one thou maker of things which are thou hast fashioned the tongue of the company of the gods thou hast produced whatsoever cometh forth from the waters and thou springest up from them over the flooded land of the lake of horus let me snuff the air which cometh forth from thy nostrils and the north wind which cometh forth from thy mother nut o make thou to be glorious my shining form ku o osiris make thou to be divine my soul ba thou art worshipped in peace or in setting o lord of the gods thou art exalted by reasoning out thy wondrous works shine thou with thy rays of light upon my body day by day upon me osiris the scribe the teller of the divine offerings of all the gods the overseer of the granary of the lords of abtu abadas the royal scribe in truth who loveth thee ani victorious in peace chapter fifteen hymn and litany to osiris vignette osiris ani the royal scribe in truth who loveth ra the scribe and teller of the divine offerings of all the gods and osiris thuthu the lady of the house the singing woman of amen standing in adoration before the god osiris who accompanied by the goddess isis stands in a shrine made in the form of a funeral chest text praise be unto thee o osiris lord of eternity unnifer Harukuti, hamarchus whose forms are manifold and whose attributes are majestic ptah sekotem in anu heliopolis the lord of the hidden place and the creator of het ka ptah memphis and of the gods therein the guide of the underworld whom the gods glorify when thou settest in nut isis embraceth thee in peace and she driveth away the fiends from the mouth of thy paths thou turnest thy face upon amentet and thou makest the earth to shine as with refined copper those who have lain down the dead rise up to see thee they breathe the air and they look upon thy face when the disk riseth on its horizon their hearts are at peace inasmuch as they behold thee o thou who art eternity and everlastingness litany homage to thee o lord of starry deities in anu and of heavenly beings in ker abba thou god unti who art more glorious than the gods who are hidden in anu o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee o an in antus heru kuti hamarchus with long strides thou stridest over heaven o heru kuti o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee o soul of everlastingness thou soul who dwellest in tatu un 
nefer son of nut thou art lord of akert o grant thou unto me a path wherein i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee in thy dominion over tatu the uret crown is established upon thy head thou art the one who maketh the strength which protecteth himself and thou dwellest in peace in tatu o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee o lord of the acacia tree the secker boat is set upon its sledge thou turnest back the fiend the worker of evil and thou causest the uchat to rest upon its seat o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee o thou who art mighty in thine hour thou great and mighty prince dweller in Anratfa, lord of eternity and creator of everlastingness thou art the lord of sudan behenen heracleopolis magna o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee o thou who restest upon right and truth thou art the lord of abtu abadas and thy limbs are joined unto ta tchetsertet thou art he to whom fraud and guile are hateful o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee o thou who art within thy boat thou bringest hapi the nile forth from his source the light shineth upon thy body and thou art the dweller in nekan o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit homage to thee o creator of the gods thou king of the north and of the south o osiris victorious one ruler of the world in thy gracious seasons thou art the lord of the celestial world o grant thou unto me a path whereon i may pass in peace for i am just and true i have not spoken lies wittingly nor have i done aught with deceit him to ra text a hymn of praise to ra when he riseth in the eastern part of heaven those who are in his train rejoice and lo osiris ani victorious saith hail thou disc thou lord of rays who risest on the horizon day by day shine thou with thy beams of light upon the face of osiris ani who is victorious for he singeth hymns of praise unto thee at dawn and he maketh thee to set at eventide with words of adoration may the soul of osiris ani the triumphant one come forth with thee into heaven may he go forth in the matet boat may he come into port in the sectet boat and may he cleave his path among the never resting stars in the heavens osiris ani being in peace and in triumph adoreth his lord the lord of eternity saying homage to thee o hero kuti hamarchus who art the god kapara the self-created when thou risest on the horizon and sheddest thy beams of light upon the lands of the north and of the south thou art beautiful yea beautiful and all the gods rejoice when they behold thee the king of heaven the goddess nept anut is established upon thy head and her uriae of the south and of the north are upon thy brow she taketh up her place before thee the god thoth is established in the bows of thy boat to destroy utterly all thy foes those who are in the tuat underworld come forth to meet thee and they bow in homage as they come towards thee to behold thy beautiful image and i have come before thee that i may be with thee to behold thy disc every day may i not be shut up in the tomb may i not be turned back may the limbs of my body be made new again when i view thy beauties even as are those of all thy favoured ones because i am one of those who worship thee whilst i lived upon earth may i come in unto the land of eternity may i come even unto the everlasting land for behold o my lord this hast thou ordained for me and lo osiris ani triumphant in peace the triumphant one saith homage to thee o thou who risest in thy horizon as ra thou reposest upon law which changeth not 
nor can it be altered thou passest over the sky and every face watcheth thee and thy course for thou hast been hidden from their gaze thou dost show thyself at dawn at an even time day by day the sectet boat wherein is thy majesty goeth forth with might thy beams shine upon all faces the number of thy red and yellow rays cannot be known nor can thy bright beams be told the lands of the gods and the eastern lands of punt must be seen ere that which is hidden in thee may be measured alone and by thyself thou dost manifest thyself when thou comest into being above new the sky may ani advance even as thou dost advance may he never cease to go forward even as thy majesty ceaseth not to go forward even though it be for a moment for with strides dost thou in one little moment pass over the spaces which would need hundreds of thousands and millions of years for man to pass over this thou doest and then dost thou sink to rest thou puttest an end to the hours of the night and let us count them even thou thou endest them in thine own appointed season and the earth becometh light thou settest thyself before thy handiwork in the likeness of ra thou risest in the horizon osiris the scribe ani triumphant declareth his praise of thee when thou shinest and when thou risest at dawn he crieth in his joy at thy birth thou art crowned with the majesty of thy beauties thou mouldest thy limbs as thou dost advance and thou bringest them forth without birth pangs in the form of ra as thou dost rise up into the upper air grant thou that i may come unto the heaven which is everlasting and under the mountain where dwell thy favoured ones may i be joined unto those shining beings holy and perfect who are in the underworld and may i come forth with them to behold thy beauties when thou shinest at eventide and goest to thy mother new thou dost place thyself in the west and my two hands are raised in adoration of thee when thou settest as a living being behold thou art the maker of eternity and thou art adored when thou settest in the heavens i have given my heart unto thee without wavering o thou who art mightier than the gods osiris ani triumphant saith a hymn of praise to thee o thou who risest like unto gold and who dost flood the world with light on the day of thy birth thy mother giveth thee birth upon her hand and thou dost give light unto the course of the disc o thou great light who shinest in the heavens thou dost strengthen the generations of men with the nile flood and thou dost cause gladness in all lands and in all cities and in all the temples thou art glorious by reason of thy splendours and thou makest strong thy ka double with hue and chechfau foods o thou who art the mighty one of victories thou who art the power of all powers who dost make strong thy throne against evil fiends who art glorious in majesty in the sectet boat and who art exceeding mighty in the atet boat make thou glorious osiris ani with victory in the underworld grant thou that in the netherworld he may be without evil i pray thee to put away his faults behind thee grant thou that he may be one of thy venerable servants who are with the shining ones may he be joined unto the souls which are in ta tet and may he journey into the second aru by a prosperous and happy decree he the osiris the scribe ani triumphant and the god saith thou shalt come forth into heaven thou shalt pass over the sky thou shalt be joined into the starry deities praises shall be offered unto thee in thy boat thou shalt be hymned in the atet boat thou shalt behold ra within his shrine thou shalt set together with his disc day by day thou shalt see the ant fish when it springeth into being in the waters of turquoise and thou shalt see the abtu fish in his hour it shall come to pass that the evil one shall fall when he layeth a snare to destroy thee and the joints of his neck and of his back shall be hacked asunder ra saileth with the fair wind and the sectet boat draweth on and cometh into port 
the mariners of ra rejoice and the heart of nept ankh is glad for the enemy of her lord hath fallen to the ground thou shalt behold horus on the standing-place of the pilot of the boat and thoth and maat shall stand one upon each side of him all the gods shall rejoice when they behold ra coming in peace to make the hearts of the shining ones to live and osiris ani victorious the scribe of the divine offerings of the lords of thebes shall be along with them a hymn to the setting sun vignette in this papyrus this chapter is without a vignette text another chapter of the mystery of the tuat underworld and of passing through the unseen netherworld and of seeing the disk when he setteth in amentet when he is adored by the gods and by the khus in the underworld and when the soul which dwelleth in ra is made perfect he is made mighty before tem he is made great before osiris he setteth his terror before the company of the gods who are the guides of the netherworld he maketh long his steps and he maketh his face to enter with that of the great god now every khu for whom these words shall have been said shall come forth by day in any form which he is pleased to take he shall gain power among the gods of the tuat underworld and they shall recognize him as one of themselves and he shall enter in at the hidden gate with power the lady mut hetep victorious singeth hymns of praise to thee saying o ra tem in thy splendid progress thou risest and thou settest as a living being in the glories of the western horizon thou settest in thy territory which is in manu thy ureus is behind thee thy ureus is behind thee homage to thee o thou who art in peace homage to thee o thou who art in peace thou art joined unto the eye of tem and it chooseth its powers of protection to place behind thy members thou goest forth through heaven thou travellest over the earth and thou journeyest onward o luminary the northern and southern halves of heaven come to thee and they bow low in adoration and they pay homage unto thee day by day the gods of amentet rejoice in thy beauties and the unseen places sing hymns of praise unto thee those who dwell in the sectet boat go round about thee and the souls of the east pay homage to thee and when they meet thy majesty they cry come come in peace there is a shout of welcome to thee o lord of heaven and governor of amentet thou art acknowledged by isis who seeth her son in thee the lord of fear the mighty one of terror thou settest as a living being in the hidden place thy father ta tunan raiseth thee up and he placeth both his hands behind thee thou becomest endowed with divine attributes in thy members of earth thou wakest in peace and thou settest in manu grant thou that i may become a being honoured before osiris and that i may come to thee o ra tem i have adored thee therefore do thou for me that which i wish grant thou that i may be victorious in the presence of the company of the gods thou art beautiful o ra in thy western horizon of amentet thou lord of maat thou mighty one of fear thou whose attributes are majestic o thou who art greatly beloved by those who dwell in the tuat underworld thou shinest with thy beams upon the beings that are therein perpetually and thou sendest forth thy light upon the path of Ristau thou openest up the path of the double lion god thou settest the gods upon their thrones and the khus in their abiding places the heart of naarurf is glad when ra setteth the heart of naarurf is glad when ra setteth hail o ye gods of the land of amentet who make offerings and oblations unto ra tem ascribe ye glory unto him when ye meet him grasp ye your weapons and overthrow ye the fiend seba on behalf of ra and repulse the fiend nebit on behalf of osiris the gods of the land of amentet rejoice and lay hold upon the cords of the sectet boat and they come in peace the gods of the hidden place who dwell in amentet triumph hail thoth who didst make osiris to triumph over his enemies make thou mut hetep victorious to triumph over her enemies in the presence of the great divine sovereign chiefs who live with osiris the lord of life 
the great god who dwelleth in his disc cometh forth that is horus the avenger of his father Unafer ra osiris setteth and the khus who are in the tuat underworld say homage to thee o thou who comest as tem and who comest into being as the creator of the gods homage to thee o thou who comest as the holy soul of souls who dwellest in the horizon homage to thee who art more glorious than all the gods and who illuminest the tuat with thine eye homage to thee who sailest in thy glory and who goest round about in thy disc to the following variant of the above hymn is translated from the text in the papyrus of nektu amen another chapter of the mystery of the tuat underworld and of travelling the unseen places of the underworld of seeing the disc when he setteth in amentet when he is adored by the gods and by the khus of the tuat underworld and when the divine khu which dwelleth within ra is made perfect he setteth his might before ra he setteth his power before tem he setteth his strength before kent amentet and he setteth his terror before the company of the gods the osiris of the gods goeth as leader through the tuat underworld he crasheth through mountains he bursteth through rocks he maketh glad the heart of every khu this composition shall be recited by the deceased when he cometh forth and when he goeth in with the gods among whom he findeth no opposition then shall he come forth by day in all the manifold and exceedingly numerous forms which he may be pleased to take the osiris saith a hymn of praise to ra at eventide when he setteth as a living being in baaka the great god who dwelleth in his disc riseth in his two eyes and all the khus of the underworld receive him in his horizon of amentet they shout praises unto herukuti hamarchus in his form of tem and they sing hymns of joy to ra when they have received him at the head of his beautiful path of emmentat he the deceased saith praise be unto thee o ra praise be unto thee o tem in thy splendid progress thou hast risen and thou hast put on strength and thou settest like a living being amid thy glories in the horizon of amentet in thy domain which is in manu thy uraeus goddess is behind thee thy uraeus goddess is behind thee hail to thee in peace hail to thee in peace thou joinest thyself unto the eye of horus and thou hidest thyself within its secret place it destroyeth for thee all the convulsions of thy face it maketh thee strong with life and thou livest it bindeth its protecting amulets behind thy members thou sailest forth over heaven and thou makest the earth to be established thou joinest thyself unto the upper heaven o luminary the two regions of the east and west make adoration unto thee bowing low and paying homage unto thee and they praise thee day by day the gods of amentet rejoice in thy splendid beauties the hidden places adore thee the aged ones make offerings unto thee and they create for thee protecting powers the divine beings who dwell in the eastern and western horizons transport thee and those who are in the sectet boat convey thee round and about the souls of amentet cry out unto thee and say unto thee when they meet thy majesty life health strength all hail all hail when thou comest forth in peace there arise shouts of delight to thee o thou lord of heaven thou prince of amentet thy mother isis embraceth thee and in thee she recognizeth her son the lord of fear the mighty one of terror thou settest as a living being within the dark portal thy father tatunan lifteth thee up and he stretcheth out his two hands behind thee thou becomest a divine being in the earth thou wakest as thou settest and thy habitation is in manu grant thou that i may be venerated before osiris and come thou to me o ra tem since thou hast been adored by me that which i wish thou shalt do for me day by day grant thou victory unto me before the great company of the gods o ra who art doubly beautiful in thy horizon of amentet thou lord of maat who dwellest in the horizon the fear of thee is great thy forms are majestic and the love of thee is great among those who dwell in the underworld 
a hymn to the setting sun vignette the deceased and his wife standing with both hands raised in adoration before a table of offerings upon which are a libation vase and lotus flowers text a hymn of praise to ra hero kuti ra marcus when he setteth in the western part of heaven he the deceased saith homage to thee o ra who in thy setting art tem heru kuti tem hamarchus thou divine god thou self-created being thou primeval matter from which all things were made when thou appearest in the boughs of thy bark men shout for joy at thee o maker of the gods thou didst stretch out the heavens wherein the two eyes might travel thou didst make the earth to be a vast chamber for thy coups so that every man might know his fellow the sectet boat is glad and the matet boat rejoiceth and they greet thee with exultation as thou journeyest along the god nu is content and thy mariners are satisfied the uraeus goddess hath overthrown thine enemies and thou hast carried off the legs of apet thou art beautiful o ra each day and thy mother nut embraceth thee thou settest in beauty and thy heart is glad in the horizon of manu and the holy beings therein rejoice thou shinest there with thy beams o thou great god osiris the everlasting prince the lords of the zones of the tuat in their caverns stretch out their hands in adoration before thy ka double and they cry out to thee and they all come forth in the train of thy form shining brilliantly the hearts of the lords of the tuat are glad when thou sendest forth thy glorious light in amentet their two eyes are directed towards thee and they press forward to see thee and their hearts rejoice when they do see thee thou hearkenest unto the acclamations of those that are in the funeral chest thou doest away with their helplessness and drivest away the evils which are about them thou givest breath to their nostrils and they take hold of the boughs of thy bark in the horizon of manu thou art beautiful each day o ra and may thy mother nut embrace osiris victorious chapter sixteen the scene of which lepsius inadvertently gave the number sixteen and which he regarded as a chapter of the book of the dead is strictly speaking only a vignette intended to accompany the hymn to the rising sun that forms part of the introductory matter of the chapters of the book of the dead which we find in some of the oldest papyri of the theban period in the papyrus of ani we see the sun's disc supported by a pair of arms which emerge from the sign of life this in its turn is supported by the pillar which symbolizes the tree trunk which contained the dead body of osiris this pillar rests upon the horizon on each side of it are three apes typical of the spirits of the dawn adoring the disc on the right is the goddess nephthys and on the left is the goddess isis nephthys kneels upon the symbol of the sunset and isis upon the symbol of the dawn above the whole scene is the vaulted sky in the papyrus of hu nefer the pillar is endowed with human arms and hands which grasp the crook and flail emblematic of osiris reign and rule and the two goddesses are standing upright one says i am thy sister nephthys and the other i am thy sister isis the divine mother the sun is typified by a hawk having a disc encircled by an uraeus upon his head the apes are here seven in number four stand in front and three behind above the whole scene is the vaulted sky certain papyri have also vignettes which illustrate the hymns to the setting sun in this case the hawk usually stands upon the emblem of the west while apes and gods adore him in the papyrus of kenna on the right three hawk-headed gods kneel in adoration with their left arms raised and on the left three jackal-headed gods with their right arms raised in adoration below two lion-headed gods with discs on their heads are seated back to back in a cluster of lotus flowers these typify dawn and eventide the goddess isis kneels in adoration before the lion of the dawn and the goddess nephthys before the lion of eventide chapter seventeen vignette ani and his wife seated in a hall he is moving a piece on a draught board to the souls of ani and his wife in the form of human-headed hawks 
standing upon a pylon shaped building the bearded soul is described as the soul of osiris three a table of offerings upon which are lotus flowers a libation vase etc four two lions seated back to back and supporting the horizon with the sun's disk over which extends the sky the lion on the right is called seth yesterday and then on the left tau tomorrow five the benu bird and a table of offerings six the mummy of ani on a bier within a funeral shrine at the head and foot are nephthys and isis in the form of hawks beneath the bier are ani's palette variegated marble or glass vessels etc plate eight one the god of million of years on his head and in his right hand is the emblem of years his left hand is stretched out over a pool containing the eye of horus two the god uchat ura great green water with each hand extended over a pool that under his right hand is called lake of natron and that under his left hand lake of nitra three a pylon with doors called re stau the gate of the passages of the tomb four the uchat facing to the left above a pylon five the cow Ert, the eye of ra with disc and horns collar and manat and whip six a funeral chest from which emerge the head of ra and his two arms and hands each holding the emblem of life the chest which is called the district of abtu abadas or the burial place of the east has upon its sides figures of the four children of horus who protect the intestines of osiris or the deceased on the right stand tu amon tef and keb hesenaf and on the left meshtha and hapi plate nine one figures of three gods who together with mestha hapi tua mountef and quebhensenuf are the seven khus referred to in line ninety nine of the text their names are meatefa keri bekfa and heru kenti an maati or merti to the god ampu anubis jackal headed three figures of seven gods whose names are netchet netchet aarketket kenti hef ami unnut f tesher mea ves mea m ker and an m huru for the soul of ra in the form of a hawk with a disc on his head conversing in tatu with the soul of osiris in the form of a human-headed bird wearing the white crown this scene is of the rarest occurrence plate ten one the cat emblematic of the sun cutting off the head of the serpent apep or apepi typical of darkness two three seated deities each holding a knife three ani and his wife thuthu kneeling in adoration before the god capera beetle-headed who is seated in the boat of the rising sun four two apes emblematic of the goddesses isis and nephthys five the god tem seated with the sun disc in the boat of the setting sun six the god rehu in the form of a lion seven the serpent uachit the lady of flame a symbol of the eye of ra coiled round a lotus flower above is the emblem of fire End of chapters eleven through seventeen one chapter seventeen text here begin the praises and glorifyings of coming out from and of going into the glorious underworld which is in the beautiful amentet of coming out by day in all the forms of existence which please him the deceased of playing at draughts and sitting in the hall and of coming forth as a living soul saith osiris the scribe ani after he hath come to his haven of rest it is good for a man to recite this work whilst he is upon earth for then all the words of tem come to pass i am the god tem in rising i am the only one i came into existence anew i am ra who rose in the beginning the ruler of this who then is this it is ra when at the beginning he rose in the city of sutton henan heracleopolis magna crowned like a king in his rising the pillars of the god shu were not as yet created when he was upon the high ground of him that dwelleth in kemenu hermopolis magna 
i am the great god who gave birth to himself even Nu, who made his names to become the company of the gods as god who then is this it is ra the creator of the names of his limbs which came into being in the form of the gods who are in the train of ra i am he who is not driven back among the gods who then is this it is tem the dweller in his disk or as others say it is ra in his rising in the eastern horizon of heaven i am yesterday i know to-morrow who then is this yesterday is osiris and to-morrow is ra on the day when he shall destroy the enemies of neber chur and when he shall establish as prince and ruler his son horus or as others say on the day when we commemorate the festival of the meeting of the dead osiris with his father ra and when the battle of the gods was fought in which osiris the lord of amentet was the leader what then is this it is amentet that is to say the creation of the souls of the gods when osiris was leader in set amentet or as others say it is amentet which ra hath given unto me when any god cometh he doth arise and doeth battle for it i know the god who dwelleth therein who then is this it is osiris or as others say ra is his name or it is the phallus of ra wherewith he was united to himself i am the benu bird which is in anu heliopolis and i am the keeper of the volume of the book of things which are and of things which shall be who then is this it is osiris or as others say it is his dead body or as others say it is his filth the things which are and the things which shall be are his dead body or as others say they are eternity and everlastingness eternity is the day and everlastingness is the night i am the god amsu in his coming forth may his two plumes be set upon my head for me who then is this amsu is horus the avenger of his father and his coming forth is his birth the plumes upon his head are isis and nephthys when they go forth to set themselves there even as his protectors and they provide that which his head lacketh or as others say they are the two exceeding great uriae which are upon the head of their father tem or as others say his two eyes are the two plumes which are upon his head osiris ani the scribe of all the holy offerings riseth up in his place in triumph he cometh into his city what then is this it is the horizon of his father tem i have made an end of my shortcomings and i have put away my faults what then is this it is the cutting off of the corruptible in the body of osiris the scribe ani victorious before all the gods and all his faults are driven out what then is this it is the purification of osiris on the day of his birth i am purified in my great double nest which is in Sutenhenen, Heri cleopolis magna on the day of the offerings of the followers of the great god who is therein what then is this millions of years is the name of the one nest great green lake is the name of the other a pool of natron and a pool of nitre or as others say the traverser of millions of years is the name of one great green lake is the name of the other or as others say the begetter of millions of years is the name of one great green lake is the name of the other now as concerning the great god who dwelleth therein it is ra himself i pass over the way i know the head of the pool of maat what then is this it is re stau that is to say it is the underworld on the south of naarut f and it is the northern door of the tomb now as concerning the pool of maat it is abtu abidas or as others say it is the boat by which his father tem travelleth when he goeth forth to second aru which he bringeth forth the food and nourishment of the gods who are behind their shrines now the gate of techesert is the gate of the pillars of shu the northern gate of the tuat underworld or as others say it is the two leaves of the door through which the god tem passeth when he goeth forth to the eastern horizon of heaven o ye gods who are in the presence of osiris grant me your arms for i am the god who shall come into being among you who then are these they are the drops of blood which came forth from the phallus of ra when he went forth to perform mutilation upon himself 
they sprang into being as the gods hu and sa who are in the following of ra and who accompany the god tem daily and every day i osiris the scribe ani triumphant have filled for thee the utchat after it had suffered failure on the day of the combat of the two fighters horus and set what then is this it is the day on which horus fought with set who cast filth in the face of horus and when horus destroyed the members of set now this thoth did with his own fingers i lift up the hair cloud when there are storms and quakings in the sky what then is this it is the right eye of ra which raged against set when he sent it forth thoth raised up the hair cloud and brought the eye alive and whole and sound and without defect to its lord or as others say it is the eye of ra when it is sick and when it weepeth for its fellow eye then thoth standeth up to cleanse it i behold ra who was born yesterday from the buttocks of the goddess Ma'ert. his strength is my strength and my strength is his strength what then is this it is the watery abyss of heaven or as others say it is the image of the eye of ra in the morning at his daily birth Ma'ert is the eye uchat of ra therefore osiris the scribe ani triumphant is a great one among the gods who are in the train of horus the words are spoken for him that loveth his lord what then is this the gods who are in the train of horus are mestha hapi tu amatef and queb senef homage to you o ye lords of right and truth ye sovereign princes who stand behind osiris who utterly do away with sins and crimes and who are in the following of the goddess hetep sekus grant that i may come unto you destroy ye all the faults which are within me even as ye did for the seven khus who are among the followers of their lord Sepa. anubis appointed their place on the day when was said come therefore thither when then is this these lords of right and truth are thoth and astes the lord of amentet the sovereign princes who stand behind osiris even mestha hapi to amatef and queb senef are they who are behind the thigh in the northern sky now those who do utterly away with sins and crimes and who are in the following of hetep sekus are the god sebek who dwelleth in the water the goddess hetep sekus is the eye of ra or as others say it is the flame which followeth after osiris to burn up the souls of his enemies as concerning all the faults which are in osiris the scribe of the offerings of all the gods ani triumphant this is all that he hath done against the lords of eternity since he came forth from his mother's womb as concerning the seven khus even meshtha hapi tuamautef queb senef may a tef f carry back f and heru kenti on may ati anubis appointed them to be protectors of the dead body of osiris or as others say set them behind the place of purification of osiris or as others say those seven khus are netche netche aquaquet and nerta nef besef kenti he f aker ami anut f tesher maati ami het anus ubis hra per m ket ket and me am ker an f m hru the chief of the sovereign princes who are in ne arat f is horus the avenger of his father as concerning the day upon which was said come therefore thither it referreth to the words come then thither which ra spake unto osiris lo may this be said unto me in amentet i am the divine soul which dwelleth in the two divine tchafi what then is this it is osiris when he goeth into tatu and findeth there the soul of ra there the one god embraceth the other and divine souls spring into being within the two divine tchafi as concerning the two divine chafi they are heru netch bra f and heru kent an maati or as others say the double divine soul which dwelleth in the two divine chafi is the soul of ra and the soul of osiris or as others say it is the soul which dwelleth in shu the soul which dwelleth in tefnut and these are the double divine soul which dwelleth in tatu i am the cat which fought hard by the persea tree 
in anu heliopolis on the night when the foes of neber chur were destroyed who then is this the male cat is ra himself and he is called mau by reason of his speech of the god sa who said concerning him he is like mau unto that which he hath made thus his name became maau or as others say it is the god shu who maketh over the possessions of seb to osiris as concerning the fight hard by the persea tree in anu it concerneth the children of impotent revolt when justice is wrought on them for what they have done as concerning the night of the battle these words refer to the inroad of the children of impotent revolt into the eastern part of heaven whereupon there arose a battle in heaven and in all the earth o thou who art in thine egg ra who shinest from thy disk and risest in thy horizon and dost shine like gold above the sky like unto whom there is none among the gods who sailest over the pillars of shu in the ether who givest blasts of fire from thy mouth who makest the two lands bright with thy radiance deliver thou the pious neb seni from the god whose form is hidden whose eyebrows are like unto the two arms of the balance on the night of reckoning destruction who then is this it is anaoth that is the god who bringeth his arm as concerning the night of reckoning destruction it is the night of the burning of the damned and of the overthrow of wicked at the block and of the slaughter of souls who then is this it is nemu the headsman of osiris who or as others say it is apep when he riseth up with one head bearing maat right and truth upon him or as others say it is horus when he riseth up with a double head whereof the one beareth right and truth and the other wickedness he bestoweth wickedness on him that worketh wickedness and right and truth upon him that followeth righteousness and truth or as others say it is horus the great who dwelleth in sechem letopolis or as others say it is thoth or as others say it is nefertem or as others say it is sept who doth thwart the axe of the foes of neber deliver thou the scribe nebseni victorious from the watchers who bear slaughtering knives and who have cruel fingers and who slay those who are in the following of osiris may they never gain the mastery over me may i never fall under their knives what then is this it is anubis and it is horus in the form of kent an maati or as others say it is the sovereign princes who thwart the works of their weapons or as others say it is the chiefs of the shenniu chamber may their knives never gain the mastery over me may i never fall under their instruments of cruelty for i know their names and i know the being matchet who is among them in the house of osiris shooting rays of light from his eye but who himself is unseen he goeth round about heaven robed in the flame of his mouth commanding hapi but remaining himself unseen may i be strong upon earth before ra may i come happily into haven in the presence of osiris let not your offerings be wanting to me o ye who preside over your altars for i am among those who follow after neber according to the writings of capera i fly as a hawk i cackle as a goose i ever slay even as the serpent goddess neheb ka what then is this those who preside over their altars are the similitude of the eye of ra and the similitude of the eye of horus o ra tem thou lord of the great house thou sovereign life strength and health of all the gods deliver thou the scribe nebseni victorious from the god whose face is like unto that of a greyhound whose brows are as those of a man and who feedeth upon the dead who watcheth at the bite of the lake of fire and who devoureth the bodies of the dead and swalloweth hearts and who shooteth forth filth but he himself remaineth unseen who then is this devourer for millions of years is his name and he liveth in the aat as concerning the aat it is that which is in an rat f hard by the shen eu chamber the unclean man who would walk thereover doth fall down among the knives or as others say his name is matis and he is the watcher of the door of amentet or as others say his name is beba and it is he who watcheth the bite of amentet or as others say harry sep f is his name hail lord of terror chief of the lands of the north and south thou lord of the red glow or red lands who preparest the slaughter block and who dost feed upon the inward parts who then is this 
the guardian of the bite of amentet what then is this it is the heart of osiris which is the devourer of all slaughtered things the uret crown hath been given unto him with gladness of heart as lord of suten henen heracleopolis magna what then is this he to whom hath been given the uret crown with gladness of heart as lord of suten henen is osiris he was bidden to rule among the gods on the day of the union of earth in the presence of neber chur what then is this he that was bidden to rule among the gods is horus the son of isis who was appointed to rule in the place of his father osiris as concerning the day of the union of earth with earth it is the mingling of earth with earth in the coffin of osiris the soul that liveth in sutton henen the giver of meat and drink the destroyer of wrong and the guide of the everlasting paths who then is this it is ra himself deliver thou the osiris nepseni victorious from the great god who carrieth away the soul who eateth hearts and who feedeth upon offal the guardian of the darkness the dweller in the succor boat those who live in crime fear him who then is this it is suddy or as others say it is smam ur the soul of seb hail kapera in thy boat the twofold company of the gods is thy body deliver thou osiris ani victorious from the watchers who give judgment who have been appointed by the god neber chur to protect him and to fasten the fetters on his foes and who slaughter in the shambles there is no escape from their grasp may they never stab me with their knives may i never fall helpless into their chambers of torture never have the things which the gods hate been done by me for i am pure within the mesket cakes of saffron have been brought unto him in tananet who then is this it is kapera in his boat it is ra himself as concerning the watchers who give judgment they are the apes isis and nephthys as concerning the things which are abominated by the gods they are wickedness and falsehood and he who passeth through the place of purification within the mesket is ampu anubis who is behind the chest which containeth the inward parts of osiris he to whom saffron cakes have been brought in tananet is osiris or as others say the saffron cakes in tananet are heaven and earth or as others say they are shu strengthener of the two lands in sutton henen heracleopolis magna the saffron cakes are the eye of horus the tananet is the burial place of osiris tem hath built thy house and the double lion god hath founded thy habitation lo drugs are brought and horus purifieth and set strengtheneth and set purifieth and horus strengtheneth the osiris the scribe ani victorious before osiris hath come into the land and he hath taken possession thereof with his two feet he is tem and he is in the city turn thou back o rehu whose mouth shineth whose head moveth turn thou back from before his strength or as others say turn thou back from him who keepeth watch and is unseen the osiris ani is safely guarded he is isis and he is found with her hair spread over him i shake it out over his brow he was conceived in isis and begotten in nephthys and they cut off from him the things which should be cut off fear followeth after thee terror is upon thine arms thou hast been embraced for millions of years by the arms of the nations mortals go round about thee thou smitest down the mediators of thy foes and thou seizest the arms of the powers of darkness the two sisters isis and nephthys are given to thee for thy delight thou hast created that which is in kur abba and that which is in anu heliopolis every god feareth thee for thou art exceeding great and terrible thou avengest every god on the man that curseth him and thou shootest out arrows thou livest according to thy will thou art uachit the lady of flame evil cometh among those who set themselves up against thee what then is this hidden in form granted of men who is the name of the tomb he seeth what is on his hand is the name of querau or as others say the name of the block now he whose mouth shineth and whose head moveth is the member of osiris or as others say of ra thou spreadest thy hair and shake it out over his brow is spoken concerning isis who hideth in her hair and draweth her hair over her who achit the lady of flames is the eye of ra chapter eighteen introduction vignette 
upper register the priest on mount f who wears a leopard skin and has on the right side of his head the lock of hair of herupakrat harpocrates introducing ani and his wife to the gods text the speech of samar f i have come unto you o great and godlike sovereign rulers who dwell in heaven and in earth and in the underworld and i have brought unto you osiris ani he hath not sinned against any of the gods grant ye that he may be with you all the time ani's speech the adoration of osiris the lord of Restau, and of the great company of the gods who dwell in the underworld by osiris the scribe ani who saith homage to thee o thou ruler of amentet un nefer in abtu abadas i have come unto thee and my heart beholdeth right and truth there is no sin in my body nor have i lied wittingly nor have i done aught with a false heart grant thou to me food in the tomb and that i may come forth into thy presence at the altar of the lords of right and truth and that i may enter into and come forth from the underworld and that my soul be not turned back and that i may behold the face of the sun and that i may behold the moon for ever and for ever vignette the priest sa merf who wears a leopard skin and has on the right side of his head the lock of hair of heru pa krat hippocrates introducing ani and his wife to the gods text the speech of sam or f i have come unto you o sovereign princes who dwell in restau and i have brought unto you osiris ani grant ye to him as to the followers of horus cakes and water and air and a homestead in Sekhet hetep ani's speech the adoration of osiris lord of everlastingness and of the sovereign princes the lords of restau by osiris the scribe ani who saith homage to thee o king of the underworld thou governor of akert i have come unto thee i know thy ways and i am furnished with the forms which thou takest in the underworld grant thou to me a place in the underworld near unto the lords of right and truth may my homestead be abiding in Sekhet hetep and i may receive cakes in thy presence chapter eighteen vignettes a pylon surmounted by feathers typical of maat and by uriai wearing discs and a pylon surmounted by ampu anubis or apuat and by an uchat text hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou the scribe nebseni to be victorious over his enemies as thou didst make osiris victorious over his enemies in the presence of the sovereign princes who are with ra and osiris in anu heliopolis on the night of the things of the night and on the night of the battle and on the night of the shackling of the sabal fiends and on the day of the destruction of neber chur vignette the gods tem shu tefnut osiris and thoth text the great sovereign princes in anu are tem shu tefnut osiris and thoth and the shackling of the sabal fiends signifieth the destruction of the fiends of set when a second time he worketh evil hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou the osiris ani to be victorious over his enemies in the presence of the great and sovereign princes who are in tatu on the night of making the tet to stand up in tatu vignette the gods osiris isis nephthys and horus text the great sovereign princes in tatu are osiris isis nephthys and heru netch hra tef now the night of making the tet to stand up in tatu signifieth the lifting up of the arm and shoulder of horus who dwelleth in sekum latopolis and these gods stand behind osiris to protect him even as do the swathings which clothe him hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou osiris ani triumph over his enemies in the presence of the sovereign princes who are in sekum litopolis on the night of the things of the night festival in sekum vignette the gods osiris and horus the two uchats upon pylons and the god thoth text the great sovereign princes who are in sekum are heru kenti on maati and thoth who is with the sovereign princes in nerarut f
now the night of the things of the night festival in sekhem signifieth the light of the rising sun on the coffin of osiris hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou the osiris ani triumph over his enemies in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in pet and in tept and on the night of setting up the columns of horus and of making him to be established as the heir of the things which belong to his father osiris vignette the gods horus isis mestha and nephthys text the great sovereign princes who are in pet and tept are horus isis mestha and hapi now setting up the columns of horus signifieth the command given by set unto his followers set up columns upon it hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou the osiris ani triumphant in peace victorious over his enemies in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in the lands of rekhti on the night when isis lay down to keep watch in order to make lamentation for her brother osiris vignette the gods isis horus anpu anubis mestha and thoth text the great sovereign princes who are in the lands of rekhti are isis horus anubis mestha and thoth hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou osiris the scribe ani triumphant in peace to be victorious over his enemies in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in abtu abadas on the night of the god haker at the separation of the wicked dead at the judgment of the khus and at the rising up of joy in teni this vignette the gods osiris isis and apuat and the tet text the great sovereign princes who are in abtu are osiris isis and apuat hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou osiris ani the scribe and teller of the sacred offerings of all the gods to be victorious over his enemies in the presence of the sovereign princes who judge the dead on the night of the carrying out of the sentence upon those who are to die vignette the gods thoth osiris on pu anubis and astenu text the great sovereign princes in the judgment of the dead are thoth osiris anubis and astenu now the carrying out of the sentence upon those who are to die is the withholding of that which is so needful to the souls of the children of impotent revolt hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou osiris the scribe ani to be victorious over his enemies in the presence of the great sovereign princes on the festival of the breaking and turning up of the earth in tatu on the night of the breaking and turning up of the earth in their blood and of making osiris to be victorious over his enemies vignette the three gods of the festival of breaking up the earth in tatu text when the fiends of set come and change themselves into beasts the great sovereign princes on the festival of the breaking and turning up of the earth in tatu slay them in the presence of the gods therein and their blood floweth among them as they are smitten down these things are allowed to be done by them by the judgment of those who are in tatu hail thoth who madest osiris to triumph over his enemies make thou the osiris ani to be victorious over his enemies in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in Nerarut f on the night of him who concealeth himself in divers forms even osiris vignette the gods ra osiris shu and bebi who is dog-headed text the great sovereign princes who are in Nerarut f are ra osiris shu and bebi now the night of him who concealeth himself in divers forms even osiris is when the thigh and the head and the heel and the leg are brought nigh unto the coffin of osiris unnefer hail thoth who madest osiris to triumph over his enemies make thou osiris ani to be victorious over his enemies in the presence of the great sovereign princes in re stau on the night when anubis lay with his arms and his hands over the things behind osiris and when horus was made to triumph over his enemies vignette the gods horus osiris isis and text the great sovereign princes in re stau are horus osiris and isis the heart of osiris rejoiceth and the heart of horus and therefore are the northern and southern parts of heaven at peace 
hail thoth who madest osiris victorious over his enemies make thou osiris ani the scribe and teller of the divine offerings of all the gods to triumph over his enemies in the presence of the ten companies of great sovereign princes who are with ra and with osiris and with every god and goddess in the presence of neb ur chur he hath destroyed his enemies and he hath destroyed every evil thing belonging unto him rubric this chapter being recited the deceased shall come forth by day purified after death and he shall make all the transformations which his heart shall dictate now if this chapter be recited over him he shall come forth upon earth he shall escape from every fire and none of the foul things which appertain unto him shall encompass him for eternity or for ever and ever chapter nineteen vignette the chapter is without a vignette text the chapter of the chaplet of victory osiris al fank victorious born of sherat amsu victorious saith thy father tem hath woven for thee a beautiful chaplet of victory to be placed on thy living brow o thou who lovest the gods and thou shalt live for ever osiris kent amentet hath made thee to triumph over thine enemies and thy father seb hath decreed for thee all his inheritance come therefore o horus son of isis for thou o son of osiris sittest upon the throne of thy father ra to overthrow thine enemies for he hath ordained for thee the two lands to their utmost limits atem hath also ordained this and the company of the gods hath confirmed the splendid power of the victory of horus the son of isis and the son of osiris for ever and for ever and osiris alf ankh shall be victorious for ever and ever o osiris kent amentet the whole of the northern and southern parts of the heavens and every god and every goddess who are in heaven and who are upon earth will the victory of horus the son of isis and the son of osiris over his enemies in the presence of osiris kent amentet who will make osiris alf ankh victorious to triumph over his enemies in the presence of osiris kent amentet un nefer and the son of nut on the day of making him to triumph over set and his fiends in the presence of the great sovereign chiefs who are in anu heliopolis on the night of the battle and overthrow of the seba fiend in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in abtu on the night of making osiris to triumph over his enemies make thou osiris alf ankh triumphant to triumph over his enemies in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in the horizon of amentet and on the day of the festival of haker in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in tatu on the night of the setting up of the tet in tatu in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in the ways of the damned on the night of the judgment of those who shall be annihilated in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in sekum latopolis and on the night of the things of the altars in sekum in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in pei and tept on the night of the establishing of the inheriting by horse of the things of his father osiris in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are at the great festival of the ploughing and turning up of the earth in tatu or as others say in abtu on the night of the weighing of words or as others say weighing of locks in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in on rut f on its place on the night when horus receiveth the birth chamber of the gods in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in the lands of recti on the night when isis lieth down to watch and to make lamentation for her brother in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in restal on the night of making osiris to triumph over all his enemies horus repeated these words four times and all his enemies fell headlong and were overthrown and were cut to pieces and osiris alfonk triumphant repeated these words four times therefore let all his enemies fall headlong and be overthrown and cut to pieces horus the son of isis and son of osiris celebrated in turn millions of festivals and all his enemies fell headlong and were overthrown and cut to pieces their habitation hath gone forth to the block of the east their heads have been cut off their necks have been destroyed their thighs have been cut off they have been given over to the great destroyer who dwelleth in the valley of the grave and they shall never come forth from under the restraint of the god seb rubric this chapter shall be recited over the divine chaplet which is laid upon the face of the deceased and thou shalt cast incense into the fire on behalf of osiris alf ankh triumphant born of sherat amsu triumphant thus shalt 
thou cause him to triumph over his enemies dead or alive and he shall be among the followers of osiris and a hand shall be stretched out to him with meat and drink in the presence of the god this chapter shall be said by thee twice at dawn now it is a never-failing charm regularly and continually chapter twenty vignette this chapter in the theban version has neither vignette nor title text hail thoth who didst make osiris to triumph over his enemies snare thou the enemies of osiris the scribe nebseni the lord of piety in the presence of the great sovereign princes of every god and every goddess in the presence of the great sovereign princes who are in anu heliopolis on the night of the battle and of the overthrow of the sabau fiend in tatu on the night of making to stand up the double tet in sekum latopolis on the night of the things of the night in sekum in pe and in tepu on the night of the establishing of horus in the heritage of the things of his father in the double land of recti on the night when isis maketh lamentation at the sight of her brother osiris in abtu abydos on the night of the haker festival of the distinguishing between the dead the damned and the coups on the path of the dead the damned on the night of the judgment of those who are to be annihilated at the great festival of the ploughing and the turning up of the earth in Nararat f in Ristau, and on the night of making horus to triumph over his enemies horus is mighty the northern and southern halves of heaven rejoice osiris is content thereat and his heart is glad hail thoth make thou to triumph osiris the scribe nebseni over his enemies in the presence of the sovereign princes of every god and every goddess and in the presence of you ye sovereign princes who pass judgment on osiris behind the shrine in the saita recension this chapter has no vignette but it has the title another chapter of the chapter of victory and is arranged in tabular form the words hail thoth make osiris alf ankh triumphant to triumph over his enemies even as thou didst make osiris to triumph over his enemies which are written in two horizontal lines are to be repeated before each column of text the great sovereign princes invoked are those of anu heliopolis tatu sekum latopolis pe and tep and arut f the double land of recti rastau abtu the paths of the dead the ploughing festival in tatu keraba osiris heaven and earth every god and every goddess the rubric reads if this chapter be recited regularly and always by a man who hath purified himself in water of natron he shall come forth by day after he hath come into port that is is dead and he shall perform all the transformations which his heart shall dictate and he shall come forth from every fire end of chapter seventeen through twenty chapters twenty one through thirty of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty one in the papyrus of ani the twenty-first chapter follows the twenty-second but it is there given without title and without vignette in the turin papyrus published by lepsius the twenty-first and twenty-second chapters are quite distinct and each has its own title while a single vignette stands over both in the vignette a priest is shown holding a vase in the left hand and the ram-headed serpent-like instrument called ur hekau that is great of enchantments in the right with the latter he is about to touch the mouth of the deceased who is standing before him behind the deceased is a man seated on a chair and holding a staff in his left hand text the chapter of giving a mouth to the overseer of the house new triumphant in the underworld he saith homage to thee o thou lord of brightness thou who art at the head of the great house prince of the night and of thick darkness i have come unto thee being a pure coup thy two hands are behind thee and thou hast thy lot with thy ancestors o grant thou unto me my mouth that i may speak 
therewith and guide thou to me my heart at the season when there is cloud and darkness chapter twenty two vignette in the papyrus of nebseni the guardian of the balance is seen with his right hand stretched out to touch the mouth of the deceased who stands before him in other papyri the deceased himself is seen standing with either his right or his left hand raised to his mouth text the chapter of giving a mouth to osiris ani the scribe and teller of the holy offerings of all the gods triumphant in the underworld he saith i rise out of the egg in the hidden land may my mouth be given unto me that i may speak therewith in the presence of the great god the lord of the tuat underworld may my hand and my arm not be forced back in the presence of the sovereign princes of any god i am osiris the lord of ristal may i osiris the scribe ani triumphant have a portion with him who is on the top of the steps according to the desire of my heart i have come from the pool of fire and i have quenched the fire chapter twenty three vignette the statue of ani the scribe seated upon a pedestal in the form of the emblem of maat right and truth before it stands the sem priest clad in a panther's skin and holding in his right hand the ram-headed serpent-like instrument ur hekau with which he is about to touch the lips of the statue and so perform the ceremony of opening the mouth at his feet are a sepulchral box for holding unguents etc three instruments called respectively seb ur tun tet and tamanu and the object called pesh and kef in the papyrus of nebseni the scene is described as the sem priest performing the ceremony of the opening of the mouth text the chapter of opening the mouth of osiris the scribe ani triumphant saith may the god ptah open my mouth and may the god of my city loose the swathings even the swathings which are over my mouth moreover may thoth being filled and furnished with charms come and loose the bandages even the bandages of set which fetter my mouth and may the god tem hurl them at those who would fetter me with them and drive them back may my mouth be open may my mouth be unclosed by shu with his iron knife wherewith he opened the mouth of the gods i am the goddess sekhet and i sit upon my place in the great wind of heaven i am the great goddess sa who dwelleth among the souls of anu heliopolis now as concerning every charm and all the words which may be spoken against me may the gods resist them and may each and every one of the company of the gods withstand them chapter twenty four vignette this chapter has no vignette in the theban papyri text the chapter of bringing charms unto osiris ani in the underworld he saith i am tem compara who brought himself into being upon the thigh of his divine mother those who are in nu the sky are made wolves and those who are among the sovereign princes are become hyenas behold i gather together the charm from every place where it is and from every man with whom it is swifter than greyhounds and quicker than light hail thou who towest along the machant boat of ra the stays of thy sails and of thy rudder are taut in the wind as thou sailest up the pool of fire in the underworld behold thou gatherest together the charm from every place where it is and from every man with whom it is swifter than greyhounds and quicker than light the charm which created the forms of being from the mother and which either createth the gods or maketh them silent and which giveth the heat of fire unto the gods behold the charm is given unto me from wherever it is and from him with whom it is swifter than greyhounds and quicker than light or as others say quicker than a shadow chapter twenty five vignette in the greater number of the theban papyri 
this chapter is without vignette in the brockhurst papyrus however the sem priest wearing a panther's skin is seen holding up before the face of the deceased who stands before him a small bearded figure like an ushabti in the turin papyrus the priest and the deceased are standing facing each other and no ceremony is being performed text the chapter of making a man to possess memory in the underworld the chancellor-in-chief new triumphant the overseer of the palace the son of the chief chancellor amen hetep saith may my name be given to me in the great house and may i remember my name in the house of fire on the night of counting the years and of telling the number of the months i am with the divine one and i sit on the eastern side of heaven if any god whatsoever should advance unto me let me be able to proclaim his name forthwith chapter twenty six vignette the scribe ani clothed in white and with his heart in his right hand addressing the god anpu anubis jackal-headed in his left hand which is outstretched ani holds a necklace of several rows of coloured beads the clasp is made in the form of a pylon or gateway and on the side of the pendant which is in the same form is a representation of a scarab or beetle in a boat to typify the sun god ra Kepera in his boat from the pendant hangs lotus flowers and other theban papyri the vignettes are different in the papyrus of nebseni the god anubis who dwelleth in the city of embalmment gives a heart to the deceased and in others the deceased is seen either being embraced by anubis or addressing his heart which rests upon a standard before him in the turin papyrus the deceased is seen kneeling before his own soul which is in the form of a human-headed hawk and clasping his heart to his breast with his left hand text the chapter of giving a heart to osiris ani in the underworld he saith may my heart ah be with me in the house of hearts may my heart hot be with me in the house of hearts may my heart be with me and may it rest there or i shall not eat of the cakes of osiris on the eastern side of the lake of flowers neither shall i have a boat wherein to go down the nile nor another wherein to go up nor shall i be able to sail down the nile with thee may my mouth be given to me that i may speak therewith and my two legs to walk therewith and my two hands and arms to overthrow my foe may the doors of heaven be opened unto me may seb the prince of the gods open wide his two jaws unto me may he open my two eyes which are blindfolded may he cause me to stretch apart my two legs which are bound together and may anpu anubis make my thighs firm so that i may stand upon them may the goddess Seket make me to rise so that i may ascend unto heaven and may that be done which i command in the house of the ka of ptah i understand with my heart i have gained the mastery over my heart i have gained the mastery over my two hands i have gained the mastery over my legs i have gained the power to do whatsoever my ka pleaseth my soul shall not be fettered to my body at the gates of the underworld but i shall enter in peace and i shall come forth in peace chapter twenty seven vignette the scribe ani with hands raised in adoration and his heart which is set upon a pedestal in the presence of four gods who are seated upon a pedestal in the form of the emblem of maat in the turin papyrus the deceased is shown kneeling before the four children of horus text the chapter of not letting the heart hati of a man be taken from him in the underworld saith osiris ani hail ye who carry away hearts hail ye who steal hearts and who make the heart of a man to go through its transformations according to his deeds let not what he hath done harm him before you homage to you o ye lords of eternity ye possessors of everlastingness take ye not this heart of osiris ani into your grasp this heart of osiris and cause ye not words of evil to spring up against it because this is the heart of osiris ani triumphant and it belongeth unto him of many names thoth 
the mighty one whose words are his limbs and who sendeth forth his heart to dwell in his body the heart of osiris ani is triumphant it is made new before the gods he hath gained power over it he hath not been spoken to according to what he hath done he hath gotten power over his own members his heart obeyeth him he is the lord thereof it is in his body and it shall never fall away therefrom i osiris the scribe ani victorious in peace and triumphant in the beautiful amenta and on the mountain of eternity bid thee to be obedient unto me in the underworld chapter twenty eight vignette in some papyri containing the theban recension of the book of the dead this chapter has no vignette in the papyrus of nefer uben f the deceased is seen holding his heart upon his breast with his left hand and kneeling before a tailed monster in human form who holds a knife in his right hand and grasps his tail with the left another papyrus shows the deceased offering incense to osiris who standing on a pedestal in the form of maat holds the flail and sceptre in his hands in the brocklehurst papyrus the deceased is kneeling and holding his heart in his left hand which is outstretched in the turin papyrus the deceased is adoring his heart which is placed on a pedestal before a seated deity text the chapter of not letting the heart of the overseer of the palace the chancellor-in-chief new triumphant be carried away from him in the underworld he saith hail thou lion god i am the flower bush unb that which is an abomination unto me is the divine block let not this my heart be carried away from me by the fighting gods in anu hail thou who dost wind bandages round osiris and who hast seen set hail thou who returnest after smiting and destroying him before the mighty ones this my heart sitteth and weepeth for itself before osiris it hath made supplication for me i have given unto him and i have decreed unto him the thoughts of the heart in the house of the god usek ra and i have brought to him sand at the entry to kemenu hermopolis magna let not this my heart be carried away from me i make thee to dwell upon his throne o thou who joinest together hearts in sekhet hetep with years of strength against all things that are an abomination unto thee and to carry off food from among the things which belong unto thee and are in thy grasp by reason of the twofold strength and this my heart is devoted to the decrees of the god tem who leadeth me into the dens of sudi but let not this my heart which hath done its desire before the sovereign princes who are in the underworld be given unto him when they find the leg and the swathings they bury them chapter twenty nine vignette ani standing with a staff in his hand in the turin papyrus this chapter has no vignette text the chapter of not letting the heart of a man be taken away from him in the underworld osiris ani triumphant saith turn thou back o messenger of every god is it that thou art come to carry away this my heart which liveth but my heart which liveth shall not be given unto thee as i advance the gods hearken unto my offerings and they all fall down upon their faces in their own places chapter twenty nine a vignette this chapter has no vignette text the chapter of not allowing the heart of amen hetep triumphant to be carried away dead in the underworld the deceased saith my heart is with me and it shall never come to pass that it shall be carried away i am the lord of hearts the slayer of the heart i live in the right and truth maat and i have my being therein i am horus the dweller in hearts who is within the dweller in the body i live in my word and my heart hath being let not my heart be taken away from me let it not be wounded and may neither wounds nor gashes be dealt upon me because it hath been taken away from me let me have my being in the body of my father seb and in the body of my mother nut i have not done that which is held in abomination by the gods let me not suffer defeat there but let me be triumphant 
chapter twenty nine b vignette a heart text chapter of a heart of carnelian osiris ani triumphant saith i am the benu the soul of ra and the guide of the gods in the tuat underworld their divine souls come forth upon earth to do the will of their cause let therefore the soul of osiris ani come forth to do the will of his ka chapter thirty vignette the deceased with hands raised in adoration standing before a beetle placed on a pedestal text the chapter of not letting the heart of a man be driven away from him in the underworld osiris auf ankh triumphant born of sherat amsu triumphant saith my heart my mother my heart my mother my heart of my existence upon earth may not stand up to oppose me in judgment may there be no opposition to me in the presence of the sovereign princes may no evil be wrought against me in the presence of the gods may there be no parting of thee from me in the presence of the great god the lord of amentet homage to thee o thou heart of osiris kent amentet homage to you o my reigns homage to you o ye gods who dwell in the divine clouds and who are exalted or holy by reason of your sceptres speak ye fair words for the osiris auf ankh and make ye him to prosper before nehebka and behold though i be joined unto the earth and am in the mighty innermost part of heaven let me remain on the earth and not die in amentet and let me be a coup therein for ever and ever rubric this chapter shall be recited over a basalt scarab which shall be set in a gold setting and it shall be placed inside the heart of the man for whom the ceremonies of opening the mouth and of anointing with unguent have been performed and there shall be recited by way of a magical charm the words my heart my mother my heart my mother my heart of transformations chapter thirty a vignette in many of the papyri containing the theban recension this chapter has no vignette in one however the vignette is a heart standing above a vase in another the deceased is seen adoring his heart and in another the deceased is standing before four gods one of whom is offering a heart to him text the chapter of not letting the heart of the overseer of the palace the chancellor-in-chief new triumphant be driven away from him in the underworld he saith o my heart my mother o my heart my mother o my heart of my existence upon earth may not stand up to oppose me in judgment in the presence of the lords of the trial let it not be said of me and of that which i have done he hath done deeds against that which is right and true may not be against me in the presence of the great god the lord of amentet homage to thee o my heart homage to thee o my heart homage to you o my reigns homage to you o ye gods who dwell in the divine clouds and who are exalted or holy by reason of your sceptre speak ye for me fair things to ra and make ye me to prosper before nehebka and behold me even though i be joined to the earth in the mighty innermost parts thereof let me remain upon the earth and let me not die in amentet but become a coup therein chapter thirty b vignette some papyri containing the theban recension give this chapter without any vignette and it is probable that this arises from the fact that it often appears as one of the texts which occur in the great judgment scene where it forms the prayer put into the mouth of the deceased see the papyrus of ani and the papyrus of hu nefer in the papyrus of nebseni the deceased kneels in one pan of the balance and he is being weighed against his heart which rests in the other in the presence of osiris the great god the governor of everlastingness the support of the beam is surmounted by a human head and the tongue of the balance is being scrutinized by a dog-headed ape seated on a pedestal who is called thoth the lord of the balance elsewhere this ape is seated on a pedestal with steps and is called the lord of kemenu hermopolis magna the righteous weigher in the papyrus of amenneb the deceased stands by the balance while a figure of himself is being weighed against his heart in this example of the scene the support of the beam is surmounted by the head of a jackal elsewhere the vignette is simply a heart or a scarab 
or the deceased seated adoring his heart or the deceased standing in adoration before a beetle which is the symbol of the god capera the self-created god and the type of the resurrection text the chapter of not letting the heart of osiris the scribe of the holy offerings of all the gods ani triumphant be driven from him in the underworld he saith my heart my mother my heart my mother my heart whereby i came into being may not stand up to oppose me at my judgment may there be no opposition to me in the presence of the sovereign princes Tachacha. may there be no parting of thee from me in the presence of him that keepeth the balance thou art my ka the dweller in my body the god kenemu who knitteth and strengtheneth my limbs mayest thou come forth into the place of happiness whither we go may the shenet the divine officers of the court of osiris who form the conditions of the lives of men not cause my name to stink let it be satisfactory unto us and let the listening be satisfactory unto us and let there be joy of heart unto us at the weighing of words let not that which is false be uttered against me before the great god the lord of amentet verily how great shalt thou be when thou risest in triumph rubric these words are to be said over a scarab of green stone encircled with a band of refined copper and having a ring of silver which shall be placed on the neck of the ku this chapter was found in the city of kemenu hermopolis magna under the feet of the statue of this god it was inscribed upon a slab of iron of the south in the writing of the god himself in the time of the majesty of the king of the north and of the south men Kaura triumphant by the royal son heru ta ta f who discovered it whilst he was on his journey to make an inspection of the temples and of their estates in some ancient papyri the text of this chapter is made to follow the rubric of chapter sixty four with which it had some close connection and in others it follows the rubric of chapter one hundred and eighteen the rubrical direction concerning chapter sixty four reads behold make a scarab of green stone wash it with gold and place it in the heart of a man the deceased and it will perform for him the opening of the mouth anoint it with unto unguent and recite over it as a charm the following words my heart my mother my heart my mother etc in the turn papyrus it follows chapter thirty which contains parts of chapters thirty a and thirty b End of chapters 21 through 30